Navier is the female lead of the story. She is the empress and is preparing to accept a divorce from Sovieshu. She is defended by her family and the church, who have approved her marriage. The court minister, who is angry, wants her to challenge the reason for the divorce, fearing it would cause a scandal for Sovieshu and his concubine. The empress is hesitant, fearing that a divorce trial could damage Sovieshu's reputation and her own name. Despite her moral concerns, she agrees to the divorce. However, she asks for permission to remarry, leaving the room. The minister is shocked and confused. The man who removes the veil tells Sovieshu that he is the one she will marry. The minister's eyes look hollow, but the woman smiles and turns to the man, feeling a pleasant feeling. Three years ago, the new year was a challenging time for planning. After consulting with officials, the ladies-in-waiting were nervous about the emperor's return from hunting. The ladies-in-waiting told the empress that the he-emperor saved a slave woman trapped in a trap, and her beauty was comparable to the Duchess Tuania. A lady reveals that the emperor seems fond of her, and the ladies-in-waiting express concern about the empress. They offer support, even if it's difficult to hear about the situation. Countess Eliza suggests asking the emperor about the woman he brought. She agrees hoping it won't be a major issue, thinking that the emperor brought her out of pity. The empress and emperor have dinner twice a week, after discussing recent political issues. Navier asks about a runaway slave he saved at the hunting grounds. The emperor is tense and hesitant to discuss the source of the story. The emperor's answer is cold and warns her not to get involved. The empress shares her mother's advice to Countess Eliza that she should not let herself be hurt even if the emperor takes another woman as his lover. She is prepared for such situations, but feels down when the emperor doesn't speak to her. The empress and her husband, who has a political marriage, are upset about their relationship. Countess Eliza explains that their feelings are similar to those of a child or friend and that the more powerful their love is, the harder it is to look around. The Empress must deal with her heartbreak alone, forcing herself to smile. The situation highlights the emotional impact of a political marriage. She believes that woman cannot enter high society even if she become a concubine. Being a slave meant a life sentence for a crime committed, and a runaway slave was considered dregs of society. Navier feels empty when her husband has a new lover, but she knows that there is only one Empress in the Empire. The emperor visits the slave daily, even bringing her food and treating her leg. Those are the rumors that Navier always hear among the servants. As Sovieshu's interest in the slave woman grows, so does the stories about her. It's fortunate they never ran into each other. A woman in a wheelchair accompanied by two maids greets the empress, despite her injured legs. The empress is unsure if she is the slave the emperor found, but she greets the empress with a hey. The maids are bewildered. But the woman ignores them. The Empress wonders if she has something to do with her, as she would know she is the Empress. The Empress is perplexed by Rashta, who introduced herself by her first name. Despite being curious about her intentions, she don't want to ask why. Rashta's cheerful smile doesn't seem to require urgent attention. The Empress is surprised when her dress is grabbed by Rashta, who is surprised to learn she is the Empress. Laura warns Rashta to be careful of her actions, as she may not recognize the noble woman. The Empress is confused about Rashta's identity, as she has never such kind of person. Rashta said the Emperor, let her live in the Eastern Palace. Rashta's servant, Explain to the Empress that she is not a slave. Rashta asked the Empress what will she call her. Navier answered that your majesty will suffice. Rashta, turning around, was pulled by the ladies-in-waiting, questioning her friendly approach to the Empress, calling her filthy. The Emperor witnessed Laura insulting Rashta, and he glared at the ladies-in-waiting. Sovieshu, a renowned cold man, tried to comfort her, but tears began to flow down her face. Despite his attempts to soothe her, she continued to cry. He sighed and wiped her face, stating, You're a handful. The Empress, feeling worried, instructs her ladies in waiting to leave due to her leg ache. She averts her eyes from Sovieshu's concubine, but is interrupted by Sovieshu, who glares at Laura and orders her to leave the lady in waiting behind. Sovieshu orders a guard to lock Laura up for three days, providing only water and bread. The Empress resisted, however, at the end she lost from the Emperor leaving her lady-in-waiting to be punished for five days. After Laura's imprisonment ended, the Empress fetched her from the tower and ordered her favorite cake. A secretary from Sovieshu called to tell the Empress that the Emperor wants to see her. The Emperor is sitting at a table, 
The Empress asked why he called for her. He was concerned about the Empress still catering Laura after her punishment. The Emperor questions the Empress' decision to keep the Lady in Waiting. Navier answer that she will decide whether she keep her Lady in Waiting or not. So Vieshu argued with the Empress, demanding obedience. The Empress refused to comply, and the Emperor Riley suggested she retire for the day. After Empress Navier left, so Viesha rang a bell and to his surprise Rashta came out. The Emperor and Rashta tease and joke with each other until they discuss making Rashta the Emperor's concubine. So Viesha assures her about becoming his concubine and that they're not rushing. The Empress is occupied with New Year preparations, while the Emperor is taking in a concubine. The ladies-in-waiting are complaining about this unusual news arguing that he should have waited until New Year's was over. The Empress asked Countess Eliza about the concubine's upcoming ceremony, which is expected to be completed before New Year. The Emperor wants the ceremony to be simple due to other large events and tight time. The ladies-in-waiting are worried about if the Empress will send a gift to Rasht. The Empress assures the ladies-in-waiting that she has no desire send a gift. Navier is asked about the rumor that the Prince of the Western Kingdom is coming for New Year's Day. The lone younger brother of the king is renowned for many things. She is intrigued by his appearance. The Western Kingdom was a country of great military power and wealth, and the rumors surrounding him were circulating. Rashta went to the Empress to meet her. However, Countess Eliza is anxious about meeting Rashta, who the Empress doesn't want to see. Empress Navier let Rashta in. The Empress asks why Rashta visits her. Rashta give a big smile and answer that they are family. Countess Eliza expresses displeasure after Rashta say about her and the Empress being sisters because they share the same husband. Rashta asks to be sisters after he took away her husband. The Empress, furious, explains that she is not her sister, causing her tears. The Empress ends the meeting, asking Rashta to leave the room, leaving everyone in shock. Empress Navier stroll through the gardens at the Western Palace and notices a large, handsome bird perched on a flower. She approaches it and finds a handwritten note on its foot, stating he is a foreign guest arriving on New Year's Day. The ladies-in-waiting welcome it. But the Empress wonders if it's a drunk foreigner, as many foreign ambassadors will be arriving for the event. The Empress returns to her room after a conversation with ladies about birds. They find Sovieshu's secretaries waiting for them, who informs her the Emperor has summoned her. She changed first into a more formal outfit and wish not to encounter Rashtu again. Sovieshu suggests concubines should have a lady-in-waiting, and he plans to give Rashtu one. However, no noble women have come forward. That's why he asked the Empress to look for ladies-in-waiting that will serve Rashta. The Empress feels tired after the Emperor asked her to find Rashta, a lady-in-waiting. Empress Navier ladies-in-waiting were angry of what the Emperor told the Empress. The Emperor's secretaries have not found one, so the Empress decides to find one of the fallen or lower nobles. The garden had a buffet layout for a tea party, and the Empress asked the noble ladies if they want to become a lady-in-waiting for Miss Rashta. She didn't directly ask, as the capital city's nobles had pride in their position and wouldn't want to take a lower position than a commoner concubine. Lady Alishu asked the Empress about a rumor that Rashta is a runaway slave. They warned that becoming the lady-in-waiting of a runaway slave is not an honor but an insult and punishment, and that anyone suitable for the position will face slaps. The Empress returns to the palace for dinner with Sovieshu, but finds no food on the dining table. Sovieshu asks about Rashta's lady-in-waiting, but finds none. Sovieshu asked if the Empress if she's the one spreading rumors about Rashta being a runaway slave. He accused the Empress as being a romantic rival to Sovieshu, who would benefit from the rumor. Despite the accusation, Navier maintains composure and argue that Rashta is not a threat to her. Despite the accusation, Navier maintains composure and argue that Rashta is not a threat to her. The Empress tries to maintain composure and smiles at Sovieshu before she leaves. She ran to her secluded nest chair, unable to cry in front of others. She saw the large bird again. The bird brings a note from a drunken foreigner and reveals that it needs a name. The bird squawks and taps the note indicating that it wants a reply. She carries note, paper, and a pocket pen, and meditates on the bird's name, which is Queen. She named the bird Queen. The bird transformed into a handsome young man, calling himself Queen. A bluebird also transformed into a man with blue hair. The young man scolded by the bluebird, who claimed he went to the palace for beauties. The young man was skeptical, but the bluebird swung a red cape around him, reminding him that he is the heir to the Western Kingdom. The Empress is not present at the Western Palace. 
But Miss Rashta is sitting in her nest chair. She notices the new ladies in waiting and tries to defend Rashta, but she is angry by the sight of her handkerchief on the chair. The Empress is angry that Rashta is using her cherished chair. Rashta apologizes to the Empress and expresses her desire to be friends with Her Majesty, causing the maids to pity her. Navier suggests she could be friends with the next concubine. Rashta become pale after hearing those words from the Empress. So Vyeshu arrive at the Western Palace. He told about the change in Emmer Yes's behavior and what she told Rashta. He told the Empress that she was cynical towards Rashta, which is also her subject. The Empress, who was angry, mentions that the former Emperor doesn't even speak about Countess Sophie in front of the former Empress. So Vyeshu surprised and become pale when the emperor's favorite concubine was brought up. Countess Eliza comfort the empress after the emperor leaves. Rashta become happy after hearing that the emperor is angry with the empress. Two maids, Charlie and Kisu, discuss the emperor's love for Rashta and his strict punishment for false rumors. A large swing chair is delivered to her, adorned with jewels, gold and silver, and feather stuffed cushions. Rashta bursts into tears and exchanges happy looks with her maids. Navier was crying when she find a handsome bird outside her window. The bird greets her, and she lifts the bird and gives it a note stating it will be named Queen, but it is a male. She was surprised the bird was male and tie a note to the bird's leg as a reply and look at the calendar realizing New Year's celebrations are approaching. The bird's owner is nearby, and she wonder if they will come tomorrow. The Western delegates arrived, and Empress Navier greets Prince Heinle, a prince from the Western Kingdom, with respect. He bends his knee and kisses her, a gesture different from knights who lowered their eyes. The day was hectic, but the protagonist found Queen sitting on the window frame, soaking wet and shuddering. She saw a note to her, which was smudged by the rain. The sender wanted to make a bet, and she wrote a reply. The rain continued, and the Empress was worried about the bird's health, offering it to sleep with her today, and it could go when the rain stopped. The Empress saw Queen outside her window. She saw a reply, and it wanted the bird to become the prize of the bet. The Empress feels sorry for Queen. The note stated a hint saying he was a man. A knight arrives at the Empress office and informs her that Prince Heinle wants to see her. Prince Heinle asks the Empress if she can show him the palace, fearing he will get lost. Empress Navier will call for her lady in waiting to escort the prince, but he interrupts, wishing the queen to do it. Navier was greeted by Prince Heinle, who calls her queen, a name she had been sending messages with. Queen the bird. The empress is walking without saying anything when Prince Heinle calls out. Heinle is unsure of what to show him first. Before Heinle finishes, Rashtu appears from the garden bushes, and the empress is surprised by her energy. Prince. Heinle and Navier encounters Rashta, who is also taking a walk. She greets and introduces herself, and Prince Heinle also smile and introduce himself. Rashta offers to guide Heinle, stating that Her Majesty is busy, and she will do it for him. Prince Heinle, polite but cold, turned down Lady Rashta's request, suggesting three is too many. He left her with a friendly greeting. The Empress was surprised by his rude personality and prideful attitude, questioning if it was the reason for his social buzz. Heinle asked the her an unexpected question. Prince Heinle's ask if he's not handsome. He explains that people are usually interested in him, but the Empress is cold and disinterested with him. He apologizes for being rigid and mentions the Emperor's mistress. He questions why the Emperor would look elsewhere aside from the Empress. Prince Heinle asked the Empress about the special banquet on the last day of New Year's celebrations. Empress answered that she already sent before the event. Heinle receives an invitation from the Emperor of the Eastern Empire, but declines to be the Empress's guest. He jokingly asks if she can cross the Emperor's name and write her name instead. The Empress approaches the bird and tells him she's dressed. She was amazed that this bird think like a human. It offers her a note and answer it. Queen looks at the note and reprimands her for lying. The Empress was surprised when she saw Rashtu attending the New Year's Ball. So Vyeshu approached Rashtu immediately and left the Empress alone. Duchess Tunia approached the Empress to greet her until their conversation went towards Prince Heinle. She took a glass of champagne from a servant and saw Prince Heinle staring at him. He toasted her and took a drink. A lady asks if the Empress gave Rashtu a gift. The Empress is unsure about the rumors about her sending gifts to Rashtu and answered that they misunderstood understood her. The group split up to find partners before dancing in the center. So Vyeshu's first dance partner, Rashta, was revealed. The Empress decided to leave the area to protect her pride, as no one else would ask her to dance. Prince Heinle approached the Empress for the first dance. The Empress was surprised and hesitates, 
fearing more misunderstandings if she danced with him. However, she insists on following him, as refusing would insult him. Heinle smiled and assured the Empress that he would stay quiet. The Empress is surprised by Prince Heinle's sly comments about his attire and the lack of attention he received yesterday. Prince Heinle, surprised by the conversation, reveals that rumors spread easily. He asks about the story of sending gifts to Miss Rashta, and the sweet music ends. The Empress feels ashamed and grateful that Prince Heinle doesn't believe the rumors about her, but she also doesn't believe the rumor about her being a womanizer. The Empress is upset when Sovietia asks her to dance with her, as the rules dictate it. Rashta is also asking Prince Heinle to dance. Sovietia told Navier that she can take another man as her lover but it should not be Prince Heinle. He told the Empress not to disgrace her name as Empress of the Western Empire. Navier is about to protest about his relationship with Prince Heinle's butt, so Vieshu stops and hugs Rashta, who is crying. The crowd gossip about how the Emperor loves the concubine that he left the Empress. The Empress feels blood drain from her head, so Vieshu comforts Rashta, while the Empress leave. The Empress, who is unsure of where she is going, they encounter Prince Heinle, who advises her to rest. She finds herself in a heavy bedroom, feeling incredibly heavy and wondering how much she's carrying. Empress Navier finds Queen by the window, providing her comfort and warmth. She hugged the bird and thanked him for giving her strength. The Empress expresses how it sometimes feels like a real person. A message was relayed from the Verdi estate that informed the Empress that Viscountess Verdi, the lady in waiting for the Empress, can no longer serve do her. The Empress is confused, as she had borrowed money from the her a few days ago. The next day, the worries over Viscountess Verdi were unnecessary. Laura pointed out Rashta's blue silk gown, which was the one Grand Duke Lilting tried to gift to her. Countess Eliza explained that the silk was not the only thing that went from the Empress to concubine. Viscountess Verdi, who had previously mocked Rashta, was found next to her the day after she informed the Empress she couldn't be her lady-in-waiting. The Empress is unsure of her decision or how she changed her mind. Princess Soju questions the concubine system as it doesn't exist in Southern Kingdom, claiming it is cheating. The Empress doesn't want to discuss it publicly. That's why she asked to change the subject. Princess Soju redirected the conversation about what she heard about Prince Heinle's anonymous letters with someone in the Western Empire, who he wanted to find and arrange a meeting. The Empress ladies-in-waiting look at her and believe she is the anonymous friend Prince Heinle is looking for. They suspect that the Queen's owner might be Prince Heinle. The ladies-in-waiting agree, but the Empress declines to reveal her true identity. Rashta is with noble ladies discussing describes a conversation about Prince Heinle and in his anonymous friend. Rashta encourages the conversation, finding it interesting that both slaves and aristocrats engage in provocative gossip. Viscountess Verdi reveals to Rashta that the letter acquaintance Prince Heinle is looking for is Her Majesty the Empress. The Empress and Prince Heinle exchange letters without knowing each other, but now the Empress already knew. Rashta, curious about the letters exchanged between the Empress and Prince Heinle, asks Viscountess Verdi about them. She plans that Charlie will reveal herself as the one that Prince Heinle is looking for, since the Empress would never come forward. If found out that she was fake, she will just say it was just a joke. Charlie meets Prince Heinle who is partially nude with a thin robe. He smile and ask if she is the one he's looking for. Prince Heinle ask once more if she really is the one he's looking for, which the tone of his voice give a threat. Charlie, we're seen together entering the banquet. The people are gossiping about them. However, a commotion interrupted their conversation, and Prince Heinle found that Rashta's maid was caught lying. The maid was red and unable to answer, and some nobles glared at her, accusing her of bringing disgrace to the country. He believes that Charlie was the go-between who exchanged letters with him, and that he is the one he is looking for. Rashta, who had not said anything yet, sighed and suggested she knew him through the letters. Prince Heinle smiled and said, Lady Rashta, you sound like the person I've been looking fo. Upon entering the dining room, the Empress saw Rashta, who surprised her with a smile. She was confused. Why is she on the dining hall, since she was not among the 20 special guests? During a meal, Prince Heinle spills his golden goblet over his plate, causing a commotion in the dining room. So Vieshu accuses him of being rude while Prince Heinle was pointing out the deception of the maid and her master, Lady Rashta. Prince Heinle questions if he ordered Lady Rashta to do it but Sovieshu dismisses his concerns. Prince Heinle is unimpressed by how Sovieshu thinks and argue. 
Prince Heinle questions Rashta's intelligence because she didn't even know the recent letter that he and his letter acquaintance exchanges. The atmosphere becomes tense, Rashta started crying, while the emperor become even angrier. So Vieshu wielded a sword, challenged Prince Heinle to a duel. Prince Heinle asks if they can promise that they leave safely after he killed him, he will accept the duel. Empress Navier urged Sovieshu and Prince Heinle to calm down and take their seats. The Empress asked Rashta about her lying that the Empress she sent gifts to her. Rashta denies lying and started to cry. Sovieshu saw Rashta crying and asked the Empress why. Empress Navier answered that she was asking why she lied about her sending her gifts. Sovieshu explained that he had sent them in her name and that she should let it slide because it is only trivial. The Empress became angry. She is gossiped about due to Sovieshu's and Rashta's mistake. She argued that he should take responsibility for the mistake and not assume another's name, which Sovieshu finds bewildering. She asks Sovieshu to apologize for using her name and to correct false information. He believes she should do it herself, but the Empress argued he should be the one doing it and told him avoid impolitely speaking to her. The emperor asked the empress if she is jealous. Heinle interrupted, assures the empress that he will spread rumors about the truth, ensuring her reputation is not tarnished. McKenna, Prince Heinle's aide, take him away, is furious about the situation. Heinle was nagged by McKenna and is doubtful about their spying with the Eastern Emperor. Heinle ignoring him, takes a chair and forces him to sit down. McKenna, turning into a bluebird and Heinle offers to deliver a document to LG, promising to fight from behind, as per his previous advice. The Empress discusses Prince Heinle about him being a good person. Countess Eliza and other ladies-in-waiting agrees with her. While they were discussing, Queen was back after several days, embracing her tightly. Laura praised the bird's sweet gesture, implying it might not be a bird. She replied the letter that she want their friendship to be kept through letters, but Queen is suspicious and criticizes her reply. She warned that if they meet, they will be Eastern Empress and Western Prince, and rumors will worsen if she exchange letters with him. Rashta is unable to attend a special banquet, but Sovieshu explains that the banquet is only for those invited. Rashta cries and Sovieshu tries to comfort her, but she remains silent. Sovieshu decides to ask the Empress if she can spare a seat for the Rashta. The Empress is asked to make room for one more person at the New Year's ceremony, but the Empress refuses. The Emperor wants to take Rashta with her, but Empress Navier refuses. She expresses frustration with Sovieshu's attempts to force her to do things she cannot do stating she is not intentionally cruel. She turn away and leave the room. At the last day of the banquet, Empress Navier encounters Grand Duke Kaufman, who is holding a champagne glass. Despite his previous disregard for her, the Empress is surprised when he asks if it is really the state of the Eastern Empire is in, which he is mentioning about how the Empress has less power than the Emperor. Grand Duke Kaufman explained that in Rift, the emotions of Imona and Imit are one, which means the king and queen are one. He also stated that if the king's lover showed in front of the empress, the emperor's lover will be killed immediately. The empress explained that it is different in the Eastern Empire, in which she cannot kill Imat's lover without a trial. The Eastern Empire's laws, including legal approval for concubines, make it difficult for an empress to kill an emperor's mistress. Grand Duke Kaufman leaves with champagne, leaving the empress relieved, as she felt pathetic about the situation she was in. Prince Heinle appears and asks how she is, then requests to speak with her for a moment. Prince Heinle asked about her message, expressing her desire to keep their friendship only by letter. The empress is surprised as how did Prince Heinle knew it was her. Heinle reassures her that she did not make a mistake. Prince Heinle explained that the contents of the early letters were known by Rashta and her maid because Viscountess Verdi told it to them. The prince looks so sad, that's why Empress Navier asked if he's alright, but he sighs and wonders how he can be happy, as he imagined they would be as good friends. Prince Heinle, a popular and popular figure, admits to being lonely due to his limited social circle. He admits that he may seem to have many friends, but as the Prince of the West, he cannot honestly share his thoughts. The Empress, who is also a princess, shares her feelings for Prince Heinle and the ability to open up her heart. They both enjoyed receiving light-hearted letters from each other. Prince Heinle sighed, expressing guilt and shame. The Empress tries to be his friend, but they could be friends without knowing by many. Prince Heinle explained that it is much better to become friends, that it is not limited to being letter partner, for which he can say that Sovieshu is son of a, which causes the Empress to choke, 
suppressing her laughter. He smiles and suggests a casual meeting, urging not to ignore him or avoid him if they meet by chance. His serious gaze and playful voice make her feel her heart being squeezed. Rashta was enjoying the banquet and thinking that how beauty could be poison, and used it as a weapon. Despite being praised and loved, she was always in danger. However, she has a protector, which was the most powerful man on earth. She believes that no one can lay a hand on her. Not until she saw someone familiar. Rashta saw someone over a young man's shoulders and become pale. She wonders if it was due to alcohol or if what she saw is true. Baron Lant asked Rashta if there's a problem. Baron Lant's expression darkens as Rashta shook her head and pushed her glass towards him. She admits to being drunk and waved her hand to escape the crowd, fearing danger if she made a mistake. As she left, a loud voice mocked her and questioned her identity. Viscount Roteshu, the lord of the estate where Rashta was a slave, saw her face. The surroundings became silent. He asked how a runaway slave was treated like a lady. Prince Heinle promised to keep his letter friend secret, and explained to the Noblin that his letter friend is uncomfortable. Suddenly a knight informed the emperor to enter the Grand Hall. The knight hesitates, but Soviesha stand. The empress already knew that the message the knight relayed is all about Rashta. She didn't bother to come with them. The Grand Banquet Hall atmosphere was lively, with people talking and laughing. Laura brought a pumpkin pudding and a fork to share an interesting story about Rashta, a runaway slave. The Empress was worried about discussing the rumor that Rashta was a slave, but Laura assured them that Viscount Rotesha recognized her and that he had not known about the rumors. Rashta claimed she was not a slave, but everyone believed Roteshu. When Rashta fainted, Baron Lant carried her to her bedroom and the captain of the royal guard took him. The empress feels uncomfortable about Sovieshu's rescue of Rashta, despite knowing she was a slave, she believes Sovieshu would still love her and protect her from ridicule. She decide not to get involved in the situation, unsure of the outcome. The empress is about to rest however, Sovieshu's captain of the guard arrives and asks her to see the emperor. She enters Sovieshu's bedroom where she noticed Rashta with a towel on her forehead. Soviesha asks her if she is happy that everyone thinks Rashta is a runaway slave. Soviesha asks her if she is happy that everyone thinks Rashta is a runaway slave. The Empress tries to control her expression, but Soviesha seems offended by her smile. Soviesha accuses her of trying to prove that Rashta is a runaway slave by inviting Viscount Roteshu to the banquet. She is shocked by Sovieshu's threatening words and rebutted his accusation that she sent an invitation to everyone to weeks before Rashta came. The Empress insists that he should take care of Rashta himself, as he cannot expect her to look after her. The Emperor said that the Empress is a heartless woman who has no compassion to a woman who has lived in poverty her entire life and wants to stand up for herself. Roteshu the lord of a small country estate, was bowing his head in front of the emperor. He had never prostrated himself before anyone, but was intimidated by the emperor, causing his pride to be dented. The emperor asked what happened on that day. Roteshu answered that he must identify someone as his runaway slave, and he asked for his forgiveness. Viscount Roteshu, while bowing, smiled with indirects. The emperor advised Roteshu to watch his mouth. Upon arriving at the western palace, someone called her. She then realized that it is Prince Heinle, who frowns and looks at her. Despite her sadness, she smiles and approaches him. Heinle trembles and reveals that he usually wipes away tears and hug his friend when they are heartbroken. He is hurt and believes he should have met the Empress first. Prince Heinle offers to send Queen to her room, but the Empress asks to go together since she have many questions about Queen. The Empress is surprised to the Prince's reaction and she apologizes for making an unreasonable request but the prince explained that it is not the reason. He will just send Queen to the Empress' bedroom. The Empress asks about Queen's favorite. The prince answered immediately that Queen's favorite is the Empress, while his facing us blushing. The Empress is astonished by the prince's red face and asks about Queen's favorite food. Prince Heinle responds that he will eat anything. Before the Empress asks anything, the prince leaves, saying he will send Queen immediately. The Empress asks a suggestion from Sir Artina, who knows about birds. Sir Artina suggests caterpillars, mosquitoes, and moths, since they have messenger birds. Sir Artina then brings a wooden plate filled with larvae, which the Empress is afraid will crawl out of. Queen arrived, gracefully flying through the window. Navier was nervous but decided to prepare caterpillars and embracing her. She uses a tweezer to feed Queen, but the bird refuses. She tries to catch the caterpillar, but it wriggles and lands on Queen's head. Queen flew away, 
the caterpillar attached to her head, and eventually the bird disappears. The next day, the narrator leaves her room to see Prince Heinle, who is likely around the southern palace. He informs her that Queen doesn't eat raw food. She answered that she will provide cooked larvae, but Heinle answered that the bird didn't eat insects at all. Rashta was reminiscing her past when Viscountess Verdi informed her that Viscount Roteshus wanted to see her. She's thinking why the emperor allowed Roteshu to go freely and why he didn't drive him out. Rashta orders Verdi to tell Roteshu to go back, but she is unable to do so because the Viscount said she will regret it. Upon hearing it, she let the Viscount meet her. The Viscount congratulated her as the emperor's concubine. Viscount Roteshu, impressed by Rashta's growth, compliments her as a lady. Viscount Roteshu said to her that the emperor ordered him to correct his claim that she was a runaway slave and that he was treated like a fool. Roteshu threatens her that he will reveals that Rashtu abandoned her baby, and she is shocked by his nonchalant claim. He offers to bring the baby to Rashta if she doesn't believe him. The Viscount Roteshu warns her that she should direct her hostile glare towards someone else, as he already knows everything about her. He persuade Rashta that she needs him and that the love of Emperor will not last and he give his son as an example, who had promised love to Rashta, changes as the baby arrives. After the baby dies, Rashta pleads with him to run away together, but he refuses to change his life for her. Viscount Roteshu offers to play the role of a guardian to Rashta. He explains that Rashta's child looks like her. Roteshu reassures her that he will continue to pretend to be an idiot, as his majesty orders. Empress Navier encounters Prince Heinle and explains her plan to feed the queen some strange food. She apologizes, but Prince Heinle sighs and admits there are many constraints. Prince Heinle talked about the birthday of the Empress. Navier is surprised that he knew her birthday. He asks her what she would like as a gift, as she will answer his question. She notices a gaze is coming from Sovieshu. Sovieshu, stern and frowned upon, asked Prince Heinle about his stay. Despite a recent disagreement, Prince Heinle agreed to stay for two to three weeks. Sovieshu's dislike for Prince Heinle was evident. But the Empress offered to leave first together with the Prince. Sovieshu intervenes and asks the Empress to take his arm. Prince Heinle's lips are tight, wishing the Empress wouldn't follow his husband. Sovieshu glares at him, revealing that the Empress was his wife, not a tour guide for a prince. Sovieshu warns her not to take care of him. The Empress is considered honorable, and it will create a scandal. But the Empress answered that if he doesn't see them talking as a friendship, then West would be unhappy. The Empress is about to leave when Sovieshu apologizes for speaking harshly to her three days ago, mentioning his upsetness with Viscount Roteshu. The reminds her about their estrangement and suggests they go to the villa for reconciliation. The Empress was skeptical about it, but she agreed to it, since rejecting will only show that they have inharmonious relationship to the public. However, the Empress was bruised by the decision, as her husband, Sovieshu, loved another woman. She has no choice but to accept the Emperor's proposal. Duke LG Claudia, a close friend of Prince Heinle, visited the palace for sightseeing after the New Year's celebrations. The Empress was surprised to learn that he was with a slave, Rashta, not Prince Heinle. She signed the documents permitting his stay and continued with her work. Laura also added that they seemed close because Duke Elgi punched a nobleman that insulted Rashta. Rashta was flattered and invited him to enjoy her favorite food. Rashta and Duke Elgi had a conversation. She is intrigued by his contrast with the mercenary-like nobles she's met before. Duke Elgi suggests preventing future ruffians from disappearing, in which he suggests passing the rumors on to someone else so that the rumors about her being a slave will shift. On the day of discussing diplomatic tie with Grand Duke Kapman, the Empress received a letter from Prince Heinle, expressing to trust him. The meeting ended slowly, and the Empress asked why Grand Duke Kapman recommended her despite him criticizing her for handling Rashta. Kapman explained that the Empress could be in charge with this kind of project. So Vieshu approaches Navier, who has been brooding in a conference room. Concerned about Rashta's situation, she asks about his current state. So Vieshu's response is shocking, as he asks if the she has a preference for foreigners, leaving her stunned. The Empress is dealing with misunderstandings with the Emperor. She told the Emperor that it is something he should not concern himself. 
So Viesha criticizes the Empress for not being mindful of her actions and reminded that she is his wife. So Viesha asks if she likes Lord Capman, but the Empress explained that they only talked about political matters since she doesn't want to prolong the conversation. The Empress received gifts from friends and relatives five days before her birthday. Her mother sent her a semi-annual magazine featuring portraits of popular actors. The ladies-in-waiting enjoyed the magazine more than the Empress. An anonymous gift called the Elixir of Love was also given, but it was too awkward for her. As the Empress was packing her suitcase, she heard wings pattering in the air and she saw Queen carrying a large box tied with string. She questioned Prince Hindley about him sending heavy through Queen and should have come in person or asked someone else. She found the box contained a large cake and a letter, and it says it is hoping someone would compliment him on his cooking skills. The cake is accompanied by a blue-colored diamond, which the Empress finds too extravagant. She admits that it was acceptable to receive extravagant gifts from a foreign delegation, but the meaning of the gift was ambiguous. She then hugs Queen, asking why he is crying. The Empress visits the Southern Palace after Queen's tearful departure, expressing concern for Queen. She meet a knight from the Western Kingdom who recognizes her and seems to know something about her. The knight informs her that Prince Heinley is inside and is worried because he came crying, but he rephrased the words that it is the Prince Bird that was crying. The knight informs the Prince that the Empress was there. The prince seems surprised by sudden visit, as he appears hastily putting on his clothes, and has red eyes and a wetness on his eyelashes. The prince questions if he received the cake. The empress answered that she received it and came to say hello and thank him. Prince Heinley smiles languidly and is less arrogant than usual. The empress said that she enjoys the cake, while Prince Heinley said that it's his hobby to cook. He believes the empress and him are meant to be together, since he can cook while she can't. He asked if the gift he sent is too much, and he explained that the Western Kingdom is a jewel capital and many mines are owned by the Imperial family. The Empress said that she now know why he was mistaken for a womanizer, due to his friendly and caring nature. Prince Heinley cleared that the rumored of him being a womanizer is due to his friend, Duke Elgie. He asked for a favor from the Empress, advising her to stay out of sight in front of Duke Elgie. Heinley argued that getting entangled with Duke Elgie would lead to unhappiness. When the Empress arrived at the Central Palace, she found Soviesha standing in front of the carriage. He had a matter to attend to, but it wasn't an issue for the Empress's birthday. He promised to leave in the evening, as the villa was 12 hours away. Rashta presents Sovieshu with an engraved pendant from Duke LG from Blue Bohine. Sovieshu informs Rashta that she has to go to the royal villa, but her planned departure has been cancelled. Sovieshu comforts Rashta and leaves, leaving her to see Sovieshu off. Rashta is surprised to learn that he is going to the villa for the Empress's birthday. She grabbed his coat and asked if she can come along, as she doesn't want him to be alone with another woman. So Viesha had promised to spend time with her later, but now he will be alone with the Empress. She tries not to worry, as she couldn't have stopped him even if she had known in advance. So Viesha arrived and sat at the sofa tired, while Empress Navier noticed that he had a fever after checking his forehead. She received a music box with jewelry and thanked the Emperor. As he places the necklace on her neck, a warm and smooth sensation touches her neck. She is surprised by Sovieshu's affectionate touch on her ears, but she hesitates to reciprocate. Sovieshu smiles and holds out his hand, but she doesn't want to kiss him, as he's been with Rashta for over a month. The Emperor sighed and left the room, saying he is tired. Navier is alone in a room, sees a large bird by the window, which looks like Queen. She is moved by the bird's embrace and wonders if it is trying to comfort her. Countess Jubal suddenly arrives at the Empress room to announce that the Emperor collapsed. Rashta, a woman with a history of hatred towards Viscount Roteshu, is hesitant to join him. Roteshu, however, insists that she should pay for the expenses of raising her baby. She decides to give him three unattractive rings, thinking it would be better than spreading rumors about the baby. Despite her initial reluctance, she decides to accept the offer. Rashta's anxiety increased when Baron Lant informed her that the Emperor may not be able to return tomorrow due to illness. She asked Baron Lant if she could go to the villa to look after the Emperor, but he is not in position to give permission. The Emperor and Empress will send for Rashta if they wish. Duke Elgi, concerned about Rashta's health, asked her if he would be able to tempt the Empress to avoid becoming close to the Emperor. 
Duke Elji suggested that if she loved him, she wouldn't become close to the emperor. The empress advised Sovieshi to rest for a few more days and suggested calling in Rashta to take care of him. The emperor resist on calling Rashta, but the empress believed it would be helpful if Rashta came, and she returned to the palace. After a week's rest, they returned to the imperial palace, and Rashta locked Sovieshu into a hug. She and Sovieshu seemed unwilling to detach, so the empress went to the central palace alone and ordered officials to bring her the delayed work. The empress take a walk outside the office and notice Duke Elji standing nearby. He has been waiting for three hours and is a friend of Heinle. Duke Elji asked the empress if Prince Heinle talks negative comments about him. Heinle claims he has been a cursed doll or a living ghost story, but the duke denies this and insists it's a lie. He also added not to trust Heinle because he is to face and is planning something. The conversation ends when the emperor approaches them. After Duke Elji left, Sovieshu confronted the empress about her preference for foreigners. She asked Sovieshu what kind of man is a good man, and he answered shameless that he is. She then answered that she would look for a handsome, youthful Eastern Kingdom man. Sovieshu agreed and left. Empress Navier reflects on the documents on the table, questioning the meaning of the Duke Elji and the plan Prince Heinle had been setting up for years. She was curious what was happening between them since Prince Heinle is the one who called for Duke Elji despite their disparaging remarks about each other. The Emperor asked Rashta why is she not wearing the ring he gave her, known as the Red Flame Star. Soviesha reveals that the ring has a spell that removes scars if worn for longer. Rashta is surprised and lies that she gave it to poor maid because she pity her. Sovieshu offers to give Rashta another one if she wants one, but he needs to borrow the Empress ring with the same magic on it. Viscount Roteshu visits Rashta and she questions him about the ring she gave him. He sells it for more money than expected. Rashta is angry and asks Roteshu to sit down. Roteshu is not intimidated and offers to help her if she agrees with his side. Rashta threatens that if he reveal her baby, if she doesn't cooperate, he will ruin their arrangement. She wants to prove his ability to her by investigating Duchess Tuania's weakness to start a bad rumor. The Emperor wants to borrow the Desert Flower Ring that has a powerful healing spell and was obtained from a traitor returning from Rift. The Empress already knew that he want to lend it to Rashta. The Empress agreed to lend Sovieshu her magical ring, but in return he have to lend one of his magical items as collateral. She explained that she will lend it to a young countryman, since he doesn't want her to associate with foreigners. The Emperor became angry, telling her just to say no if she doesn't want to lend him and pretend the situation didn't happen. Empress Navier encounters Prince Heinle and she mentions meeting Duke Elji. She explained that Duke Elji claims it was Heinle who called him and that he's been setting up something for years. The prince looks tense and cold. He answered that he doesn't want to lie to the Empress, proving his seriousness about their friendship. However, the Empress think that he is up to something, possibly involving Duke Elgi's in the Eastern Empire. She offered to let him not to answer if he couldn't, but Prince Heinle remained nervous and sighed. Eight days after Rashta asked Viscount Roteshu to uncover Duchess Tuania's weakness, he found useful information in a gossip magazine from 20 years ago. The Duchess Tuania married Duke Tuania, leading to Lord Marion's suicide, which is the older brother of Duke Tuania. Rumors spread about her pregnancy, which was rumored to Lord Marion's child. The father-in-law, Duke Tuania, drove the publisher out of business. This rumors made Rashta happy. That will cause the rumors about her to pass to Duchess Tuania. Count Pernu informed the Emperor about a red flame star at an auction house. He found the seller, and contrary to what Rashta said, it was Viscount Roteshu, not a maid. Rashta is asked by the Emperor about a ring she gave to a maid. She is surprised, thinking if the Emperor found something. So Vieshu, who had come to know about the ring, questions her motives. Rashta admits she also gave the ring to Viscount Roteshu out of gratitude. He questions if she was threatened by Viscount Roteshu. Rashta, out of desperation, forces her to lie. If Sovieshu knows about the baby, he would punish the Viscount and drag Rashta down with him. The Empress asked Countess Eliza if there's something happened when she was away. Countess Eliza told her that Duchess Tuania slapped Duke Elji in front of many people, leading to a frenzy. And a woman pulled Tuania's hair, revealing she was one of Duke Elji's former lovers. No one knows why Tuania hit Duke Elji but it would likely lead to more gossip. Laura assures Her Majesty that over two dozen such incidents happen annually. 
Upon arriving at the central palace for work, Rashta greeted her and discussed the allowance for concubines, which was about 30,000 krangs a year. Rashta asked if she can get her allowance without recording what she will spend on it. The Empress think that Rashta want to make a slush fund, but it's not her business. She told her that the Emperor manages everything about her, and she should seek permission first. She ponders, then leaves in embarrassment. The Empress is surprised to see another woman wearing a dress almost identical to her. The room is filled with anxiety and interest, as everyone seems to think they planned this on purpose. Rashta asked why the Empress copy her dress, but the Empress remains calm and explains that she came here as herself and what would be the reason to copy someone like her. The Emperor arrive while Grand Duke Liltiang and others share gossip about the dress, with some accusing the Empress of copying Rashta. However, Soviesha reveals that he asked the Empress to wear a red dress, causing the Empress confusion. The Empress is surprised by Soviesha's lies to protect her dignity. Grand Duke Liltiang, embarrassed, smiles and compliments their relationship. Rashta, unhappy, is surrounded by nervous glances. The Empress cannot understand why he helped her. As they sit at the table, they notice Rashta laughing and talking to Duke Tuania, who seems to be enjoying his conversation. The Empress was thinking if Soviesha will be jealous, but he seems unperturbed. Laura explained that Duke Tuania was told she would divorce Duchess Tuania due to rumors about Lord Marion. The ladies-in-waiting were shocked and Laura suggested that Lord Marion had a close relationship with Duchess Tuania before their marriage. Laura also mentioned that Duchess Tuania had a fight with another woman, which the Duke Tuania thinks his wife and Duke Elgi have relationship. The Empress questioned the connection to Miss Rashta and Duchess Tuania, who recently asked about the scandal. Duchess Tuania stated she would never divorce and may go to trial. The Empress is suspicious about Duke Tuania's sudden mention of a problem, suspecting Rashta may have manipulated information. She warns against treating her as a naive slave turned concubine, as she could influence society and public opinion. Four days later, Rashta is stabbed by Viscount Langdal. Viscount Langdal fell in love with Duchess Tuania, who stabbed Rashta. Duke Elgi came in rescue while Viscount Langdal shouted and claimed she ruined Duchess Tuania. The palace doctor is examining Rashta while Sovieshu is unable to concentrate and is going crazy. However, the doctor informs Sovieshu that there is a baby in Rashta's stomach. The doctor believes that Rashta became pregnant after Sovieshu saved her from the woods. The situation raises questions about the emperor's mental state and the nature of the baby. The emperor visited the empress, informing her that Rashta is pregnant. She honestly state that she cannot offer her congratulations. Sovieshu reveals that it may not be recognized as part of the imperial family but it is his first child. He offers to increase the allowance for concubines with his child starting next month, and the Empress agrees. Countess Eliza closes the door, and Prince Heinle approaches to console the Empress. He offers to give her a hug as a friend, a comforting gesture. The Empress agree and is relieved, feeling secure on his shoulders. Countess Eliza told the Empress that Duchess Tuania wants to see her. Despite her good relationship, she doesn't usually visit without an invitation. The Duchess sits on the couch, expressing her distress. She chokes out the words and asks for the help for Viscount Langdal, expressing shame and requesting the Empress rescue. She informed the Empress that Viscount Langdal won't go to trial, as his case won't go to the chief judge. The Emperor will charge Viscount Langdal for the near death of a royal baby, leading to his execution. Duchess Tuania is upset about the threat of execution to her honor defender, Viscount Langdal. The Empress is considering talking to the Emperor and suspects Miss Rashta is discrediting Duchess Tuania. The Duchess inhaled deeply and took the Empress handkerchief. She offered to repay the act of kindness to Viscount Langdal someday. She hugged the Duchess once, rubbing her back, and then left, smiling and standing up. The Empress enters Viscount Langdal's prison, where she finds Langdal, seated with his head in his hands. Langdal admits to shouting and screaming so that everyone would hear what Rashta did to Duchess Tuania, but the Empress later admits that the matter is buried, as it was discovered that Rashta is pregnant. Viscount Langdal was surprised after hearing of Rashta's pregnancy and that he will be executed without trial. The Empress took his attention and explained that she wouldn't tell him this if she will let him die. The Empress questions Viscount Langdal what happened. He told everything the result of his investigation and found out that Rashta paid Viscount Roteshu to spread rumors and fake information about Duchess Tuania. She asked if he told all his report to the Emperor. Viscount Langdal told the Empress that he already explained it to the Wumperor. He didn't listen to him. 
The Empress asked if he had the report of his investigation, and he answered that the report is in his cabinet. The Empress calls Sir Artina to find an investigation report in Viscount Langle's mansion. The Viscount cry his eyes out after learning that Duchess Tuania asked the Empress to save him. The Empress offers to change his punishment into exile. The Empress visits Sovieshu's office and discusses a conversation about Viscount Langle's punishment. Sovieshu become angry and asks her not to interfere and insist her to leave. The Empress then said that she will handle the investigation results herself. Sovieshu stopped the Empress exiting the room and asked what she's talking about. The Empress answered that Viscount Langle investigation's results reveals Miss Rashta false rumors about Duchess Tuania, which is a separate incident from his baby. The Empress explained that Miss Rashta must locked up in jail and whipped because of what she did. So Vyeshu questions her compassion for Rashta and her actions. The Empress asked if he only have compassion with Rashta. So Vyeshu seems to be in internal conflict, but he then answered that he will change the punishment of Viscount Langdell into exile. In the evening, Laura informs the Empress that Rashta is safe, including Duchess Tuania's divorce. Viscount Langdell's exile, and the unexpected mention of Viscount Roteshu moving in the city, who is looking for a house and a nanny. While listening to Laura, she discovers a pink bottle of a love potion. She left it in her drawer which was given by Anonymous. Laura encourages the Empress to try it, but she refuses, stating there's no specific use for it. Curious about the love potion she received, Grand Duke Capman came to her mind, as he was a graduate from the Magical Academy and she was hoping he can answer her questions about it. After discussing about trades, she asks Duke Capman if he knows about magic potions. She is uncomfortable as it was sent anonymously, and she doesn't believe it's true. She was intrigued by the gift and asks if it is harmful. Capman confirms that it works to some extent, and that it is a genuine drug distributed on the black market. He also mentions that if someone drinks this potion, they may fall in love with the first person they see, causing physical symptoms of love. The Empress is taken aback and doubts the potion's authenticity. Grand Duke Capman offers to prove the effect of the potion, since he has with an antidote, she was surprised that he immediately opened the cap and takes a sip. Suddenly, the door opens. So Vyeshu was the person who opens the door. While he was holding a pile of reports, he noticed that Grand Duke Capman was unable to look at Sovieshu's face. The Empress thought that if he saw the Emperor's face first, he might fall in love with him. The Empress thought that if he saw the Emperor's face first, he might fall in love with him. The Empress asked Sovieshu about the files he was holding and if he was here to deliver them. Sovieshu is thinking if he was kissing the Empress. So he grabbed Grand Duke Capman's shoulder. After facing the Emperor, Capman seemed to be in love with Sovieshu, complimenting his appearance. Sovieshu was surprised by Capman's behavior and left the room. Capman reveals that the potion is more effective than he thought and asked the Empress not to come close to her. He also said that he loves her so much that he is willing to risk misunderstandings from his husband to protect her. He suggests to leave him and he will take the antidote in his room. The Empress experienced a strange sensation upon returning to her room questioning how it feels when someone go crazy for her. The next day, Capman asked for a private conversation, and he explained that the antidote didn't work on him. The Empress asked if he drinks the wrong antidote, but he object. He then that he is the one that gifted the live potion to the Empress as he is frustrated to her relationship with the Emperor. Grand Duke Capman told her that he began to feel interest to the Empress because of the potion and asked her not to prolong his stay with her, so he left. The Empress met the Grand Duke and is asked if she is friend with the Prince, while she answered yes. She asked if he is jealous and admit it. They were talking when the Emperor intervened. So Vyeshu asked the Empress which between Grand Duke Capman and Prince Heinle she's attracted to. But she answered, there's a misunderstanding. So Vyeshu questions why she shouldn't be cautious about the pregnancy of an Emperor's firstborn. He added that his child with Rashta is also the Empress' child. But she objected, as everyone are aware of the law that if a baby is not an imperial prince or princess, it is not considered a child of the imperial family. So Vyesha criticizes the empress for being selfish and said she's just wary of his unborn baby. He wonders if the empress regards him as a husband. The emperor is about to finish his sentence when Grand Duke Capman fist lands on his face. So Vyeshu and Grand Duke Capman were in a heated confrontation, with commotion escalating as knights arrived and surrounded Capman. The Empress ordered the knights to stand down twice, but they didn't listen. The knights under Sovieshu's orders, lowered their swords, but did not sheath them. 
Grand Duke Kapman, with his magic, threatened them with electricity. So Vieshu ordered them to stand down, and the knights lowered their swords again. So Vieshu sneered, implying Kapman had a heart for the Empress. Kapman questioned the Emperor's shameless behavior of asking the Empress to accept his child from an affair, but so Vieshu pointed out that Rashta is an official concubine. Rumors about harems among royalty and upper aristocracy sparked interest in the Hua continent. So Vieshu, aware of this, pointed out Grand Duke Kapman's hypocrisy. He didn't trust Kapman and wouldn't imprison him to save his reputation. However, he had to rethink his deal with Rift. So Vieshu left with his men, leaving Grand Duke Kapman, Sir Artina, and the Empress. She apologized for the potion incident, but Kapman blamed himself for not controlling his emotions. Prince Heinle rushed to his quarters to receive an urgent message from Sir McKenna. He opened a letter which revealed that Warden III, the King of the Western Kingdom, was in failing health. Heinle was asked to return, feeling uneasy and worried. McKenna asked Prince Heinle if he will inform Emperor Sovieshu about his return and about his letter friend. Heinle is in turmoil and asks him about his chances of marrying her. The Empress and Prince Heinle meet in the hallway, and they walk together. Prince Heinle reveals that he need to go back to the Western Kingdom. The Empress already prepare herself about this matter. Prince Heinle asks if they can keep exchanging letters, and the Empress agrees. Although the Empress may not see Queen often anymore, he suggests sending another bird. Empress Navier feels closer to Prince Heinle and Queen, but their first parting was more frustrating and terrible than expected. Prince Heinle left the Empress and informed Emperor Sovieshu of his return to his country. Despite their initial misunderstanding, Sovieshu assured him of a safe return. Prince Heinle sought Duke Elgi, which was already with Rashta. He then approached Duke Elgi and talked with him inside his room. The Empress wakes up the next morning to find Prince Heinle leaving at dawn. They may had a strange start, but had grown to be good friends. However, not just Prince Heinle, but Queen left her, leaving her feeling saddened. The Emperor is worried about the future of his unborn child, accepted by the Empress, but Count Pernu is much worried about Lord Kosher Troby than the Empress herself. Kosher is the elder brother Empress Navier, who is skilled in martial arts and resembles her sister. So Vieshu now became worried about Kosher's hot temper and his response with his concubine, Rashta. Empress Navier is in a state of confusion when Countess Eliza informs her that Grand Duke Kapman is present in the parlor room. She noticed that the potion has worn off, and Grand Duke Kapman apologizes for his unstable emotional state. Grand Duke Kapman sighed and adjusted his distance from the her. He claimed to have created a potion for the black market, but it doesn't usually work like this. The Empress wondered if it was a side effect. The didn't answer the Empress question, but told her he is leaving the Empire, and Grand Duke Kapman is present to say goodbye. She asked about the diplomatic relations and trade affairs, but he answered that even though she is in charge, at the end it was her husband approval that would be prevail. She is angry that her efforts to establish diplomatic relations with Rift have failed due to Sovieshu's feelings. Grand Duke Kapman, distressed, announces that the diplomatic relationship with the Eastern Empire is over. He plans to explore other countries to find ways to remove the effects of a drug. Grand Duke Kapman paused to speak, unsure if he was going to say goodbye. The Empress tried to say goodbye first, but was surprised when he proposed to go together. He offered to live without pain and be surrounded by good things in the world. She was shocked, but Grand Duke Kapman did not correct his words and offered to do all the preparations if agreed. The Empress is frustrated and tries to explain that his emotions will return when the potion wears off. She admits it is painful for the Emperor to love another woman while he is cold to her. The Empress she is still the Empress, despite her husband's coldness towards her. Grand Duke Kapman, regretful of her belief, warns her that divorce could lead to her falling apart. The Empress denies this, stating that the Emperor is not a fool to divorce her, but Grand Duke Kapman refutted her and warns her that people addicted to love may act on impulse, like what he did on her husband. He asks if he can hug her, and the Empress agrees to a light embrace but the hug is intense and impatient. He leaves with a final glance before leaving. After 15 minutes, Navier is visited by her older brother Kosher, who is more comfortable with her. They discuss her somber appearance, which her brother believes is due to her husband's affair with another woman. Navier receives shopping bags from her brother. He questions her where the woman with the bastard child and asshole is staying. Navier warns her brother about her dangerous language. She locks the door and reassures her brother. 
Prince Heinle is in King Warden, the third bedroom. He urges him to get married. Despite his nagging nature, Heinle agrees, despite his brother's ill health. Warden 3, trembling, sucked in slow breaths and loosened his grip on Heinle's hand. The prince announced the king's death, and those silently beside the wall knelt before the new king. The empress is surprised to see a blue bird flying through the window, akin to Queen's underling. The bird has a letter from Prince Heinle that expresses his need for comfort from her. Queen. She writes a cliched sentence, hoping the prince is not hurting too much. But she cannot express the depth of her feelings. The empress plans to present Miss Rashta's baby a gift during a celebration. The ladies are hesitant about the gift, but they shared that they had prepared clothes and baby trinkets. Countess Eliza asks about what the Empress will give as a gift, and the she answered she decides to give the baby a decorative sword. The conversation ends with the speaker's decision. On the day of Rashta's baby's banquet, the palace was filled with visitors, indicating the wealth and importance of the event. Rashta suddenly came closer to the Empress with an angelic smile. So Vieshu appears nervous, and the nobles are curious. She presents a gift wrapped in shiny paper and tied with a ribbon, which Rashta takes with both hands, wondering what it is. Rashta is enamored with the sword and expresses her gratitude to the Empress. Rashta asks for a favor from the Empress to bless her baby, but she declines. So Vyeshu, embarrassed by the Empress' rejection of blessing his baby and asked her if it was hard for her to bless Rashta's baby since she was doing it daily. So Vyeshu went back to Rashta, while the Empress asked Rashta if she still wanted her blessing. But so Vyeshu was suspicious. Rashta gave a large smile and the Empress blessed the baby, saying, Dear child, be like the sword I have gifted you, gorgeous and beautiful. Rashta strokes Empress Navier's beautiful blade, hoping her child would be admired and have the sword as proof of love. She contemplates removing Viscount Roteshu, the only black cloud in her family's future, but sees a heart-fearing face. Alan Rimwell, son of Viscount Roteshu and Rashta's former lover, appeared in the capital. Rashta was shocked by his presence and worried about his actions. Rashta is surprised when Duke Elgi calls her. Rashta shows the sword that Empress Navier gifted her baby. Duke Elgi asks if he can look at it. Rashta gives Duke Elgi a gift of a fine sword, which he finds to be purely decorative. The Empress blessed Rashta to be as beautiful as the sword, but it has no practical use as a weapon. Duke Elgi explains that the sword means living in splendor and beauty, but also not working. Rashta is shocked by the mockery she received from the Empress. Tears spill over her cheeks, and so Viesha comforts her. She thought that the Emperor knew what the Empress gift means, but he didn't tell her. Rashta is convinced that Duke Elgi is more reliable and that she was correct in confiding about her other baby to the Duke rather than Sovieshu. She is convinced that Duke Elgi is more dependable. Rashta stated her fear towards the Empress's harsh words towards their baby. She seeks consolation and promises of Sovieshu's protection. Sovieshu is surprised by Rashta's renaming of the baby a prince or princess. The nobles in the conversation stiffen and look at each other. Rashta, unaware of the aristocracy, tried to preserve her pride, leaving Sovieshu in a dilemma. He suggested she follow him. Sovieshu explains to Rashta that her baby cannot be a prince or princess Eve if they are the emperor's children. Rashta is confused and unsure why her children are not considered royalty. Sovieshu concludes by stating that the law is written in the great church and cannot be changed by the emperor. But the emperor told Rashta that the possibility of the empress adopting a baby and recognizing them as royalty if the empress if infertile. So Vyesha returns to the banquet, leaving Rashta in a corner, hugging her legs and dropping her forehead. The empress is walking with her brother and Marquis Farang when Rashta showed and told the empress that she will endure the insult from her. The empress asked if her value is only due to the love of the emperor. Rashta became pale, but explains that the empress who is likely infertile, will be the stepmother of her babies, and she doesn't want to fight the Empress for the sake of her future children. The Empress is surprised at Rashta's statement, but her brother, Kosher, approaches Rashta threateningly. Rashta, surprised by Kosher's aura, tries to protect her stomach, but is frightened and screams. Marky Farang and guards try to hold back Kosher's rage, but he continues to yell at Rashta about Navir being infertile and expecting her to adopt children. A palace doctor is studying Rashta, who warns her to be careful during pregnancy. Rashta is surprised when the emperor reveals that she spoke ill of the empress, claiming infertility. Rashta deny the accusations, 
and she bursts into tears. So Vieshu defends Navier, claiming that the Empress manages her image to the extreme. Rashta told the Emperor that she was pushed by Kosher. So Vyesha frowned and asked if Kosher really pushed her. She contemplates and concludes that Kosher was a kind of man that will push Rashta. The Empress, along with her brother Kosher, learns that he is forbidden from entering the palace and face punishment for threatening Miss Rashta. Rashta claims she fell because of his brother's push, which so Vyesha believes. The Empress warned his brother to be cautious with Rashta, who played a part in the Duchess Tuania's divorce and manipulated rumors. Kosher, drunk with his friend Marquis Ferrang, explained that he must keep a low profile for Navier's sake. Kosher spills more liquor and slams the glass down, claiming it was undeserved punishment. Kosher plans to strike the Emperor's concubine, Rashta, to find out her weakness. He is unable to enter the Imperial Palace. That's why he persuades Marquis Ferrang. Drawn into the situation, Kosher gives Marquis Ferrang a pouch to buy people to solve the issue. Kosher seeks an effective abortion-inducing drug, causing minimal harm to the mother, while Marquis Ferrang questions his seriousness about his potential acquisition. Heinle's letter wishes the Empress were the Queen of the Western Kingdom. The letter also mentions Coronation Day and a delegation from the Eastern Empire. The Empress wants to attend but doesn't want to promise her appearance due to unforeseen circumstances. She writes a non-committal answer and delivers it to the bird. After a few moments, a commotion in the parlor room led to the discovery of abortive drugs in Rashta's food. The emperor recognized the poisoning, and the palace doctor confirmed that Rashta had already consumed a small amount several times before. The baby is safe, but the poisoner would likely benefit someone around the empress. The emperor didn't call for her until they had meal together. The Emperor was blaming the Empress. However, Marquise Carl argues that Marquis Ferrang, Kosher's best friend, is not connected to the Empress and she is intelligent not to do something like this. So Vieshu questions the intelligence of the Empress, who could have predicted Kosher's reaction. He explained that remains tolerant by refraining from dragging Kosher away and torturing him. Marquis Carl suggests the Emperor to let the Empress come inside or they go to the Western Palace but Sovieshu disagrees. They exit the parlor room, but the Empress remains there. Sovieshu, surprised, thinking she left. The Empress is surprised by Sovieshu's pride and mocking voice. Sovieshu reveals that he is covering her brother's crime. He asks her if she didn't know that it is her brother's doing, but she is not confident to say that her brother didn't commit the act. Sovieshu, angry, approaches the Navier, who believes her brother is innocent. He urges the Empress to investigate and apologize if he is right. The next morning, Empress Navier contacts Marki Ferrang to discuss the discovery of drugs in Rashta's food, as her brother is banned from entering the palace. She questioned how Sovieshu know the drugs on Rashta's food. Marquis Ferrang, aware of Sovieshu's suspicion of Kosher, assures the Empress that they will never find conclusive evidence. The Empress is angry and hurt by the fact that her people committed such a terrible act, but also hurt her pride that Sovieshu was right. The Western delegation expresses the letter of coronation for Heinle and invited the Empress to be the Eastern representative, but Sovieshu disagrees and told them he will send Grand Duke Lil Ting. Sovieshu asks if the Empress if she is still investigating the drug. Despite the late hour, she decide to visit Sovieshu. Ask. She enter the room. Sovieshu asks if the investigation is complete. He explains that he wanted an apology in anger and was in an unpleasant mood at that time. He warns the Empress that next time he can't protect the Empress' dignity if same act will happen. Sovieshu held a small party to cheer up Rashta. A noble introduced her to Ravetti, Viscount Rotesh's daughter. Rashta was taken aback by the joke and the mischievous glances. However, Alan appeared and took his sister by the arm, leaving the party. Rashta left the room, but found Alan nearby, and he hesitated before approaching her. He told her about Anne, their son, but she told him to follow his father's advice to pretend not to know her. Rashta went to Duke Elgi's room to discuss about her problem about her her child. She has made a personal commitment to protect herself and her baby, but discovered she was eating poison. Duke Elgi suggests two ways to avoid the situation asking the emperor for help or using offensive tactics. Duke Elgi suggests that the only way to stop the empress from attacking is for Rashta to become the empress herself. Duke Elgi explains that the empress seat can change, but Rashta struggles to calm down. He suggests changing her origins, suggesting to get her she and noble parents that will show that she was lost in an accident. 
Duke LG suggests arranging a noble family from his country to protect Rashta from the Empress. Rashta insists on paying back when she becomes the Empress, but Duke LG warns her not to accept a paternity test. Duke LG approached the Empress and argues that harassing the weak is an ugly thing, implying Rashta. The Empress questions if the Duke will throw away his weapon and hide his fists if he meets a weak enemy. As they approach the Western Palace, the Empress is surprised by Duke LG's smile and asks him to hit him once to ease his guilt. Viscount Roteshu, a wealthy man, is greeted by his daughter Rivetti, who is excited to meet Her Majesty the Empress. However, her father, Roteshu, is surprised by Rivetti's unexpected news. Rivetti, eager to meet the Empress, is surprised by Roteshu's reaction. He informs Rivetti that they will discuss the matter later. Viscount Roteshu visits Rashta at the palace, despite her usual disdain. He informs her that the Empress is digging into Rashta. Despite her anger, she can only apply pressure on Viscount Roteshu to keep them quiet. Viscount Roteshu explains that spring is debutante season and he expects her to pay for a dress for her daughter. He suggests that she should have her own dress tailored for her daughter, but Rashtu is upset and wants to kill him. Sir Artina informed the Empress that Viscount Roteshu went to Rashta. Laura suggests they're trying to shut Rivetti's mouth. The Empress explained that she doesn't want information from Rivetti. She wants to show a warning to Rashta using Rivetti. Rivetti's father warns her not to tell too much to the Empress tomorrow. Rivetti, unsure of her father's intentions, agrees to avoid discussing Rashta and Anne, her brother's lover. He fears that a powerless family could be destroyed under the Emperor's wrath. Viscount Roteshu's daughter arrives early and visits the party. Countess Jubal and other ladies-in-waiting express concern about the situation, wondering if Rivetti might not help Her Majesty. The Empress reassures the ladies that the party went better than expected, and that Rivetti provided enough information. The Empress is surprised to learn that some of the teachers assigned to Rashta by Sovieshu were once her own. They question if Rashta is trying to copy her education or if she has more than just one or two teachers. The deputy confirms that Rashta has lessons in court etiquette, dance, life philosophy, painting, and piano, all from the basic teachers of young, social aristocrats. Sir Artina shares the investigation about Viscount Roteshu's mansion. Sir Artina mentions Viscount Roteshu's baby, which has never been seen. The baby's mother is unknown, and whether it belonged to her unmarried children, nephew, or distant relatives. The conversation raises questions about whether the baby is Viscount Roteshu's secret. Four days after the debutante ball, Viscount Rotesha learned about the events that happened to his daughter. Rivetti was shocked to learn that her dress was like the dress Rashta wore in the past. The next day, he confronted Rashta. Rashta sat on her chair, causing Viscount Roteshu to scream and accuse her of playing a prank. Viscount Roteshu, surprised by Rashta's calm demeanor, Rashta rebukes Roteshu, accusing him of being blinded to his child's faults and not wanting to see his own. Rashta insists on not threatening her and that she is not forced to do anything she's afraid of. She warns him that if she fall, she won't be alone. At the Emperor's room, Marquis Carl discuss unusual people they observed while investigating Viscount Roteshu. Marquis Carl reveals that it was Lord Kosher, who is also involved in the investigation, and also mentions the Empress. So Vieshu is concerned about the situation, as Kosher is known to spread flyers about Rashta, and he is determined to reveal any secrets. Kosher is tailing Viscount Roteshu when a number of men blocked his way and charge at him, but Kosher quickly defeats them. He points his sword at them and asks who sent them. The man answered that a middle-aged man paid them to pursue Kosher. Kosher kills all the men, hiding their bodies in an alley. He calls a servant to confirm Roteshu's location, then catches Roteshu and drags him to a deserted road. Kosher questions Roteshu about his relationship with Rashta. Roteshu feared Kosher and reveals that Rashta is a runaway slave, a fact that Kosher had previously knew. Frightened that Kosher will kill him, Roteshu tries to appease Kosher by revealing that Rashta has a baby. Viscount Roteshu, fearing his son Ellen's involvement, doesn't reveal Rashta's lover's identity. Kosher's triumphant laughter suggests he's rewarded for hunting down Rashta's weakness. Kosher questions Roteshu about evidence of Rashta being a slave. Roteshu reveals he has a slave trade certificate describing Rashta's appearance. The number of valuable mages in the Eastern Empire has been decreasing. Because is still unknown, but the Eastern Empire's national strength is threatened by the disappearance of valuable mages. To counter this, the Empire needs to increase the size and budget of its army. A servant informs Sovieshu of Marquis Karl's arrival. 
Marquis Karl handed a letter to the emperor. Sovieshu reads the letter and was frozen because of shock. He then instructs him to save Viscount Roteshu and confine Kosher to his home. Alan encounters Rashta, who is hostile towards him, but he handed her a cloth containing a silver hairlock. Alan tries to give it to Rashta, but she slaps him and the cloth falls, revealing the hairlock. Alan apologizes, but feels disappointed, as he thought Rashta was arranging a mansion for their sake. Alan trailed off, and Rashta ordered the maid to escort him away. As she left the garden, she picked the drop cloth with lock of hair, which she found to be softer and similar to hers. She returned to her room. Marquis Farang informed the Empress that Rashta had given birth to a baby before meeting Sovieshu. The father of the baby is unknown, but Viscount Roteshu is taking care of it. He also told the news about the Empress's brother, Kosher, had violently assaulted Viscount Roteshu to collect information, and Sovieshu sent a guard to confine the him. Sovieshu arrives at the palace early the next morning and visits Rashta, who is sleeping peacefully. He notices a lock of silver hair under her pillow which he believes is Rashta's first baby. He feels sympathetic towards her and pretends not to know anything about Rashta's situation. Sovieshu returns to the Eastern Palace and calls for Marquis Karl, who is tense due to his knowledge of Rashta's secret and the Emperor's anger towards the Empress. Sovieshu is considering divorce, not to Rashta, but with the Empress. Marquis Karl is devastated and believes it is his duty to prevent divorce between the Emperor and Empress. The Emperor wants to divorce the Empress, believing it is the best path to protect her from the fallout. Marquis Karl is shocked by Sovieshu's plans to raise Rashta to the position of Empress. He believes that public opinion will compare her to the Empress, leading to a shift in public opinion to reinstate her. Sovieshu plans to put the Empress back on the throne into years. Marquis Karl is stunned by Sovieshu's long game tactics. The Marquis questions Miss Rashta's willingness to step down as Empress. The Emperor suggests that if she doesn't want to, he can force her to do so by bringing up her conspiracy with Viscount Roteshu against Duchess Tuania. Marquis Karl was thinking if Sovieshu had planned this since the incident with Viscount Roteshu. Sovieshu discussed national affairs, he spoke with the chief mage, who mentioned a decline in mages for nearly two decades, which is concerning. The Empress asks about the length of time the Emperor intends to keep her brother under house arrest. Sovieshu believes she cannot control her brother and he will never change, and determined to protect his child by banishing her brother. The Emperor discusses her brother's violent assault on Viscount Roteshu. The Empress explained that it was Viscount Roteshu who attacked Kosher first. The Emperor didn't believe Kosher's narrative, but urges her to leave. The Empress is wondering if the Emperor knew about Rashta's past. While walking, the Empress sees Viscountess Verdi in tears, and called her, but she leaves and didn't say anything. Walking on her way, she heard that someone is asking about her family's disapproval of divorce and found out it was Rashta. The Emperor visit Rashta and then announces that Rashta will become the Empress for a year, a move that shocks Rashta. She is shocked and unsure of the burden of the position. Sovieshu then reveals that the Empress's baby will officially become a prince or princess in one year, causing Rashta to feel overwhelmed and confused. Rashta fears that the Empress family will not accept the divorce, but Sovieshu promises to take care of it, ensuring her safety. Sovieshu assures her that she can rise from slavery by studying hard and maintaining a healthy body. Rashta understands the situation. The Empress' vision become blur and her chest is aching. After hearing Sovieshu's promise to make Rashta Empress after their divorce, she can't imagine it. Despite their past disagreements over Rashta, they had a strong friendship. She remembers Grand Duke Kapman's words about the possibility of her and the Emperor's divorce. She managed to stand up and went to study a book on the Eastern Empire's history, discovering that commoner concubines were rarely married. The book's mention of commoner concubines as empresses is a rare occurrence, but possible. The Empress went to Wurwurl, a city of mages, to visit Evely and to think. She passed by a restaurant she once dined with Prince Heinle, a year ago. She saw a familiar-looking figure at the table, but are surprised to find it was Prince Heinle. Prince Heinle is also surprised, the Empress asked to join him. She was thinking if the prince is as free as he has been, seeing him in that place. Heinle recounts sneaking out of the royal family to avoid courtiers, a feat that seems dangerous. Heinle explains that sometimes the most amazing and wonderful things happen when one takes risks. He brought that his problem was people are asking for a queen, but he is hesitant to marry because he wants a queen that is Empress Navier and added that his people will like her.
The Empress is uneasy about a compliment from Heinle, who notices her unwellness. She refuses to discuss her problems with him, fearing it would cause distress. Heinle, however, is serious, and expresses his desire for her to be his queen. She notices that Heinle is serious about what he said, and answered what if she would accept his proposal. The Empress is surprised when Heinle speak that he is serious about the proposal, and swears on his life. The conversation turns into an oath, and the Empress remains silent. The Empress visits Evely and was devastated by the loss of her ability to be useful to Her Majesty. Despite her desire to be a mage for the Empress, the disappearance of magic seems to diminish her value as a person. The Empress tries to comfort Evely, but is emotionally exhausted. After finishing work at the Academy, the Empress walks around with Heinle. She share a conversation about her meeting with Evely and how she believes her value comes from her magical abilities. The Empress shares that her value comes from being Empress, and if it disappears, she would feel hopeless and desolate. Heinle asked Navier what was happening, but the Empress didn't answer. Navier remembers the proposal of Heinle and accepted it. Heinle smiled brightly after hearing what the Empress said. She promised to make a good queen and never interfere if Heinle accepted another woman as his concubine. Heinle's expression shook in shock as he was introduced to the topic of concubines. The Empress was already prepared for this situation. Heinle was very happy, but asked the Empress the reason of accepting the political marriage. But Navier didn't answer him. Heinle insists that whatever the reason, he will never reconsider if she change her mind. The Empress tries to explain her situation however, two people approach them and their conversation was cut, but she promised she will write him a letter. Heinle is very happy to meet Queen Navier in Warworld. He intentionally went to this region upon hearing Navier will visit it. Meeting her is not coincidence but intentional, but he did not accept they will met at a restaurant. He was very ecstatic that he was being proposed. But the mood changes when he realized that the marriage is to Empress Navier is only a marriage of convenience to satisfy the noble's impatience and McKenna's nagging. Heinle was saddened that there was no mention of love in the proposal, but he was glad they have the opportunity to become close. Navier recalls her agreement with Heinle, which involved her becoming queen and Heinle receiving her experience as a ruler. However, she feel regret about the potential scandal and the potential for political alliances. But if Heinle didn't change his mind, she need to make her best effort to help him rule his kingdom. The Empress feels hollowed out as she walk with a knight to balance her composure. She realized that she likes Sovietia more than she thought, but admitting it doesn't make a difference, she don't intend to stay with him. Countess Eliza announced that the Empress brother, Lord Kosher, has been banished by the Emperor. Despite her feelings for Sovietshu, she struggles to find a way to protect her family. She already knew that it will happen, but not sudden. She answered Countess Eliza that she will send money and letters to Lord Kosher. She noticed that her things were not in order, indicating that there are intruders. She asked the maids who clean the room and the night guards, but they don't notice anyone. However, they remember, a collective summons was issued by the night commander. The intruder may have taken Heinle's letters, as Sovietia would use any means to divorce her. The emperor asked about Werwerl. She answered that Evely will still attend the Magic Academy, though she doesn't have mana anymore. Sovietia criticizes her for not intervening in her decision, stating that it was best for her to give up. The empress believes it is Evely who decides whether it was her way or not. The Empress questioned if he had searched her room, but she was questioned if she was hiding something. He snorted and walked away. He returned with a box containing letters with Heinle which he had stolen. The Empress picked out the letters, and Sovietia snatched the fourth one, burning them. The Emperor asked why she feigns ignorance when Rashta was mocked because of Heinle. She insists Rashta lied about being Prince Heinle's friend and that the other way around. She wonders what Sovietshu's mind is thinking and realize it is not worth arguing with him. The Empress is about to exit the dining hall, but Sovietshu confronts her, accusing her of using messenger birds for letters and ordering knights to shoot birds. He told her that he is her husband and he has the right to say something about the matter. She admits she is her husband, but Sovietshu is not her lover. She wonders why Sovietshu burned evidence with his own hands that he can use to find a reason to divorce her. When the Empress arrived in her room, she asked Countess Eliza to bring her a red cloth, symbolizing danger, as Sovietshu threatened to shoot birds. Despite feeling gloomy, she tries to prevent birds from dying. She believes that a bird of the West knows the significance of a red flag. McKenna was surprised to hear the news from Heinle.
Empress Navier is set to become the Queen of the Western Kingdom, a surprising development considering her rule-following nature. Heinle wonders if Emperor Sovieshu is about to divorce her. McKenna questions if the proposal was genuine. Heinle confirms his wholehearted acceptance. Heinle plans to start a war against the Eastern Empire, but warns McKenna that it won't be easy. Heinle admits that he cannot make an Empress a queen, but he is happy with the plan. The Western Kingdom's people feel inferior to the Eastern Empire, and discontent is expected to grow. Heinle promises to deliver a letter to Empress Navier, despite the challenges. A secretary informs Heinle of news from a spy in the Eastern Empire about the banished of Empress Navier's brother, Kosher from the Troby family. Heinle requests to find the Empress's brother and bring him to him. McKenna noticed a red cloth hanging from a window. He thought that it symbolizes good fortune, as it means an Eastern Empire. He wondered if Empress Navier had feelings for King Heinle. Suddenly, a piercing ache touched his body, causing him to fall down. The Empress is anticipating a letter from Heinle. She look at the window and spot a red stain on the wall below the window. She suspect the bird may have been hurt, as Sovieshu warned against shooting birds near the window. She searched through the Western Palace Gardens, but find no birds. She hears a noise from the parlor room and finds a large round plate with a silver lid. The servant reveals that the emperor ordered a roast bird to be delivered to her. The empress is filled with disgust as she sees the blue feathers on the bird and the smell of spices. The ladies in waiting hurriedly call for a doctor, as she was shocked at the sight of the bird. Rashta encounters a small bird with blue feathers. She wonders if it was hunted down, as hunting is prohibited in the palace. She realizes she's seen a blue bird with Duke Elgi before. The bird opens its eyes and cries, and a note is tied to its leg. Rashta wonders if it's Duke Elgi's messenger, and reads it while walking to the Duke's room. Rashta delivered a letter to Duke Elgi, and told him she found the letter tied. Duke Elgi hurriedly took the blue bird and poured liquor on it, causing the bird to screech and writhe in pain. He stopped and turned to Rashta apologetically, confirming that it was the Duke's bird and asked to left alone. The Empress woke up, finding Sovieshu beside her and grabs her hand, and she remembers the events of the previous day. Sovieshu call for a palace doctor, but she refuses. She pushes him away and demands to be left and not called by her name. The Empress is angry by the act of a bird being roasted and sent to her as a warning. Sovieshu confesses that it was a different bird, but she didn't believe his lies as she saw blue feathers on the sill and blood under the window. She was angry and upset with Sovieshu and told him to get out of her room and decides to tell Heinle about what happened and think of a way to contact him. She decides to go see Duke Elgi, who is Heinle's and inform him of the circumstances. She takes Sir Artina with her, who is concerned about her health. They arrive at Duke Elgi's room, where the Empress has to speak privately. She hear a faint groan and a voice of pain, and notice a blue feather, only to find Heinle's assistant, McKenna, lying naked in the room. The Empress questions why McKenna, Heinle's closest aide and knight, is lying naked in Duke Elgi's bed. She asks why McKenna is there, but McKenna panics and opens his mouth, unsure of what to say. Duke Elgi was also surprised when she saw the Empress. McKenna apologized and tried to explain that it was a misunderstanding and he was injured on an errand for King Heinle. She asks if he can call a doctor for McKenna. But McKenna refuses, and Duke Elgi asks the Empress to come back again. Navier asks Duke Elgi if he's still friend with Heinle, but he only laughs. She told Duke Elgi to convey a word to Heinle that his blue bird is dead and will die in the future. The Empress is disturbed by the unusual timing of McKenna's injuries. She wonder if it's a coincidence, as a person couldn't change into something else. The next day, Laura informs her that Duke Elgi was seen hugging an injured bird. She is suspicious, as McKenna was in the palace on an errand for Heinle, she consult the court mage. The court mage explains that a person can't change their form with magic, but he mentions a record of the bird-headed tribe, which is not well known. The mage dismisses this claim, stating that the tribe members are gone and their numbers have diminished. He also added that if any of the tribe members would be alive, they wouldn't reveal themselves. The Empress is unsure if McKenna is the bird or if he and the bird were injured simultaneously. If he is indeed the blue bird, she should be happy, but concerned about being unbecoming in front of this bird. But she didn't do something shameful. However, she realized that she had done shameful in front of Queen, remembering this, horror strike her. Upon arriving at the Western Palace, the Empress encounters Sovieshu's servant holding a wheeled stand with a cloth covering it. 
The servant reveals a blue bird in a cage as a gift from the emperor. She is horrified and wonders if Sovieshu intended to mock her. The empress cannot bring herself to look after the bird, so she calls for Countess Eliza to return it. Rashta is anxious after Sovieshu promised to make her empress, but he hasn't yet done so. This morning, Sovieshu prepares a blue bird for Empress Navier, which makes Rashta angry. Rashta asks the servant to left the bird on her room and Delize will deliver it back to the emperor. Kasher is pondering revenge on Sovieshu and Rashta and ensuring his sister's empress ship. A bearded mom approaches him, claiming to be from the Western Kingdom. Kasher is surprised to learn that King Heinle sent him to bring him back to discuss his sister's situation. Kasher is suspicious of a scam involving a Western king trying to set a meeting to him. The man points out the symbol of the Western Kingdom on his chest, which Kasher acknowledges as real. However, he doesn't care about the Western King's summons and doesn't answer any questions about his sister. He asks if he could guide him. Kasher did not trust King Heinle. No matter how much he thought about it, there was no reason for the Western King to call him. He recalled the rumors that the Western King had fallen head over heels in love with Rashta. At the New Year's celebration, Rashta admires a blue bird, but is hesitant to admire its appearance. She apologizes to the bird and pluck its feathers. Despite her guilt, Rashta is determined to protect herself and her baby. Rashta must secure her safety, even if it means doing a terrible thing. So Vyeshu enters Rashta's room, when he noticed she was crying, and he saw the bird in the cage. Rashta told the emperor that the empress sent the bird back, and she want to raise it. So Vyeshu offers to buy Rashta a new bird, but Rashta refuses. Rashta is wondering why the emperor is not angry with the empress as he should be. Marky Karl presented his report to Sovieshu. He asked if he had found Rashta's slave certificate, but he denied having. Sovieshu is attempting to change Rashta's status by getting a fallen nobility as her parents. He is unsure of how to proceed, as he must marry within a year. He will use a method used by previous emperors to change a concubine's identity by asking Marky Karl to get one. The Empress asks Duke LG if McKenna is a bird, and she specifically asks if McKenna is a member of Birdhead tribe but the duke chuckles at ask if it is an insult. The empress is embarrassed and explains it's nothing then leave. Baron Lant, Sovieshu's secretary, introduces the topic of Rashta's parents, claiming to be from the Kalin family. The emperor is unsure if this is true, but hopes it is true. The situation is a cynical one, as Sovieshu is about to divorce the empress. Sovieshu's father, which is the previous emperor, has a history of giving his concubine a noble parents that he despised which the Empress finds absurd, as he was doing the same thing. Sovieshu is approached by Ambassador Lingal of Blue Bohine, who shares a strange story about a couple's lost daughter, Miss Rashta. The couple are nobles, and the Emperor speculates that one of the couples may be a fraud. Sovieshu commands locking up the criminals to prevent them from escaping. Rashta, struggling with depression, visits Duke LG and surprised that the meeting went crazy when revealed their two parents looking for her. Rashta decides to choose the one that Duke LG choose as couple Baron Lamp presented was fake. Rashta is advised to treat fake her parents like real ones. Since Empress don't have fake parents, Duke LG will treat her like their long-lost daughter. So Vieshu, along with Baron Lant and Marky Carl, enters the Western Tower alone. He meets the fake couple bought by Baron Lant, who confessed to deceiving them into becoming Rashta's parents. The nobles who appear thin and pale, follow Sovieshu's words that it is not Baron Lant that commanded them, but Kasher Trobi. Sovieshu, unsure if he is getting divorced, writes down the reasons for the divorce, including Kasher Trobi's abuse of Rashta, his kidnapping and assault of Viscount Roteshu, and his bribery of a noble couple. Sovieshu tries to end the situation by banishing Trobi, but is unsuccessful. As he contemplates the decision, Marky Carl asks if it was the right choice. Sovieshu seals the divorce papers and handed them to Carl to deliver to High Priest. The Empress is rumored to be infertile, and Marky Carl questions why he believes so. Marky Carl believes that the Empress is still young and she can bear children in the future, but Sovieshu has decided to divorce the Empress. Sovieshu presented Rashta to the Blue Bohine couple, who he knew were her true parents. He had interrogated them and had several reasons why Rashta could be considered their biological daughter. Rashta agreed, and the noble couple began crying. They were emotional, and Sovieshu ordered the prison guards to open the cell door. After a brief reunion, the noble couple cried again, and Sovieshu warned them that their necks would be on the execution stand if they were frauds. 
Kasher finally arrived in the capital of the Western Kingdom and was passing through the palace gates. King Heinle was already waiting for him there. A message was sent when Kasher had passed through the main gates, but he didn't expect the king to welcome him at his immediate arrival. Kasher is introduced to King Heinle by an escort. Heinle is eagerly anticipating Kosher's arrival, and he greets him as elder brother. Kasher is stunned and unsure of how to react. Kasher is stunned and unsure of how to react. Heinle is unsure about what to do beyond this point, as he needs to gain favor from Navier's family. In Heinle's eyes, Kasher is priority number one. Heinle confesses to Kasher that he promised to marry his sister Empress Navier. He saw the handkerchief of Navier, which Heinle explained that Navier tied it on his neck. Kasher was surprised hearing it. Heinle then explains that Empress Navier proposed to him first and believed that she did it because Emperor Sovieshu is preparing to divorce her. Kasher is shocked by this news, and Heinle admits that she offered him a marriage of convenience. Kasher, aware of Sovieshu's love for his pregnant concubine, questions why King Heinle accepted a proposal from Navier. Heinle explains that he loves her, revealing a complex relationship that Kasher cannot comprehend. Kasher, suspicious of Heinle's alleged womanizing tendencies, immediately rebuke that he a womanizer. He explains that his pretended freedom was intentional to blind people's eyes. Kasher then questions Heinle about his marriage to Empress Navier and their communication methods. Heinle informs Kasher that Emperor Sovieshu noticed their communication and that they need to find another way to communicate. Kasher collaborates with King Heinle, using Marquis Farang to send letters to Navier outside the capital. Marquis Farang delivers a letter from Heinle. The Empress was surprised that Heinle had met with her brother and find a way to deliver his letter to her. She asked if he had the blue bird with him. Marquis Farang answered that it is in his home and was cage. She also asked Marquis Farang if the blue bird is injured or if it has an arrow wound. He doesn't notice, but he will check it out. She also requested to remove the bird from the feeder. Navier answered the letter she received from Heinle, as she writes the emperor's desire to leave her and his promise to Rashta to divorce her. Marquis Farang leaves immediately so that she can receive a letter earlier leaving the Empress feeling better as she enjoy being in contact with Heinle and knowing the blue bird is safe. Countess Eliza tells the Empress that Baron Lamp bought fake parents, but the couple denies this. But they point finger on Kasher, who they said the one who commanded them to lie. The Empress leaves her chambers, deciding to meet the couple in person. The couple greeted the Empress, but she interrogated them, asking if her brother ordered them to pretend to be fake parents. The couple admitted that her brother, Lord Kosher, threatened them and they had no choice. She questions the couple about her brother's appearance. The couple is confused and tries to correct their mistake. The Empress then confronts the Emperor, who is standing on the wall. So Vieshu accused her of pressuring them and causing them to speak nonsense. The Empress sees how determined Sovieshu's intent to divorce her, regardless of the truth of the couple's words. He believes the brother of the Empress was banished for repeated harm to the Emperor's baby, which could be used as justification for divorce. She exits and stops arguing and returns to her chamber. The Empress ordered her ladies-in-waiting to see the secretaries of the Emperor, and she noticed that Marquis Carl is absent. Marquis Carl is absent from the palace due to his orders to be out of the palace for a few days. That means that Sovieshu already sent a file for application for divorce to the high priest. The high priest will discuss the divorce with Sovieshu in person, and the court will gather. The empress must decide whether to accept Sovieshu's divorce or face a lengthy process. The victory always goes to the emperor. The empress is worried about her upcoming divorce and decides to write a letter to Heinle, expressing her desire to remarry. She realizes that no empress or queen has ever remarried after divorce, and she needs to obtain clear consent from the high priest. She hands the letter to Sir Artina, commanding her to bring it to Marky Farang, leaving the ladies-in-waiting worried. She apologizes and promises to update them after everything has settled. She waits for Sir Artina to deliver a letter to Marky Farang, but finds out he failed to deliver. Marky Farang left for the Western Kingdom. She demands Sir Artina to find him and deliver the letter. The letter must be delivered to Heinle before the high priest arrives. The high priest arrived at the imperial palace, causing the palace to be puzzled, and he privately spoke with Sovieshu. The high priest recalls the wedding of Sovieshu and Navier, who were young adults. Sovieshu carried his bride on his back, causing laughter. The high priest was confident in their future happiness. However, when the couple entered the palace, the high priest was surprised e and asked about their divorce. 
The emperor announces his intention to divorce the empress, claiming she is the cause. The high priest asks the accusations and questions his belief about the empress' infertility. So Viesha asked the high priest that what he will told him should remain on that room only, and stated it happened when he was the crown prince. The princess diet was restricted for a large event, and so Viesha complained to the official. The crown prince and princess were revealed to the public. The official refused to give up the couple's beauty, so Sovieshu sought help from his mother. Sovieshu went to her mother who is not in her room, but he saw a box of cookies and take it. He finds Navier reading a book in her room and invites her to eat some cookies. Navier agrees and shares a cookie with Sovieshu, and they enjoy the cookies together. Sovieshu faces trouble when the empress found out that he took the cookies. She reveals that the cookies is for Countess Sophia, and it was laced with a drug that causes miscarriage and infertility. The Empress questions Sovieshu about eating the cookies together with Navier, but he lies and admits he ate them alone. He tries to keep this a secret. Sovieshu recounts his childhood and adulthood, stating that he and Navier were healthy and young, but he assumed that they had no children due to the drug's effects. After Rashta became pregnant, he believes it was the Empress who was barren. The High Priest assumes her infertility due to the drug she unknowingly consumed years ago. The high priest enters the empress room and reveals that Sovieshu's reasons for the divorce include the empress's brother's actions, such as pushing the pregnant concubine, kidnapping and bribing fake parents, and harming Viscount Roteshu. The empress denies these accusations, stating that the emperor's heart went to someone else. The high priest then proceeds with the divorce process, but the she must understand that it will be difficult for them to navigate the situation. In late evening, a maid informed that Sir Artina has returned. She informs the Empress that she delivered the letter to Marquis Ferang before he crossed the border. She writes a letter to her handmaids and Sir Artina, expressing gratitude and happiness. As tears fall, a loud thump by the window is heard, causing the her to wonder if it's the blue bird. Upon closer inspection, it's not the blue bird, but it's Queen. The Empress sees a fallen golden bird and cries, but is relieved to find Queen still breathing. She feel tears streaming down their face as she listen to the bird's beat. The bird's feathery chest warms her cheek, and she look at Queen, feeling a brittle heart. She plead with her not to die. She brings a first aid kit, and brings a bottle of wine to treat Queen. She checks on Queen's leg and finds a letter tied to his leg. She treats Queen first, focusing on its health. She pours wine on the wound, blots it with gauze, and applies ointment. She receives a letter from Heinle, inviting her to meet in person at Duke LG's room. The letter's contents surprise her, as Heinle is in the Duke's room wondering how he managed to travel fast since the letter she sent through Artina was only hours ago. The Empress received an emergency state meeting called by the Emperor, hoping her to attend. The ladies-in-waiting express concern about the meeting's purpose, but she remains determined that the divorce will happen regardless. The Empress attends an emergency meeting in the audience chamber, where the guards open the door without meeting her eyes. The nobles and officials in the hall are focused on the her, but the room is deathly silent. So Vieshu, sitting on his throne, stares at her and apologizes, but she refuses to apology. The high priest enters the room, and the nobles hold their breaths as they wait for the meeting to begin. So Vieshu announces his intention to divorce Empress Navier, causing a stir among the nobles. A divorce court is set to be held soon, and the Empress is followed by sympathetic gazes. However, as she leaves the audience chamber, Rashta confronts her and told her that she did not hate the Empress and even if Her Majesty is gone, Rashta will remember her. The Empress is upset, but she answered that she doesn't have to remember her. She arrives at the Southern Palace where Duke LG is staying. She is greeted by Heinle, who has been waiting for her. Heinle smiles and asks if she wants to hold her. She hesitates, but agrees and wraps her tightly around. Heinle whispers in her ear that she heard everything about the emergency state meeting. Heinle extends his hand, expressing his hope that she will not stand alone long and that she will be approved for remarriage once she is divorced. The Empress is worried about attending the divorce court due to the potential threat from the Sovieshu Emperor. She fears that Heinle might be barred from attending due to his past treatment of Rashta. Despite this, Heinle assures the her that they will be ready to ask for a second marriage after the divorce is approved. Heinle's nonchalant smile and comforting personality make her feel better. The Empress asks Heinle how he arrived so quickly, but Heinle reveals that he will tell her after they are married. 
The Empress is tense and anxious the day after the divorce trial. So Vieshu enters her room, which was less nervous and more enjoyable. So Vieshu appears normal and healthy, but the Empress is crushed. So Vieshu wants her to stay with him after the divorce. She is surprised by So Vieshu's bizarre suggestion that divorce won't make them strangers, despite their initial disagreement. The Empress feels heavy and wonders if So Vieshu feels guilt for initiating the divorce. She pulls her hand away from him, unsure of the reason behind his suggestion. The Empress asks them that she will wear her usual clothes, and is greeted by the ladies-in-waiting, who are crying. She feels grieved for her situation until So Vieshu's knights arrived, confirming her readiness to go. Rashta's life changes drastically. Despite her pity for Navier, Rashta values herself more than the Empress, ensuring that her good fortune is not wasted. Duke Elji visits Rashta, who is deciding on her attire for the divorce court. He is disappointed that Rashta kept a secret about the Empress's divorce. Rashta apologizes and admits to having a secret. He helps Rashta to choose a dress for her, and she agrees. He suggests dress that is shiny and glamorous, as it is a bad day for the Empress, but not for Rashta, who needs to show herself to the people. In the hall where the divorce court would take place, everyone was already there, including nobles, officials, and the Empress parents. Marquis Farang was also present, but his pale face and swollen lips made it difficult for them to exchange words. The Empress, feeling anxious, approached the High Priest, who informed her that her husband, Emperor Sovieshu, had requested her divorce. The High Priest told her that if she accepted the divorce, she would no longer be Empress, lose all royal family rights, and not be allowed to use the royal family name. The High Priest asked if she would accept the divorce, without specifying the reason, and if not, she could file a suit. The Empress answered Tay she will accept the divorce. Marquis Farang, Countess Eliza, Sir Artina, and her defenders expressed their disagreement to the Empress. Acceptance for the divorce. The high priest, angry, wants her to challenge the reason for the divorce so that it would cause scandal to Sovieshu's reputation and her concubine. However, Navier asked the minister for her to remarry, causing a shock silence. The high priest is confused and unsure of what she is asking. A man wearing an embroidered veil bursts into laughter, and she announces she will marry him. Sovieshu and Rashta was surprised after seeing Heinle, the one that Navier wants to marry. The high priest is astonished by King Heinle's proposal to have Navier the as his queen. Heinle tries to provoke Sovieshu, but the high priest warns him. Heinle pleads with the high priest for approval, stating he will return in an official capacity later and didn't want to miss this opportunity now. The high priest approves the marriage, despite the unexpected outcome. He is surprised by the decision, however congratulates the couple as a newly married couple. Navier and Heinle is grateful for the high priest's approval but she is reminded that this will be a difficult road. Navier is confronted by Sovieshu about her marriage. Navier explains that it's not her ex-husband's business that she got married after their divorce. Sovieshu, in defiance, insists that he is still the emperor and won't allow her ex-wife to marry. High priest intervene and reminds Emperor Sovieshu that this falls under his authority, not him. After Sovieshu and the high priest left the room, Navier and Heinle were confronted by her parents, ladies-in-waiting, and Marky Farang, because of her sudden remarriage. They question her plans, but Navier explains that she had to keep them secret to avoid any potential issues. Laura decides to follow Navier abroad as well as Countess Jubal also agreed to accompany her. Navier's parents are shocked by the news that their son is in the Western Kingdom, after Heinle told them. They are relieved that their son is safe and that their daughter wouldn't abandon as ex-empress. Rashta follows Sovieshu to his room while thinking how cruel the Navier is after marrying another king after the divorce, causing ridicule for Sovieshu. Rashta sympathizes with Sovieshu who is shocked by the situation and leans against a table, breathing hard. Rashta reveals to Sovieshu that Prince Heinle's letter friend is actually the deposed Empress. She explains that she had been trying to protect the Empress by pretending to be Heinle's letter friend. As Sovieshu stared at her weeping form, his expression became strange. The imperial family scandal spread across the country. No divorced Empress had ever done so, and the Emperor still had a visible position. Empress Navier, known for her cool demeanor and intelligence, remarried the King of the West causing shock and speculation about her future as a queen. People divided over Navier's remarriage, with some supporting it and others arguing it was crazy. Some wanted to prevent it, suggesting she keep her carriage. 
Heinle suggested the family move to the Western Kingdom, but they declined. The family found Heinle's speech awkward, and Marquis Ferrang found the situation amusing. He opened the front door, but froze. Navier noticed a line of guards surrounded the gate, and the family was left questioning what was happening. Marquis Ferrang finds the Trobi's mansion surrounded by Emperor's knights. Navier tries to go outside, but the knights block her way. Heinle approaches, threatening that keeping the king and queen of the Western Kingdom in custody will cause diplomatic problems. So Vieshu arrives at the gate, claiming Heinle has taken another person's wife. Heinle and a playboy king, accuses Sovieshu of causing disturbance and seducing Navier. Navier claim that she is the one that proposed to Heinle, but Sovieshu she if she trying to get revenge on him and that Heinle is only using her. She confesses that she and Heinle is using each other, but she noticed that Heinle became shocked and quiet after what she said. Navier apologizes to Heinle and then turns to Sovieshu, who is furious. Sovieshu told her that she is the one that he wants to be with, but Navier answered that if she is the he want to be with, then why did he divorce her? Sovieshu became quiet. Sovieshu apologizes to Navier for sending him to a novice, but she remains numb. Heinle speak that he now have enough time to know more about Navier, so Vieshu become more angry after hearing those words. Marquis Carl addresses him, stating there are too many eyes around. So Vieshu blinked and looks around. So Vieshu gritted and retreated from his carriage, leaving the knights in the mansion. The queen and Heinle returned inside, and the queen's mother asked her to disguise herself as a maid to avoid being trapped. However, this plan proved futile, as the guards only targeted the queen and Heinle. The queen's parents tried to plead for her release but Sovieshu refused. The queen was worried that her imprisonment would worsen Heinle's reputation, as he had remarried a former empress. Heinle, who had previously spoken about a political marriage, informed the queen that he was not thinking of her as a political partner. Marquis Carl warns Sovieshu about the danger of a potential international problem if King Heinle is trapped in the Eastern Empire capital. He warns him not to let the relationship go wrong and urges him to send a congratulatory gift to show his generosity. Marquis Carl, a secretary of the Eastern Empire, asks Sovieshu to send a congratulatory gift for King Heinle's wedding anniversary. Sovieshu argues that sending a gift when a wife remarries another man is ridiculous. Sovieshu slams his desk, knowing he cannot keep King Heinle and Navier, who are approved for remarriage by the high priest. Sovieshu and Navier had been together since childhood, but she remarried and left her, thinking about it making him more angry with Heinle, who he believes seduced Navier. So Vieshu summoned Duke Elgi, who was a friend of King Heinle. Duke Elgi is asked to take King Heinle from the Trobi mansion, despite the bitter feud between him and Sovieshu. Sovieshu aims to preserve his pride by rescuing Heinle, and Duke Elgi agrees. Sovieshu then instructs his secretaries to find a law prohibiting Empress remarriage, focusing on history, code, and etiquette. Duke Elgi travels to Trobi's mansion to gain Sovieshu's favor and trust. He considers his friendship with Heinle, who is infatuated with Navier. They maintain a cooperative relationship, but gaining Sovieshu's trust would hurt Heinle. Restoring both Heinle and the former empress would cause Sovieshu to distrust him. Duke Elgi wonders what will happen in the end. Navier went to see Duke Elgi and asked him if it was Sovieshu who sent him, and he answered that she had a good intuition. But Navier asked to talk to her before going to Heinle. The Duke agrees and follows her. In a garden, Navier and questions Duke Elgi's friendship with Miss Rashta who is suspected of harming the people of the Eastern Empire. She asked the Duke to tell her Rashta's doing in the future, doesn't care about Rashta's actions, but doesn't want her to destroy the Empress position or the people of the Eastern Empire. She asked to keep a secret from her parents and Heinle due to her difficult situation. Duke Elgi sighed at her request. He already chose Sovieshu command, but his conscience stabbed him and concluded to take Heinle with Navier. He told her to go to the back entrance of her room to escape. Navier is surprised by Duke Elgi's reaction and thanks him for helping her escape. Duke Elgi and Heinle appear after a few moments. Heinle wonders why her parents aren't there, but she explains that she have spoken to them. The carriage parks by the back entrance, and the, the Duke boarded the carriage. Duke Elgi shuts the door before Heinle gets on, and Navier was surprised to find a large empty space inside the carriage bench. He points out a secret box, requiring her to enter it. The knights didn't notice the former empress's escape until two days later, so Viesha pushed his secretaries to cancel her remarriage, but only the high priest had authority. 
They searched records and law books, but no alternative solutions were found. But then they suggest that the emperor cancel the divorce as the only solutions left. He explained that canceling a divorce would lead to a double marriage, which would automatically annul the remarriage. So Viesha laugh as he couldn't cancel the divorce, as the empress was infertile and he needed a successor. So Vieshu decides to visit Navier at the Troby mansion, but she's not there. He accuses Duke Elgi of stealing the Empress, possibly during his attempt to take King Heinle. So Vieshu orders men to search every gateway and seize any woman resembling the Empress. Heinle helps the Queen up and they discuss their journey to a border town. She taken their surroundings, including her brother's exiled place, Lux. Duke Elgi told her that he can no longer accompany them, and the Queen thanks him for his help. Navier and Heinle were welcomed by McKenna, who was with many guards. She wonders if the guards caught her in an awkward moment, and wonders how she will be perceived in the Western Kingdom. Heinle believes she will be loved by everyone, and she answered she is a bit excited, but Heinle tends to overestimate her. Heinle condemns a knight named Sir Unum for saying to his face, together with Navier, that he personally bringing the queen over, referring to her as one woman. Heinle warns him about a man willing to risk his life for a few words. Unum apologizes, but adds malicious words, implying that he was in danger while escorting Lady Navier. Unum also added that the queen's bedroom is not ready until they get to have wedding. Heinle was in a verge of anger after hearing this. But she understands the knight because he is only concerned about Heinle, who is detained in the Eastern Empire while trying to bring her to the Western Kingdom. She believes that Heinle should not continue to take her side. That's why she grip his arm. She believes that to earn recognition and trust, she must earn the recognition of the people in the Western Kingdom. She smiles and speaks softly, stating that she must follow the rules of the Western Kingdom. Sir Unum, who initially hesitates, apologizes without giving up his suspicious expression. She asks Sir Unum where should Shet stay. He answered that she can use a room for distinguished guests, but she refuses due to her status as queen. McKenna suggests she and Heinle share the same bedroom, but a lady in a blue dress, Krista, greets her and suggests she stay in the queen's detached palace. She accepts and follows her, feeling disconcerted as she never expected the former queen to be in the royal palace. Krista asked Navier if the rumor is true that she married Heinle after being divorced, and she answered without hesitation. Krista smiles but becomes sad and confused. Then a courtier greets Krista and calls her queen. Krista is surprised and corrects her, but the courtier explains that Krista has continued to play the role of queen, and the new queen is a foreigner who loves her country. Krista is the only queen for them. The courtier doesn't understand anything. Krista seem want Navier to step forward and answer the courtier, but she didn't do anything and remained silent. Upon reaching the detached palace, Krista expressed concern and apologized about her situation and the courtier's support. Krista is hesitant to leave after showing the entire interior. She asked a favor to Navier to avoid changing any of the courtiers as they are from retirement age and are considered good workers. Navier tries to maintain neutrality, but she only plans to leave those who work in places where there is no contact with her. Krista's expression darkens and apologizes for asking for too much. Heinle admits to being imprudent in traveling to the Eastern Empire alone in front of the officials and courtiers. He was angry how they treat Navier upon arriving to the palace. He added that he admired and adored Navier. He argued that Navier is Western Kingdom Queen, but people still considered Krista as the queen. Marky Ketrin, a cousin of former Queen Krista, refuted this, but Heinle reassured him that he would take care of those who couldn't treat her as the queen. She receives a bouquet of jewels from her husband, Heinle, who claims the Western Kingdom is the capital of jewels. Navier accepts the gift, feeling embarrassed, while Heinle is happy just because she accepted his gift. Navier questions about his behavior going inside her room through the window. He answered that it is a habit. She changed the subject after noticing Heinle's embarrassment. He explained the meeting with his subordinate that everyone should know she is his queen and stop making things difficult for her. Heinle offers to help her, but she insists she must control her reputation personally. Heinle requests McKenna to send Sir Unum's sister as a lady in waiting as a temporary position. Heinle witnessed the captain of the guard treating Navier and informed McKenna that they are waiting for the two Eastern Empire ladies in waiting arrival. Heinle asked about Lord Kosher. Heinle and McKenna discuss the situation and the need to change Kosher's reputation. Kosher is hiding himself from Navier to avoid tarnishing her reputation. 
Heinle and McKenna are also discussing the wedding preparations for the Navier, as she is the current queen, and the former queen, Krista, is no longer the queen. Asking Navier to prepare her own wedding would be a threat to high society, as it would be too extravagant or underestimating the Western Kingdom. However, if Heinle let Krista to prepare the wedding, her position will strengthen. Heinle is anxious about what to do. Heinle discussed that he will do the wedding preparation. However, McKenna explained the possibility if the wedding is considered extravagant, it will be due to his deep love for the bride. Heinle reassures McKenna that he will self-proclaim emperor on the wedding day, which astonishes him. The choice is a wise one, as Navier would become the first empress of the Western Empire, renewing the image of her quick marriage. The hostility towards her as a foreigner is overshadowed by her title. Heinle, however, is quite hesitant the possibility of self-proclaiming emperor because under his brother Wharton III, the royal authority weakened due to illness, but he still decided to do the proclamation of the Western Kingdom into an empire. The royal authority was weaker than in his father's time, but a strong army was still needed. Heinle asked McKenna to return the mana to a student from the Magic Academy named Evely. McKenna explained that it would cost too much and that if Evely returned her mana, it would return to the Eastern Empire. McKenna was dissatisfied, but Heinle reassured him that it was only one person's responsibility. So Vyashu, anxiously waiting for news of Navier, is worried about the deposed Empress, while Rashta comforts him by telling him that her reputation has been damaged and everyone is on his side. So Vyeshu is angry and tells Rashta not to meet with Duke Elgi anymore, as he believes he helped Navier escape. Rashta misunderstands that So Vyeshu sent Duke Elgi to take Heinle away, thinking he was jealous of him. He realizes that Rashta misunderstood him, but didn't correct her to avoid embarrassing her. Sir Yunam returns home after receiving a letter with the king's seal from McKenna. Rose, Yunam's sister, greets him and gives her the letter. Rose opens it discovering it's a king's command for her to be the new queen's temporary lady-in-waiting. Rose admires Navier's intelligence and asserts that she is acting like a good queen. Rumors of Yunam's arrogance towards Navier spread. Rose agrees to observe the new queen as her lady-in-waiting to assess her qualities and potential for the country. Ada M., Rose Quebel, Yunam arrives to serve as the queen's lady-in-waiting. Despite her education and manners, she is cautious. The queen asks to be taken to a boutique which Rose agrees to. Navier asks Lady Rose for six outfits and tells her about three daily, two for work, and one for a banquet. She let her choose her outfit since she didn't know about the Western Kingdom style. She also asks Rose to show her the palace, and they arrive through a long corridor. She hears stealthy footsteps and sees a man dressed elegantly with a pen on his lips. Rose tells her that only one journalist has permission to enter the palace. Navier wonders if the other two journalists are tailing Krista or if Krista doesn't like journalists walking around the palace. Instead of going elsewhere, she approaches the journalist and asks him if he have a question to her. The journalist is smart and asks how she got married again so quickly. People expect the truth or the desired response when reading a newspaper. In this case, the people of the Western Kingdom wanted a desired response about their king's amorous whims. Navier responded with a smile, stating that she arranged everything before her divorce, but the journalist asked if she knew beforehand. She answered that she heard it. Her response surprised the journalist, and Rose looked at her with pity. At six in the afternoon, Rose personally took care of the queen's meal at the central palace meeting her brother Yunam. Yunam asked her about the queen, and Rose responded that she doesn't show feelings. Yunam also questions about her comparison to Krista. Rose reveals her limited knowledge and limited understanding of her personality and competence as it is only one day they that they are together. Rose admits she doesn't dislike it and can continue to be her lady in waiting as long as she walks less. Navier finds Heinle standing outside, holding a lunchbox with an ivory-colored gold leaf. He asks to eat together, reminiscing about her childhood with Sovieshu. She promises to change Heinle's habit and sits down with him. Navier mentions meeting a journalist with navy blue hair. She shares their conversation and reveals that she will always be grateful to Heinle, but Heinle told her that he is the one who always wanted her as his queen. Heinle inquired about other lady-in-waiting she want to add beside Miss Rose. She explained that she would easily choose women with good reputations or those close to her as lady-in-waitings, if it is an Eastern Empire. However, she was not in the position, making the choice difficult. Heinle becomes sad after realizing it. 
The queen is asked a favor by her husband, Heinle, who mentions they are a couple. She thought he is suggesting a physical interaction, possibly a kiss. She was ready to kiss him, but she noticed a fork near her face, leaving her puzzled. She almost expresses her desire to kiss Heinle, but her words are too harsh for him to notice. He explained that it is his dream to feed her, embarrassed by what was her thought. She puts cherry tomatoes in his mouth and feeds him fast, urging her to slow down. Rose heard the king's plea, stepped back and flushed her face. She admired the empress of the Eastern Empire's sharp personality and left the palace, expressing her excitement about her actions. Heinle, after consuming cherry tomatoes, reacted with disgust and a smile, expressing his appreciation for Queen's actions. The Queen felt remorse for taking the action on him, but offered to wipe his face. Heinle left his face in the Navier's care, and she suddenly remembered to ask him if McKenna was his blue bird. She repeats her questions to Heinle if McKenna is the blue bird, and he admits to being one of the bird-headed tribe. She is curious about the tribe's existence and wonders if Sir McKenna is a member. Heinle laughs and admits that the tribe's name was given by those who opposed them, but it's not a name that the tribe members like. Navier then asked him again, but this time Heinle looks anxious. She asks if Queen, the bird is also a member of that tribe. Heinle didn't answer, but lower his head and took time to respond to her. She tilted her head and looked at him intently. Heinle remained in that state for a while before asking. He asked if Queen is also a person, would that make her feel buh? She thought about Queen who brought her cake, cried for her, spread his wings and hugged her. If it's just a bird, she wouldn't feel bad. She hesitantly answered that she will feel a little anger with him. It didn't matter if Queen was just a bird, but it would be truly embarrassing if Queen was one of Hailey's subordinates. Heinle smiled awkwardly and muttered, I see. McKenna listened to Heinle who recalled the incident and expressed anxiety. Heinle feared Navier would despise him for telling the truth. McKenna convinced Heinle that he must reveal Queen's secret to Navier. Heinle plans to do so when her Eastern Empire ladies-in-waiting arrive, preparing to comfort Navier in shock. Heinle is confident Navier will be deeply shocked. The Queen is unsure why Heinle is so anxious, but suspects it may be due to his secret that he is the Bird Queen. She is intrigued by the blood relationship between Heinle and McKenna, and if becoming Bird was passed down from paternal. She feels ashamed after thinking the soft body of Queen. Rose asks Navier where she want to go today, unsure of where she want to go. She asks where is her brother Kosher staying. Rose confirms that he is staying in a room for distinguished guests, and Navier decide to go there. She is excited to see her brother in the Western Kingdom. After knocking the door and no response from the eye side, she decided to go to the library, but a knight appears and points at her, asking if she is Kosher. The knight's reaction is unclear, but it's clear he knows her brother. The knight apologized after Rose called him insolent and knelt no. He introduced his name as Apron and reveals he is not a royal knight and Kosher has been avoiding him for a while. The queen is thinking why her brother avoids Heinle's knight and told him that she is also looking for her brother, Kosher. Apron decided to follow them and join them while discussing his sister. Navier is suspicious if he is sent by Krista as spy. The queen finds Apron tactless, which keeps talking, and they walk down a corridor. He noticed a lady in waiting, and at that moment Sir Apron made a remark aloud, that she is a lady in waiting of Krista. Since she is unable to attend the library with a noisy knight, she decided to went back to her room. Rose asked her if she plans to increase the number of ladies in waiting. Sir Apron recommends his sister as a lady in waiting and urges her to invite her tomorrow. Apron leaves excited, while Rose warns Navier of potential problems of losing her dignity if she agreed to take Apron's sister as her lady-in-waiting, but she want to meet her tomorrow to judge if she fit the position. The Queen meets Masta's Violet, who appears to be a knight with a careless and rude aura. Rose identifies her as Apron, but Violet seems more careless. Masta's carries a large spear behind her light purple dress, but Masta's reveals that one must always keep their weapon close. Navier asked if she has been knighted, and Mastas nodded. She also asked what a lady-in-waiting do. Navier was surprised and suspicious of Apron motives of recommending his sister while she didn't know what are the responsibilities of a lady-in-waiting. Heinle questions who wants to be his wife lady-in-waiting. McKenna reveals that Sir Mastas is dedicated, being called Miss Mastas. Arpin and Mastas belong to the underground knights, formed by Heinle with his own people. Apron the leader and Mastas, 
the commander of the 2nd Division, which identity were are veiled so they can go with secret missions. Heinle is doubtful of Masters as Navier's lady-in-waiting as Masters is known for being rough with her hands. After spending a day with Masters, the queen was indecisive about her suitability as a lady-in-waiting. Despite her initial challenges, she was a disciplined and gentle person. After a mock high society argument, the queen decided against letting Masters be her lady-in-waiting. Rose advised Navier not to choose Masters and become a laughing stock due to ladies-in-waiting, especially in the current societal comparisons. The queen leave the detached palace alone, memorizing all paths and breathing the night air to calm down. She hears a fluttering sound and sees big birds flying. The bird reveals its face and feathers, confirming its queen. She observes the bird that went to the fountain, and suddenly it transforms into a man in a blink of an eye, transforming from a wet bird to a naked hindley, causing the queen to cover her mouth to prevent a scream. She was embarrassed to see Heinle's body, especially the strange part attached to his body, which she considered huge, that huge part. She was hinking that she should be mad at Heinle for deceiving her, but was too bewildered that she couldn't even feel angry. So Viesha learns that Navier is in the Western Kingdom and laughs at the news and feels betrayed by her sudden marriage to another country's king. So Vieshu, angered by Navier's actions, ordered Marky Carl to hastify his wedding to Rashta. He intended to have his wedding before Navier's hoping Navier would regret it when she saw his grandiose wedding. Rashta's fake parents attended her tea party. She was thinking to eliminate Rivetti, Alan, and the Viscount's annoyance before the baby when she heard a cry from her fake mother. The nobles, believing Rashta to be Marsha's real daughter, comfort her. Rashta, hesitantly hugged her fake mother and promises to find her sister. The fake mother asks if Rashta is truly going to find her sister, to which Rashta replies that she is. Rashta struggles to concentrate on a tea party after hearing the promise made to her fake mother, who bursts into tears. She takes a breather to calm her irritation. Rashta was relieved when the nobleman who mentioned her fake parent's lost daughter apologized to her and mentions Duke Elgi's name. Duke Elgi was angry on him, but Rashta felt relieved and trusted him completely. He also said that Duke Elgi seems to like Miss Rashta, but Rashta doesn't respond and blushed after hearing it. The nobleman suggests that it's easy for a charming beauty like Rashta to captivate any man's heart. After spending two hours in her room, Navier left to meet Heinle. Despite feeling embarrassed after thinking of Heinle's naked body, she won counted to 100 before arriving at Heinle's office. She met Krista, the former queen, and they entered without conversation, and Heinle's eyes widened as they entered together. Heinle asked why they were together, and after a brief explanation, Krista asked if Heinle is really the one that will prepare for wedding. Krista suggests to leave the preparation to her as she is best suited to handle the wedding on behalf of the two, as she is the sister-in-law and former queen. Heinle hesitates to confront Krista. That's why Navier intervened and answered first and asked Heinle to follow his original plan to prepare for the wedding. Krista apologizes and she looks helpless and disappointed, and leaves the office in silence. Navier feels bad after confronting Krista. Heinle, concerned about the queen's situation, asks her to tell her sister-in-law not to visit his office. Heinle asks for help with the queen's dress, but the queen's memory of his naked body in the fountain makes her face tense. She bows her head and Heinle asks if she is angry, but she needs to remain calm. The queen is ashamed, but she didn't want Heinle's deception to continue. That's why she opened her mouth and about to ask him. But what went out from her mouth is to invite Grand Duke Capman to their wedding. Heinle's expression changes when she asks him to invite Grand Duke Capman, causing him to become rigid. Navier reveals that she and Capman had became a trade partner in the past, but was ruined by a fight between Capman and His Majesty. Heinle leads the queen to his desk and asks her to sit in a chair. She pretend to be looking out the window because she was embarrassed on Heinle's position. She suggests they can finalize the trade between Rift and the Western Kingdom. Heinle believes that if the queen has worked on it, the success are high. Heinle asks Queen to look at her and not at the window. She explained that she doesn't, avoiding his gaze. The Queen and Heinle struggled to understand each other's words. She can't say that she was avoiding Heinle's lower body. He agreed to invite the Grand Duke, but parted ways without revealing their true intentions. Rose was surprised by her quick departure. Upon leaving the main palace, the Queen encounters Krista standing at a corner, defending her lady and waiting from a subordinate who insulted her. Krista firmly requests that the insults not occur again, demonstrating her dignified attitude. 
Despite their opposite positions, Navier admires Krista's caring and protective nature. However, she answered that Sir Apron is not her subordinate, but his majesty, and the request should be made directly to him. After encountering Krista, Navier think in a different perspective. Since Christu is a refined and regal woman, in which she already had many talented individuals by her side, she decided to ask Miss Mostas to be her lady-in-waiting, showing an adventurous spirit. McLennan requested the queen measurements, prompting her to stand up straight until they heard a knock on the door showing Heinley who want to join choosing dress for Navier. He entered the room and admired a couple of designs and accidentally bumped into the Navier's hip. The queen pushed him, and Heinle froze with an album. Heinle froze and mumbled that maybe she want to keep the dress a secret. He then left, leaving the room awkward. Heinle is upset with his wife, who seems angry with him. McKenna, who comes into his office, asks what caused her anger. Heinle believed that the reason of her anger may be because she found out about his identity as the bird queen. McKenna questions Heinle if Navier discovered Queen's identity, but Heinle is not sure. McKenna asks why he didn't tell her and persuade him to tell the truth with her. After Heinle left, Navier regrets her unintentional push, expressing shock and embarrassment from Heinle's perspective. She planned to apologize and ask Rose to bring her something to wear. However, Heinle arrives at her door. Despite being late at night, Heinle wore the same clothes as the day. He broke the silence and confessed something serious. The queen was nervous, but Heinle's response was different from expected. He declared himself queen, revealing his true identity. She was surprised when Heinle revealed his identity to her. He apologized, stating that in their tribe, revealing one's identity is only allowed to family. She tried to comfort him and apologize for pushing him earlier. However, Heinle turned into a bird. Heinle, who turned into a bird, looked cute and charming to Navier. The queen approached him hesitantly, and almost hugged him out of habit. She was worried if queen is Heinle's subordinate, but was not angry when she found out Heinle was queen. She withdrew her hands and said she was not angry, causing her face to heat up again. She repeat that she is not angry, and want him to return back to his original form, that where she can't see. But after half an hour he left. Rose and Miss Mostas noticed the queen leaving alone, and they were both puzzled. The queen explained that Heinle went out the window, and they found his clothes in her room. The queen was shocked, and wondered if Heinle didn't take his clothes with him. She is in an embarrassing situation, unsure how to respond to Rose's red neck. She tried to dissuade them by stating they were a married couple, but Mostas explains that anyone who sees his majesty naked is not married to him. Navier picks up Heinle's clothes smelling his perfume. She recalls Queen's said expression from her previous birthday celebration, where Heinle cried and flew away. She wonders if Heinle is crying again, feeling heavy with worry and sorry for his emotional state. She questions Miss Mostas about a misunderstanding with His Majesty, who misunderstood her as angry. She suggests that His Majesty was shocked and would be better off if she was honest. Navier is puzzled by this, as she thought Heinle was emotional but didn't show much emotion to other. She decides to be honest and go to see him, but Rose explains that she can see everything and suggests wrapping his clothes in a cloth. So Vyeshikaras is rashed his belly when someone knock on the door. Maid Delize informs him that Marky Carl is there, with an urgent meeting. So Vyeshu instructs him to wait in the living room, and Rashta asks if he's leaving. So Vyeshu tucks her in and leaves. Marky Carl presented a newsletter to the Emperor, who was shocked to learn that Navier heard that he had promised Rashta that he would divorce her. As dawn broke, the Queen leaves her palace to clear the misunderstanding with Heinle. Unexpectedly, she saw her brother, who met Heinle. Kasher hug her tightly and shares his heartbreaking story of Navier's divorce and how it didn't disappear just because he married Heinle. He explains that he avoided her because he feared causing trouble, and that Sovieshu would still have left her if he loved Rashta. Navier jokes about his brothers avoiding her, but still meets with Heinle. Kosher mentions his name in the night's expedition before the wedding. She appreciates the tradition and the potential for a boosted reputation of the knight who handles situations well. Heinle wanted her brother to join the knight's expedition to improve his reputation in the Western Kingdom. She hugged him tightly and he praised Heinle for his thoughtfulness, and asked Navier if she likes him. She agreed, because he didn't necessarily mean love. She saw Heinle standing, who hesitated to approach her because she avoided him earlier. Despite her embarrassment, she approached him, 
stating she wasn't avoiding because of anger. Heimli replied Navier to become honest with him, which shows his eyes with anxiety, and told that he can't sleep well if she keeps avoiding him. The queen confesses to Heinle that she saw him naked, but she can't look at him in the eyes due to the image in her mind. Heinle, dumbfounded, didn't understand Sink Navier's statement. He told to himself that she saw me and avoided looking at me. Unexpectedly, he fanned himself, causing his neck and ears to red. After a moment, fanning didn't seem to have any effect. Heinle asked where did she saw him naked. The queen replied that she had saw him at a fountain in an abandoned palace. She also added that he was soaked with water that time, causing another embarrassment to him. Navier is being embarrassed too, but can now talk to Heinle face to face, but Heinle remains silent. The atmosphere is strange, and she wonders if it would be better to hold hands in silence. Heinle touches the her fingertips and she hold his hand. Heinle asks if she had eaten yet, and they intertwine their fingers. An attendant enters, flinching at their intertwined hands. During an eating session, Navier and Heinle discuss their relationship, initially feeling awkward. Heinle asks if the image of him keeps popping up in her mind, which she said not anymore, which is a lie. Despite lying, Heinle persists and asks about his image, promises to show his body every day after their wedding. Navier coughs and cries after hearing what he said, and recognize her handkerchief. Heinle answered that she gave it to the bird which he is. She will argue, but Heinle's image pop up on her mind showing him with handkerchief tied around his neck. Navier is embarrassed by an embarrassing image and hands over the handkerchief to Heinle. Heinle smirks and offers to make Navier's imagination come true. So Viesha wrote a letter to Navier, expressing his intention to keep her on his side and believe the misunderstanding was the only barrier to their relationship. Marky Carl arrived, and he handed the letter to him, which was sealed with wax. Marky Carl was confused but Sovieshu explained that it was for Navier. He suggested secretly delivering it to Navier to avoid King Heinle's interference. Rashta starts a new hobby of entering the Empress's room to improve her mood. Rashta hopes that comparing herself to the former Empress will make her mood better on her wedding day. Rashta discovers a strange wooden box hidden in a chair, containing documents related to the deposed Empress. Rashto examines the documents carefully, which reveal that Empress Navier personally sponsored institutions like orphanages, nursing homes, and support facilities under the imperial family name. There was letter to Rashta, a former Empress left who expresses her inability to support institutions after her divorce due to sponsorship under the imperial family's name. Navier suggests she should continue with her money under the imperial family's name. Rashta felt bad after reading the letter. But remembering what Navier had done to her, she believed that Navier's actions led to her being driven out. Rashta angrily takes the promissory notes, letter, and documents, questioning if she should sponsor under her name to protect her reputation and gain trust, despite the imperial family's name being suggested. After several days together, the two seemed to get along better, and when Laura and Countess Jubal arrived, the place will become lively. She asked Miss Rose the most popular person in the Western Kingdom's high society, and she answered Duke Liberty and Miss Mullany. They were close relatives, and the Queen asked if it was possible to meet them both. Rose, ask if Navier wants to persuade Miss Mullany, who are not Christa's subordinates. The Queen answered that she want to get her on her side. However, Rose explained that Miss Mullany is ambitious and doesn't like to serve others, but the Queen answered it's okay. She was thinking about Duchess Tuania who is a friend of her, and she want to search for her, but she doesn't want to her face using a poster. An idea came up on her mind that she called a journalist. The journalist Janan is called to write an article about Navier's adjustment to the Western Kingdom. Janan is unsure of what to write, but agrees to include her old friend's names in the article. Navier mentions Duchess Tuania among her ladies in waiting that she misses and wanted to see. The Queen is confident that Duchess Tuania will recognize her interest and will fulfill her promise. If she does read the article and went to the palace, she may eventually dominate the high society of the Western Kingdom. In high society, she needed a socialite to approach them personally, which is close to her and role befits Nyan. Then, a knock at the door led to the Queen being asked by Heinle if she is lonely. Heinle is concerned about an article about the Queen being lonely but she informed Heinle that she had asked a journalist to publish it. She repeat that she is fine, but Heinle offers to spend the night with her as queen. Heinle reveals it's a joke, but she warns him about dressing him in bird form, 
but Heinle teasingly asks if they should dress together as a couple. Her ladies-in-waiting is surprised by Heinle's strange words, including spending the night by her side. Navier hurries Heinle into her room, ensuring there will know any rumors about him being a playboy and naked king to come up. The queen is in a dominant position and is embarrassed by Heinle's joking. Heinle is anxious about her interview and asks if she feels lonely when next to him. The queen reassures Heinle that she is fine and that she doesn't feel lonely here. Heinle is happy to hear that he is one of the reasons she is not lonely. Heinle's expression was strange, and he said that he want to confess something to her. The queen was embarrassed and thought he was trying to say he liked her. She didn't expect that his feelings is on another level. She only thought that his feelings is more like of a friendship. Heinle is surprised that she already knew about what he will confess, expressing sadness that she already expected it. Heinle announced that she would become the first empress of the Western Empire on their wedding day. The queen was initially confused, but later realized that Heinle intended to proclaim himself emperor. The queen is absorbed in a book when a journalist from the blue newspaper came and wants to interview her. She agrees to let him in, and Mondry questions the queen's reputation for love for the Eastern Empire. The journalist is worried about the potential conflict between the Eastern Empire and the Western Kingdom, and wonders what the queen would do in this situation. So Vieshu is restless and worried about the letter he sent to Navier, wondering if it has reached her. He is confident that everything will return to normal. However, he still has to go into the audience chamber, feeling troubled by the heavy atmosphere of requests for blessings for couples getting married. The last couple he sees is a married couple with a 14-year-old girl, who asks for his blessing. He suddenly remember the orphan girl that Navier cared for. So Vieshu calls Navier's aide and discuss an orphan she took care of. The aide answered that the orphan is still receiving patronage from Duke Troby. So Viesha requests to see the girl to ensure her well-being, and he will be the one to send patronage to her. So Viesha opposed leaving her in the magical academy, he wanted her to find a new future and even allow her to stay in the capital, so that when Navier come back, she will be happy to see her. Rashta is shocked by Sovieshu's order to bring a girl, possibly a mage, before their wedding. She believes Sovieshu will never cheat on her and worried about the possibility of Sovieshu changing his mind and making the other girl the empress. After Viscount Rotesha leaves, Delis, who overheard the conversation, reassures Rashta that the emperor will never cheat on her, but she become angry and questions her knowledge of Sovieshu more than her as his wife. Journalist Mondry asks which side will the queen choose if a conflict arise between the Eastern and Western, and she answered that she was in no position to choose a side since the queen's power was primarily responsible for internal affairs. Navier is excited to hear about Laura and Countess Jubal, her ladies-in-waiting from the Eastern Empire, arriving in the Western Kingdom. They share their deep affection and bond over years of togetherness. Upon arrival in the Western Kingdom, a series of positive events occurred, including a visit from Duchess Tuania, whom the she had hoped to bring from her interview. Duchess Tuania hugged the queen back with reddening eyes when she stretched her arms and hugged her, she preferred be called Nyan, her given name because she explained that she is tired with marriage. Nyan asked Navier what can she do for her, and the queen explained her circumstances with Krista, the former queen, and asked Nyan in conquering high society in the Western Kingdom. Heinle's aide arrives at the door to report unidentified knights stationed near the capital. He is puzzled by the pale appearance of the aide, who suggests finding out who they are and having them leave if they are considered dangerous. The aide, however, denies this, stating that they appear to be supranational knights. The Wall Alliance, comprising the Eastern Empire and Western Kingdom, managed the supranational knights, known as Shadow Knights, to preserve peace. They were known for preventing threats to peace. Heinle accelerated the decline of mages, and he was nervous about the supranational knights stationed outside the capital. McKenna report that the man leading them is Viscount Langdell, who he met at New Year's celebrations. Heinle is puzzled by Langdell's naive face and his appearance, which makes him question his role as a supranational knight. In a conference room, officials were surprised to see Viscount Langdell, commander of the 5th Division of the Shadow Knights, in broad daylight. Viscount Langdell responded by mentioning that the Queen saved his life in the past and asked Heinle to serve as Queen's personal knights until her guard is determined. Krista is bitter about a supranational knight commander serving Navier. She decides to send a flower basket to Navier, but her ladies-in-waiting dislike Navier and her subordinate. 
Krista explains that her friendliness to the current queen is important and that the commander came to support her. She believes that fighting is unnecessary as long as Navier doesn't do anything wrong. Queen Navier unexpectedly encountered Viscount Langdell, who greeted her with a twitchy, bowed knee. He offered to repay her kindness, and the queen accepted the offer. Viscount Langdell's proposal to allow them to be her personal knights exceeded her expectations. The queen meets a visitor from the Eastern Empire, who is not a friend. Laura and Countess Jubal's faces freeze as the visitor smiles bitterly. Navier assumes he has come for another purpose, and the visitor presents a letter. She receives a letter from Sovieshu that explains his plan to divorce her for a year and reinstate her again as empress after making his child to rash the legitimate. The queen is uncomfortable with his decision and feels that she cannot love a child who doesn't came from her and didn't want that child to bear hatred to her while she is the empress. She decides not to reply to the letter and tells Sovieshu's envoy to leave the Western Kingdom. Navier feels a sense of being in the Western Kingdom and the Eastern Empire simultaneously until she saw Heinle, who appears at the window and explains that he came to talk. The queen asks Heinle if he heard about an envoy from his majesty the emperor, but Heinle replies that he is worried that it would affect her. She added that she receives a letter from Sovieshu and Heinle become anxious. Navier told him that she didn't write a reply to the letter and reassures him that she is now his wife and he didn't need to worry. Heinle expresses relief and finds Heinle cute and lovely. Grand Duke Kapman is searching for a country to establish a trade alliance with while trying to counteract the effects of a love potion on his body. He visits his magical academy professor, who initially reprimands his students for selling a love potion on the black market. Despite his initial resentment, Kapman admits to drinking the potion shortly after New Year's celebrations, revealing that it hasn't been long. Kapman explained that he believes his symptoms will improve without seeing Navier but soon realizes he made a mistake. He feels better every time he sees her, but the thought of never seeing her causes deep pain. He has dozens of portraits of Navier, but his burning thirst remains unabated to the point he wants to visit Navier and asks her to make him her lover. The professor identifies three possible causes for the potion's effectiveness on the Grand Duke. The first is the potion's self-made effectiveness, which is particularly effective on the Grand Duke. The second is the unstable mana balance, possibly influenced by the potion. The professor suspects a more complex cause. The third cause is he may have feelings for that person before he drank the potion. Their conversation is interrupted by a Western Kingdom man who arrives to see Grand Duke Kapman. Upon entering his office, Sovieshu questioned the envoy about Navier's reply to his letter. The emperor was expecting a reply from Navier, but the envoy revealed that she sent no reply. Sovieshu was puzzled and couldn't understand the envoy's report. The envoy mentioned Viscount Langdell, who was the commander of the 5th Division of the Supernational Knights, and Duchess Tuania, who were in the Western Kingdom. Navier's attitude towards him caused him hurt and anger, leading him to question if she thinks the letter he sent is a lie or if he made it up. After learning Duchess Tuania was together with Viscount Langdell, Duke Tuania expressed his desire to the Emperor for his wife's return, causing Sovieshu's anger. Sovieshu shouted at Duke Tuania, accusing him of not believing in his wife and getting divorced. Duke Tuania reveals that Rashta is the one who indirectly said that Jir wife was having an affair, describing her appearance, which Duke Tuania knew was his wife's. Sovieshu is distressed by this revelation and realizes that Rashta has a naive and calculating side, which is necessary for survival in high society. But he doesn't want to hear about this side of Rashta. Sovieshu, angered by Navier's sudden departure, plans to make her regret not believing in his sincerity. He demands to rush his wedding before Navier's wedding and sends an invitation to the king of the Western Kingdom to attend. Despite doubts, Sovieshu confirms that they will attend his wedding to see the Duke and Duchess Troby. Navier received a flower basket from Krista's ladies in waiting as a surprise. She told her that Navier had received personal knights and asked her to hand the basket to her as congratulations. Countess Jubal asked if they should throw the basket away, but Rose agreed to keep it on the undecorated table. The Queen asks Rose to send a bouquet of acacia flowers to Krista in return, her ladies-in-waiting, if she really needs to give flowers, but she believes a false friendship is better than conflict. The Queen is surprised by Heinle's behavior and decides to open the window for him. Heinle apologizes and allows him to enter through the window. He informs her of good and bad news. He announces that the good news is that their wedding date was confirmed, 
While the bad news is that the Emperor of the Eastern Empire has invited them to attend his wedding, Heinle asked Navier if will attend, and she replied that she will attend the wedding to see her loved ones. Heinle agrees to accompany her. Heinle questions when will Navier accept him as her husband, causing confusion. She doubts if he wants her to give him love. Heinle told her to answer him later. A well-dressed man, the head butler of the Amaras family, arrives at the residence on behalf of Miss Mullany, a subordinate of the Marquis. The butler informs the queen that she will be delighted to meet, and requests a meeting with her tomorrow. Mullany arrived half an hour early. She greeted the queen politely, expressing her gratitude for meeting her and her eagerness to meet her. Instead of beating around the bush, the queen asked her directly if she was waiting for her to call her, as she wanted something from her. Miss Mullany answered that she will help her integrate into the high society of the Western Kingdom. In return, she demands to drive Krista out of the royal palace. Mullany recounts a fight with Krista which led to negative words from His Majesty Heinle. She claims that nobles following Krista have intimidated her and her friends. Mullany believes that once Krista leaves the royal palace, the group will disperse. After Mullany left, Navier asked the relationship between Mullany and Krista. Rose explained that the rumor of an argument led to a split in high society. She mentioned that Miss Mullany, the only child of Marquis Amaras, wanted to succeed the title of her father. She was also aware that her adopted brother, Duke Liberty's third child, was on Krista's side, the one that her father adopted to succeed his position. Laura asks about Navier's decision, but she remains silent. She considered joining Mullany to bring high society closer to her, but she become hostile towards Krista. She temporarily consider a false friendship as a solution. The Queen contemplates the Eastern Empire and her mixed feelings. She aspires to show her parents how well she is living while also wishing Soviesha would be surprised to see her and show how she's fine without him in her life. Heinle approached the queen and asked to ride in the carriage with her. The queen's ladies-in-waiting quickly left and headed for another carriage. Navier asked Heinle to transform into queen saying that she want to hug his bird form. Heinle transform immediately. Navier notices their carriage tilted and hears Unum's voice outside. The queen instructs Heinle to return to his human form. Navier is startled by a jolt in the carriage and is pressed to the floor by naked Heinle, who has lost balance while dressing. He apologizes and admits it was not intentional. Heinle tells her not to move, explaining that their position is very stimulating. Heinle flinches, and the narrator makes eye contact with him. He puts on clothes but doesn't open his eyes. When the door opens, Heinle's clothes are wrinkled and his neck is flushed. Navier notices lipstick marks on his neck and closes the door. Before visiting the Imperial Palace of the Eastern Empire, they first gathered at Troby Mansion. She was reunited with her family. Navier stare at Sovieshu, who appears unperturbed and sad. Sovieshu, who opens his mouth and expresses gratitude for the gesture of friendship from the Western Kingdom. On the day before the wedding, they go for a walk with Heinle, who recalls a time when Navier was the empress who tries to feed queen insects. They both reminiscing their funny moments and recalls their past encounter until Soviesha showed himself. She greeted him with a smile, but Soviesha remains motionless and asks Heinle to have a moment alone with Navier. Heinle refuses to leave his wife with an angry man, causing Soviesha to become rigid. Heinle clarifies that Navier is his wife, which drew a clear line between Navier and Soviesha as they were strangers. Now, Sovieshu directly look at Navier and ask to speak with her. While Navier is curious about Sovieshu's message to her, she decides to stay with her husband, Heinle. His reaction was even stranger, as if he was hurt that I was the one cheating. Sovieshu looked at me with a stunned face, then looked fiercely at Heinle, turned, and left. The queen asked Heinle if he was okay, to which Heinle nodded and then leaned on her shoulder. When the wedding day arrived, she was surprised by the impressive pillars with magic engraved on the decorations of Sovieshu Wedding Hall, and doubt Sovieshu's motives for making rash to the Empress for only one year, and she was relieved she did not reply his letter. The High Priest arrives at the Wedding Hall, appearing tired and disgusted from his visits to the Eastern Empire. Sovieshu appeared dashing, while Rashta, who walked next to Sovieshu and her dress was revealed, looked more like a Christmas tree, and the arrogant nobles mocked her dress. On her most important day, she appeared in a ridiculous dress, but she had a satisfied face and a confident smile, showing as if she had won. Rashta and Sovieshu sign a marriage certificate, 
Marking the birth of a new emperor couple in the Eastern Empire, the couple appears happy, but Navier was hoping they are unhappy. The emperor and empress were supposed to ride a wedding parade in the capital, so Viesha stopped her and asked to change her clothes because she looks ridiculous, but Rashta grumbled and was ordered to at least remove her accessories. Navier and Heinle enter a parade carriage, facing the stairs of the Eastern Empire people. As they pass through the streets, they hear a loud cheer for Rashta however, the cheering turns to near deathly silence as they pass. Navier tries to hide her embarrassment by keeping her chin up and trying to remain composed, while Heinle grips her hand tighter. Many of her friends ignore her, but since the Troby family's influence in the Eastern Empire is great, there are still many nobles who mingle with her. After the dance of groom and bride, Heinle asks her for a dance. Despite the tense atmosphere and Sovieshi's gaze, she pretends not to notice. Duke LG unexpectedly asks her to dance. Despite feeling awkward, she agrees and asks what he wants to say, but Duke LG remains unresponsive. She was asked to dance with Sovieshu. She was initially reluctant, but later on agree since it is rude to decline. The groom, Sovieshu asks about her reply to his letter. She answered that she has nothing to say to him, but Sovieshu state that he don't want to lose her, while Navier reminded him that today is his wedding. Navier questions Sovieshu about the possibility of making her empress again in a year, questioning if it will be extended if he has a second child with Rashta. Unsure of the future, she expresses her dissatisfaction with raising a child of him with Rashta and the potential rejection she might face from his children while she was thrown away. After speaking, Navier looked at Sovieshu, surprised by his pale complexion and slightly open mouth. She bowed politely, turned, and walked away, already tired from their brief conversation. Navier hears voices of surprise and admiration from a distance, and notices a crowd gathered in a certain area. Rose tells her about Rashta, who will donate 20 million cranes to institutions in need of help. She is shocked and tries to contain her laughter. She advises Rashta not to use the promissory notes under her name, as it could raise her reputation or cause her problems. After returning to her room, she contemplates about Rashta's using the money she gave with her own name and unsure if she should provide a detailed explanation. She initially thought she would understand, but after Rashta's behavior, she questioned the necessity of explaining the situation and only provide the necessary information. The next day, Navier sees Rashta at the masquerade ball. Concerned about her past behavior of accusing her brother of hurting her, she decided to talk to her in public to prevent her from lying again. She patiently wait for the opportunity and proposed dancing with Rashta the Empress. It was strange to everyone that I suddenly asked Rashta to dance, I silently pointed with my other hand to the dancing stage. Rashta looked confused, but got up and followed me, perhaps to prevent me from saying something awkward out loud. Rashta was confused and asks if Navier wants to show that she is not a good dancer. Rashta's unique imagination is not praised, and Navier told her to make it look like she's a good dancer. Navier directly suggests that if she finds herself in trouble with Baron Lant, she should ask Marky Carl for help. Rashta is confused and unsure of the reasoning behind this. She also advises against excluding those who solely seek power and profit because some of them are talented. She advised keeping an eye on their aides and lastly, she suggests Rashta to avoid those who choose her outfits. Navier clarify that she is giving her advice not for Rashta's sake, but for her home country. She asked Rashta to if she already given the promissory notes to anyone else and to get it back. She suggests that if she can't, she must fund institutions with her own money. Rashta collapsed and screamed, claiming her belly hurt. So Vieshu, astonished, rushed over and sat with her, but he kept staring at Navier's face. Heinle approaches Navier suggests Sovieshu to take Rashta to the palace doctor. Rashta writhes in pain and her belly aches. Sovieshu leaves with Rashta while carrying her. Navier, remember how Rashta accused her brother on hurting her. That's why she chose to talk to her in public. Avoid her getting blamed. Sovieshu walked towards Rashta, who claims Navier blackmailed her, causing her fear. But Sovieshu asked her what could Navier blackmail her with. Rashta, having experienced blackmail from Viscount Roteshu, hesitated to discuss her promissory notes with Sovieshu. She covered herself with sheets, causing tears. Sovieshu believed Navier was not someone who exploited others' weaknesses to blackmail them. Navier is walking and is about to say goodbye to Eastern Empire completely until she encountered Duke LG, who is holding a necklace with a bit of magic. Despite not expecting to see him, 
She asks him about the necklace and he reveals it to be a magical item. Duke LG asked if she felt sad. Navier was curious why he had a somber expression. She asked him if he likes Empress Rashta, but Duke LG laughed at what she said. Instead of answering, he repeat his question if she feels sad due to the parade incident. She answered that it was inevitable. But Duke LG explains that people only remember the last thing, forgetting everything else what you did good to them. She just stares at Duke LG, who seems to recall bad memories of a past event. He claims that she is very understanding that if it's him, he will be angry. He smiles, expressing sympathy in a mocking tone, but appears distressed. As Navier was about to knock on Heinle's door, she heard her name shout by Sovieshu. As she saw him, she remembers Rashta covering her belly. She denies any involvement in Empress Rashta's collapse, but Sovieshu's expression shows he had been slapped and told her that he didn't believe Rashta. Then Navier asked what brings him, and Sovieshu pointed to her room to talk it inside, but she insists on telling it out. He desperately asked Navier to come back to him and added he doesn't want her to be someone else's wife. Heinle froze, hearing a voice from the other side of the door, his heart pounding. He wonders what this means. Heinle, sitting on his windowsill, stares at the sky and a stack of papers on his desk. The day of the last wedding reception replays in his mind, causing him to feel insane. He wonders what the queen would have responded to Sovieshu's nonsense. Heinle feels anxious about Navier's answer but he suspects she rejected him due to Sovieshu annoyance. He wonders if Queen's feelings for Sovieshu were love-hate and if she wanted to give him another chance. Heinle immediately went to Navier after hearing she have something for him. Heinle asks about a gift, seemingly eager to receive it. Navier chuckles at his expectation-filled attitude and reveals a wrapped gift box from a desk drawer, which she presents to him, revealing a lesson, depressed appearance. Heinle was curious about the gift she handed him, which revealed a yellow cloth she had knitted for a queen. The gift was a surprise for him, as she had promised to dress him in queen form if he appeared in front of her again. Navier proposes to Heinle that if he becomes queen, she will dress him. Heinle is startled and transform immediately. She pats her lap and queen emerges, dressed in knitted clothes. She sings to him, causing his eyes to narrow and eventually close. Rose informs Navier that it is about to start, and the sound of horns are heard in the distance. Loud cheers from the knights are heard. The knights eventually appear on horseback in rows of three. Mostas informed her that the most popular knights were in the front row, followed by the next three. Navier felt awkward, but was proud. The knights stopped and dismounted, including her brother, who smiled and looked at him silently. She thought they would all go together to lay out the handkerchiefs or in line. However, as her brother continued to move forward, no one else moved. She thought, if she have to be the first to place it, and Heinle winked at her and nodded. After nodding slightly towards Sir April, she placed the handkerchief in the breast pocket of her brother's ceremonial suit as if it were an accessory. Rose brought a stack of letters from different families, revealing that the young ladies at the welcoming ceremony may have fallen in love with Sir Kosher. Rose believes Sir Kosher is beautiful and wonderful, and the queen's only sibling. Capman hesitantly asks an official where to go to the Hall of Stars. The hall, filled with jewels and stars, was a symbol of the country's wealth. A red carpet stretched across the floor, with officials and King Heinle standing on either side. Capman greets King Heinle on his coronation, expressing his gratitude. They stare without speaking, reminiscing about their last encounter. Capman had struck Emperor Sovieshu, but the confrontation began with Heinle, a prince at the time. Capman notices King Heinle thinking about the same event as he is. He asks Capman to hear his congratulations on the wedding, which causes him to feel awkward and calm. He then opens his mouth to express his congratulations. Capman added that it will be like a dream to see Navier wearing a wedding dress, but Heinle was offended by his statement and shouted at him. Heinle, frowning, confronts Capman, who reassures him to forget his words. He regrets his previous confrontation with Emperor Sovieshu that result on the trade that doesn't materialize, and he can't repeat the same mistake. Heinle, feeling offended, but repeatedly speak to himself to restrain himself, and that he is not like Emperor Sovieshu, who is driven by his feelings because of jealousy. Sovieshu, reading an invitation from Heinle for their wedding in the West Kingdom, questioned if Heinle was in his right mind. He crushed a lavishly decorated letter, which reveals that it was not written by Navier. Marquis Carl, 
surprised by how Soviet should crush the letter sent by neighboring country's rulers. Despite its attempts to stop him, Karl remained silent and allowed Soviet to step on the letter. Soviet sees Heinle's letter and remembers Navier holding his hand. He hears a cold voice repeatedly saying the word no, making his head ache. Marky Karl inquires about the Empress's donation. He mentions Rashta's promise to donate 20 million krangs, which he confirms will be done through imperial promissory notes. So Viesha confirms from Baron Lant that these notes were left by Navier. Marky Karl is shocked that Rashta's used Queen Navier's money. So Viesha assures him that it's already done and will improve Rashta's image. Marky Karl worries about So Viesha's future regret and whether his actions will lead to greater regret. Rashta, a proud empress, lived in the Western Palace, a luxurious space for her child's birth and eventual throne. She climbed the steep terrain on her own, unlike those born into wealthy families who followed a set path. As the empress, she considered this her victory and the happy ending of her reign. She doesn't like being called the empress of the commoners since they don't have any contribution on what she achieved. Her immense power is evident during a wedding reception, where everyone loves Rashta. However, her only lady-in-waiting, Viscountess Verdi, had no expression of joy, so she asks her if she is unhappy that she is now the Empress. Viscountess Verdi confesses to Rashta about the supposed gifts from the nobles in the drawing room as empty, which caused Rashta to panic. She didn't want to believe it since during wedding receptions, everyone praised her, regardless of age or gender. In the end, she believed that Navier did spread bad rumors about her. She decided to attend Navier's wedding and do the same. Rashta discovers a small gift on soft rugs and promises sincere friendship to the sender. Upon opening the gift, she finds a ring with a large jewel and Duke Elgie's name inside. Navier decided to visit Krista, who was surprised to see her. She asked her the acacia flowers she sent her about her. Krista was surprised, but quickly prepared a table with jasmine tea and snacks. She asks Krista about the blooming of the acacia flowers. She responds that they are alive and that it's necessary to take care of them. In high society, acacia flower means friendship. Navier also added she doesn't want a necessary psychological warfare. Krista agreed to her, but she expressed hope for comfort in their current relationship. Navier agreed with her suggestion, expressing satisfaction with her decision. On the way to the detached palace, Rose asked about the outcome but Navier responded negatively. Krista seemed to accept reconciliation, but the real problem was her desire to maintain the current distance between them. Navier couldn't trust Krista's words and remained isolated from high society. She ordered Rose to send Miss Mullany a Caridalis and Gelgia flowers, secretly, hoping Mullany would understand its meaning. Navier greets Grand Duke Capman, pretending calm, and asks how he's been. Capman appears embarrassed, and she notices that despite his previous attempt to neutralize the potion's effects, his effectiveness remains unchanged. But when Grand Duke Capman finally turned and walked away without a word, Rose and Mostas snorted angrily. Rose and Mostas are surprised to learn about Grand Duke Capman of Rift, a top magical academy graduate, but still they find him rude, but Navier assures them that he's a shy man and returns to the detached palace. A lady-in-waiting observes a strange atmosphere between Grand Duke Capman and Queen Navier. The lady-in-waiting suggests that Krista should take advantage of this opportunity to get Grand Duke Capman on their side, as he harbored a strong hatred for Navier. A grand table in the garden was set with extravagant dishes, which Rashta prepared the food for the nobles. She invited the nobles to sit and announce that everything has stabilized, and she aimed to establish friendships and maintain good relations to prevent infighting among the nobles. Rashta is praised by nobles, which she plans to show them who owns the Western Palace and who will carry the next emperor. They ask the name of her baby, and she answered that the emperor will name the baby. But Rashta is disturbed by the image of a newborn baby, which Viscount Roteshu claimed died just after birth. Viscountess Verdi, call Rashta, and she came back to her senses, but a malicious laugh from the table silences the environment. She look at Marquis Ferang, who she invited to see the new master of the Empress's palace, but regretted her decision. He found it ironic that the person who declared herself the Empress of the Commoners was now trying to get close to the nobles. Rashta clenched her fists, biting her lips hard. After a tea party, Rashta questioned Duke Elgi about Marky Ferang's sarcastic remarks about her interviews. She questioned if Elgi had intentionally given her the wrong answers. 
Duke LG maintains a nonchalant attitude and explains that the best choice for the Empress was the commoners, as she couldn't choose everyone, and everyone's reaction was not favorable. Duke LG explains that the commoners' reaction to Empress Navier and Rashta was influenced by choosing the commoners as the majority of citizen. He assures her that the nobility will change their minds after birthing the baby. Rashta apologizes for her previous sensitivity and anger towards Duke LG. She feels a sense of detachment from him, as if there's a wall between them. He admits that he can't address her like that anymore, and it's time to keep a distance since she is now the Empress. Rashta, who trusted Duke LG, was surprised when he distanced himself. She pleaded with him, claiming she had no one else to trust. Duke LG asked if she trusts Sovieshu. Rashta answered that she loved him, but she didn't trust him. Duke LG questions if Rashta trusts him more than his majesty, and she nodded. She asks to call her by her name. Rashta wants to manage the Imperial Palace's budget independently. Baron Lant, who was previously in charge of managing the money, explains that the Emperor's approval is needed. Baron Lant explains that the Emperor has the final say. Baron Lant remarked that managing money is a major headache and may not be enjoyable for her, but she insists that she has to know if it's too much or not for her. Navier woke up to a beautiful day, while Laura mentioned Miss Mullany sent a flower pot, showing that she accepted her offer to become her secret ally, expressing trust in the situation. Laura also added that Nyan entered the high society of the Western Kingdom forcefully, leveraging rumors about her from the Eastern Empire to gain attention and attend parties with the rumored Viscount Langdell and young nobles of the Western Kingdom. Navier is unsure if Sovieshu will attend their wedding, and wonders if he intended for her to become the first empress to remarry twice after he asked her to come back. Navier stopped at a sunny spot near a detached palace to eat and hang out. Grand Duke Capman arrived first, wearing a locket, and greeted them with a smile. They met again because Capman was staying at the Queen's Palace temporarily until the wedding day. Despite his rationality being tinged by the potion effects, he enjoyed seeing her. She drops a basket causing Grand Duke Capman to be puzzled. Navier asks for more food, and the ladies-in-waiting leave. Navier asks Capman if he hasn't counteracted the effects of the potion, but Capman admits he can't. Grand Duke Capman asked if it was Navier or Heinley who invited him. She replied that she invited him to make it happen the trade with Rift that was not possible in the Eastern Empire. Grand Duke Capman reveals that he figured as much, that she is the one who invited him. Grand Duke Capman mutters, causing the potion's effects to intensify. Navier is concerned, but hesitates to touch him as he told her it would destroy him. Navier questions Grand Duke Capman about the possibility of a potion that could last for years. She also asks how it affected him when he was away from her, unsure if the effects decreased during her absence. He answered no. The wind causes hair to flap and Capman brushes it off. Navier is uncomfortable with the awkward atmosphere and asks if assigning someone to handle trade-related matters would make conversations difficult. Navier suggests drinking a potion and looking at someone else. He chuckles at the idea and questions if it would worsen the situation if he falls in love with two people simultaneously. Capman returns to his room, where a nobility-looking woman greets him personally, inviting him to meet Lady Krista. Rashta asks Krista if she can remarry. Krista was surprised with the sudden question. Rashta shares the story of Navier, who remarried Heinle after her divorce with Sovieshu. Krista refuses to discuss her remarriage, but Rashta questions why she can't remarry. Krista admits she can't marry the only man she wants because he doesn't feel the same way about her. Before the wedding, Heinle and Navier rehearse the ceremony in the ceremonial hall. Navier asked about his conversation with Sovieshu. Heinle retorted that he chose the right words to make Sovieshu lose his temper. Heinle expressed his love for Navier. However, Navier sternly addressing Heinle, advised him not to fight the emperor of a country with similar power. Heinle's rigid expression changed, and she had to remind him that he must also care for the Western Kingdom. Heinle tried to divert the conversation. By confessing he had experience, Navier was left speechless. Heinle then whispered, You must lead him on the wedding night. She was shocked and unsure if he was asking her to take the initiative. Heinle questions if the queen will return to Sovieshu if she finds out he's trash. McKenna, a loyal subordinate, offers comforting words and suggests trash can be recycled and he did it for his country. The day of the wedding day, the queen enters the event hall, accompanied by Heinle, who smiles brightly before heading towards the high priest. 
The high priest asked Heinle and Navier Eli Troby to walk together as husband and wife, following the procedure of a traditional wedding line. The high priest's smile faded as Heinle asked for a moment. The groom's silence and not answering the high priest's question sparked murmurs among guests. Navier quietly waited, but stopped after seeing Rashta's smile. Heinle remained calm despite the crowd. Heinle announced that the Western Kingdom would become the Western Empire, and he would reign as the first emperor of the Western Empire. The distinguished guests were surprised and applauded. So Vyeshu's complexion became pale, and he seemed indifferent, while Rashta's expression seemed to have taken the crown from her head. Heinle ails Laszlo, emperor of the Western Empire, accepts Empress Navier Eli Trobi as his wife. The high priest frowns and asks if Navier agrees to marry him. The high priest changed the marriage certificate, and they sign again. The ceremony ends with cheers and the reception begins, with Heinle and Navier dancing together. Grand Duke Capman is nowhere to be found in the crowd, while Heinle was jealous and asked her to look only on him, as they were belong to each other. After taking their seat, Heinle offers to feed her, but she refuses to be feed in front of everyone. The Empress is dreading the wedding night, fearing she will take the lead in a relationship with her inexperienced husband, Heinle. She is in trouble and cannot stand idly by. Later, she enters the Queen's room, now known as the Empress's room, which was decorated in gold, reflecting Heinle's intimate relationship with the Queen and the palace's design. Navier hears my queen and sees Heinle standing next to the door connecting their room to the bedroom. Heinle is wearing the same robe as her, but is wearing a loosely tied belt. He gently wraps his arms around her, kissing her on the ear, cheek, and whispering, teach me quickly. The empress approached him, feeling calmer and standing between his legs. Heinle's damp hair made him look more attractive. She stroked his hair and gently kissed his forehead. Heinle flinched upon touching his naked body but lay back without protest. Heinle asked if he didn't mind her being rough, and he untied his robe belt, exposing his upper body. She caresses Heinle's upper body, noticing his bold hand movements. She firmly holds his hands near his face, reminding him that he asked her she was to take the lead. She kisses him on the cheeks and removes his pants, revealing that he was already prepared. So Vyeshu hates the Western Kingdom becoming an empire, Heinle dancing together, and sticking to Navier. The pain suppresses his anger. He feel a surge of blood in his head. The blood comes from his nose, and he wonders if Navier felt the same way when he brought Rashta. He believes she didn't show any interest in him. So Vyeshu sees Navier and called her Navier several times, but become bewildered by the disappearance of Navier wakes up to find Marky Carl, who is surprised to find him drunk. He asks for sobering medicine. Rashta, who had come to get Sovieshu to sing a lullaby, stood in the corridor, stunned, before hastily turning around and running away. Rashta is overwhelmed by the sudden revelation of Sovieshu's behavior, which she believes is a reflection of his feelings. She is unsure of the truth and is deeply afraid of Sovieshu's actions. Upon waking up, Navier wakes up feeling light and jokingly reminiscing about a past night with Heinle. She reveals that she didn't remember the details, but was able to recall the time they spent together. She hugged Heinle tightly and hid her face. Heinle's soft kisses down her skin were wonderful. However, it's morning, and they cannot stay in bed for much longer. The Empress admires his handsome face and kisses his lips and nose. She unconsciously utters a few words, hoping this time she can have a baby. Navier expressing her desire for a child for the imperial family's stability and the potential for a throne takeover if the line of succession was awry. Heinle expresses his desire for a baby that resembles her. Navier is amazed by Heinle's revelation that the king of the Western Kingdom has been a mage for generations, and his wife also becomes a mage through the bed made of monostone. Heinle added that the method of making normal people a mage is embarrassing. When a mage and mana stone are connected, allowing mana to circulate between them. If the mage doesn't accept the mana, it flows back into the ordinary person's body, accumulating in their body. She wonders if Krista is a mage and if Heinle's brother died early due to weakness. Heinle explains that there are drawbacks and Krista is one of the exception, and assures her there will no issues to them. Navier observes Sovieshu in a corner, drinking wine with a pale complexion, and wonders why his subordinates haven't taken him away yet. While Rashta, sitting near the piano, surrounded by men, while laughing happily. Just then, Grand Duke Capman approached and asked Heinle to speak alone. 
Rashta congratulates Navier on her marriage while calling her sister. Rashta asked her if she can now be considered sister as she is not a concubine anymore. Navier hears murmurs and the eyes of those present, imagining a confrontation between the ex-wife and the current wife. Rashta blushes after getting attention from the crowd, but Navier replied her that she can be the sister of Sovieshu's next concubine, as they would have the same husband. Navier doesn't want to play along and says that it's their empire business. The blush on Rashta's face disappears. Rashta raised her eyebrows, angry at Navier's response, but Rashta crossed the line and said that Navier is infertile, so she don't need to worry about anything else. However, Kasher interrupted by saying to Rashta that she seemed like an experienced person, Rashta finches and asks about the meaning of a phrase she heard, but her brother explains that the phrase is not meant to imply she had a hidden child. Rashta reacted and just smile and say that he is rude. But Kasher was questioning the thorns in her words and questioning the meaning behind someone else's infertile comments. Rashta is nervous, but Kasher revealed that she had an important document with her name and left it at the Eastern Empire. Rashta become anxious and Navier thought the document her brother is talking about is the slave certificate. Kapman want to discuss the trade between Rift and apologizes in taking Heinle's time and offers champagne to Heinle. He hopes the trade will be a priority. Heinle was puzzled by Kapman's strange behavior, exchanges the glass and drinks it. Heinle, unsure if he's overreacting, drank the champagne, relieved. Kapman then leaves, but Heinle is confused. Heinle, surprised by the sudden appearance of his sister-in-law, is deeply drawn to her. This scene was seen by the ladies of the Western Empire, who came out of the banquet hall to get some fresh air. The ladies looked at each other, and quickly left the area. Kapman decides to suppress the potion's effects by taking Navier's suggestion on taking the potion again. He hears a cry from Rashta, who is sobbing. Kapman, surprised by Rashta's tears, takes off his coat due to the potion's effects. He tells her not to cry and told her that crying will make him sad. Kapman, aware of Rashta's malicious thoughts and her beautiful voice, is concerned about her frail appearance due to the potion's effects. Despite knowing she lies, he cannot help but notice her smile as she holds the coat he gave her. Kapman, feeling overwhelmed by the potion, decides to leave. However, he hears Sovieshu's thoughts, revealing that she won't hold the Empress position for long. Kapman looks at Sovieshu on an upstairs balcony. Rashta stood up in surprise to see Sovieshu. She tried to excuse herself, but Sovieshu left the balcony without a word. Navier meets Grand Duke Kapman in the garden, they discuss trade, and Rashta greets them. Despite initial reluctance, Navier responds calmly, and Grand Duke Kapman reciprocates. Rashta asks Grand Duke Kapman about his return from last night, but he answered wants his coat back. Rashta leaves while Grand Duke Kapman replies to Navier that nothing happened between them. Kapman, feeling better, noticed that the potion's effects were still working towards Navier. He wondered if it was the same for Heinle. Heinle admits to Krista that he was drunk. He apologizes for being drunk and asks Krista coldly to be unconcerned about him and call someone to take care of him. Krista looked at him with trembling eyes and left as if she were running away. Kapman realized that the love potion's effects on Heinle had also worn off within a day. The hypothesis that his teacher mentioned to him was ringing in his ears. He said Kapman was in love with her before he drank the potion, so it proved to be more effective. A thought come to his mind, was I always in love with Empress Navier? Rashta is upset by Grand Duke Kapman's change in attitude, despite being in love with her the previous day. She believes that Navier, who has previously seduced Prince Heinle and Sovieshu, is now after Kapman. Rashta believes that Navier hates that the Grand Duke fell in love with her and is trying to seduce him again. Rashta had finished her pondering, but before she could visit Sovieshu, Sovieshu came forward, calling her first. Rashta was ordered by Sovieshu to watch her actions, which she found to be a form of jealousy. Sovieshu questioned her qualifications and asked if she should make sure her deficiencies aren't noticed. He also added that she was a distinguished guest at a national wedding and mentioned Navier's infertility in front of everyone. Sovieshu argued that such remarks shouldn't be made to newlywed couples and could potentially escalate into a diplomatic conflict. Navier, who loved the Eastern Empire, would not allow this incident to go that far. Sovieshu was convinced of that by her nature. Rashta told Sovieshu about the deposed Empress's threat against her and her brother, Kasher. Rashta chose to focus on the slave trade certificate, 
so Vieshu is surprised to learn about the disappearance of the slave trade certificate, which had been in Viscount Roteshu's hands. He is finding it in the Imperial Palace, but cannot find it. Kosher's threat led to Rash to questioning if her slave trade certificate was lost. She questioned why Sovieshu didn't inform Rashtu about the situation, causing her to scream in distress. Heinle arrives at lunchtime and apologizes for being busy with work. He explains that Grand Duke Capman poured something strange in his drink, which he believes was an excuse for the incident. Navier asks if it is the reason he was locked in room for a day. She thinks that Grand Duke Capman poured a love potion into Heinle's drink. Heinle later revealed that what he drank is not a poison but an enchantment indicating the potion was the love potion. Heinle's nervousness suggests he may have reacted to someone. The potion's effects, as stated by Grand Duke Capman, last a week. Navier is worried about the possibility of Heinle marrying someone and leave her. Heinle explained that the potion's effects were off at dawn, but he is still nervous due to his eyes wandering to someone else after getting married. The potion's effects made Capman fall in love with the Navier and she doesn't want to see him suffer. Heinle apologizes to Navier, expressing his love for her but expressing regret for being carried away by a potion, stating that he didn't intend to hurt her and didn't want to be like her ex-husband. She is confused by Heinle's feeling for her. Heinle asks if she likes him, but she is still confused whether she is the first one Heinle saw after drinking the potion, so she tell Heinle it's not possible that he love her. But Heinle told her that the effect of the potion already wear off at dawn. Heinle assure her it's not due to the potion, Navier calms him down and didn't leave him, fearing he might misunderstand that she's mad at him. After Heinle settled down, Navier visited Grand Duke Capman. Rashta's strange behavior towards him may be related to the potion. Navier expresses disappointment while Grand Duke Capman's face darkens and apologizes to her. She told him to pretend they don't know each other unless it's for work. She warns him to stay due to the trade with Rift. Capman trembles, and looks darker and he asks why is she not thinking anything. Navier was shocked to know that Capman can read the mind of a person. She is shocked by Grand Duke Capman's ability to read people's minds, which he believes is a weakness. Grand Duke Capman told her that he is not a monster and he will accept if she will tell it in public. Navier explained potential international conflict caused by the actions of Capman, highlighting the need for three favorable clauses in the agreement for trade between Rift and the Western Empire. He answered that demands will be made within common sense. Absurd demands could cause Amona and Emmett to refuse to trade. Navier was puzzled because Heinle claims the effects of a potion he drank at night were off at dawn, but the Grand Duke of Capman remains unchanged after months. Capman reveals his love for her, but changes his wording that her husband truly loves her. Navier questions Heinle's love for her, unsure of why he loves her. She suspect Capman may not lie because he can read a person's mind but she struggled to comprehend when Heinle began loving her. She had a very boring personality. Moreover, this uninteresting personality was not uncommon. She preferred reading books and staying in her room. Even her ex-husband, Sovieshu, left her and looked the other way. She asked if Heinle really loved her. She hears a loud thumping from their shared bedroom. She finds Heinle, hugs him, smells the scent of the man who loved her. Navier is shaken by the unexpected truth about love, which has driven Grand Duke Capman and Sovieshu into confusion and impulsivity. She questioned the nature of love and its lasting impact on their lives. Sovieshu's love for Rashta led to her being thrown out and questions about the duration and consequences of Heinle's love. Heinle expresses love and commitment to her, expressing his love for her without immediate response, then wraps his arms around her waist and closes his eyes. The next day, as the wedding guests left, Navier noticed carriages moving away. She walked quickly, wanting to calm her parents' troubled mind. As she approached the detached palace, she saw familiar black hair, and that man is Sovieshu. He approached her, while she asked if he was leaving today, but Sovieshu remained quiet. Navier wanted to leave him, but Sovieshu called her and questions that all people makes mistakes, implying that he made a mistake in divorce. He admits to being arrogant and planning everything on his own, and not telling her about his plan. So Vieshu asks what he can do to get her back. She answered that he is still the emperor. Despite their broken relationship, she expected him to take care of the Eastern Empire, even if he divorced him by mistake. She is surprised by Sovieshu's sudden declaration of love, causing her to question if he truly loves her. But Sovieshu's repeated that he love her, 
but she's feeling suffocated and asked him what's the point of saying it to her. He reveals that her ex-husband is an idiot who left her arrogantly and regrets it, and asked her if she looks down at him. She feels a slight heat in her eyes and reminisce about her time in the Eastern Empire. She recalls his doubts, pains, and expulsions, as well as their time together, including their wedding and engagement. She feels a deep desire to cry and question why he abandoned her, despite their friendship. She cries, unsure of how she could manage her emotions, so Vyashu, unable to wipe away her tears, clenches his fist instead. He told her that when she think of them, remember this moment. Suffer no more for the hurt he have caused her. Just laugh at her miserable ex-husband who now seeks to cling to her. Heinle called aides to discuss the transition from the Western Kingdom to an empire. He analyzed diplomatic documents and asked for a report on the reasons behind the honors and the importance of honoring the empire. Heinle mentions Marquis Ketrin as the reason for completing the work at once. Heinle replaced unnecessary positions and entrusted Marquis Ketrin who had served as foreign affairs minister. Heinle considers the last emperor's will about Krista's matter, but he wants to take her out the palace and goes to Compshire's mansion. Rashta orders Viscount Roteshu to visit the Imperial Palace of the Eastern Empire tomorrow to find the slave trade certificate. Roteshu visits the palace and pretends to have it despite Kosher's theft. Rashta called him a liar and throws a cup at the wall, causing Viscount Roteshu to flinch and shrug his shoulders. He tries to put her in her place, but she changes quickly. Roteshu doesn't show anger and smiles forcedly. He reveals that the certificate was stolen by Kosher, and Rashta orders him to leave. Rashta throws a diamond ring to him. However, he finds her arrogant and dismisses her as a slave, akin to a commoner. This anger leads him to threaten to teach her a lesson. Rashta is also searching for the slave certificate without any close aids. She was greeted by Verioni, but her actions are limited due to her status as the Empress. She is unable to move quietly and needs close aids or subordinates as soon as possible to find the certificate. Rashta stumbles upon a magnificent carriage heading towards the main palace. The coachman stops the carriage and greets Rashta. She asks who is in the carriage, but the coachman doesn't answer, leaving her to wonder. She questions her identity and wonders if she knows who she is. Rashta orders the carriage to pay respects. A girl, the same age as Rivetti, appears and stares at her as if she's an enemy. The coachman, embarrassed, confronts a girl named Evely who is disrespectful towards Rashta. The girl, expressing dissatisfaction, told her she is not the empress she knew. Voice. Rashta, angered, steps forward, but Baron Lant informs her that she is a guest of the emperor. Baron Lant demands Evely apologize to the empress, but Evely denies any wrongdoing. Rashta thought that she is not a noble since Braun Lant shout at her. Evely gasped upon entering. Initially, she hated him due to what he did to Navy and thought he was mean and stupid. However, upon seeing him in person, he was more than handsome. Evely, feeling suffocated by the emperor's stare, speaks first, asking why he called her. Sovieshu asks her if she didn't know why she was called. Evely tells Sovieshu that she was patronized by the empress, causing the emperor's wrath. She was also told that she will be the emperor's second concubine. He denies the idea, stating he doesn't hate the empress. It wouldn't be absurd to hate her because she patronized her, and she's too young to be his concubine. He told her that she is a talented and smart individual even though her mana had declined, and plans to support her to utilize her talent. So Vyeshu orders his staff to leave, but Evely asks to stay at the Imperial Palace and wanted to become a maid during her free time. So Vyeshu assures her she can work as a maid. He orders Baron Lant to prepare a room for her in the Southern Palace. In the audience hall, People line up to state their case. Johnson is in line to meet his sister while a man tries to soothe his baby. Johnson notices the Empress's rigid expression, terrifying. The father asks her to bless the baby, but she remains motionless, and murmurs spread. Rashtu is frightened by the murmurs, so she reach her hand receive the baby from Alan. She recognizes the baby's dark eyes and hair, which is similar to her own, despite being covered in a bonnet. Rashta hugs a whimpering baby but is haunted by the memories of her previous encounter with the baby. She fears that Soviesha finds the baby's face. Eventually, she returns the baby to Alan, expressing the baby's beauty. Soviesha, aware of Rashta's child, understood her stiff expression and felt sorry for her, 
realizing it was due to her deep sadness over her missed child. Johnson, a commoner's journalist, greeted the emperor and empress, so Vieshu asked what brings him. Johnson is concerned about her sister, who has been absent from work at the palace. The palace's internal affairs official informed him that she had quit her job, but he didn't believe she will not come home. He also reveals that her sister, Delize, was a maid that works to the empress. Rashta's face become pale while Sovieshi remembered that she ordered to cut out her tongue and imprison her. Rashta reveals that she had two close maids, but Delai's quit due to workload. Jonson is desperate, but Sovieshi assures him that the matter will be thoroughly investigated. Rashta calls Duke Elgi in tears, causing him to be perplexed. She shares her problem about a past incident where Rashta punished a maid for attempting to harm her. Duke Elgi questions Rashta's decision. But Rashta replied that she is unaware that Delai's brother is a journalist who interviewed her. Rashta told him that she is in prison for a crime, but Duke Elgi questions why she didn't inform her family. Rashta answered that she fears that he wouldn't believe her accusation. Duke Elgi comfort her by saying that Soviesha would take care of it. Rashta is feeling scared and helpless, but Duke Elgi assures her that Soviesha will intervene because the imperial family's dignity would be affected if things went wrong. Rashta, relieved covers her belly and looks at Elgi with tears, acknowledging his help would have been difficult without him. Heinle show Navier her office and El greeted by his smile. Inside, a beautiful office with bookshelves, a large desk, and a reception area is decorated in a harmonious green and gold color scheme. Navier expresses her admiration. They chatted about choosing Navier's aides, then shifted to Krista's unusual behavior at the wedding reception. He couldn't handle it and wanted to send her to Compshire but faced difficulties due to his brother's last will. The excitement of seeing the office faded, knowing that Krista was in love with Heinle. Navier feels a sudden urge to send Krista to Compshire, but Heinle is unsure how to handle her. She decided to think before acting, as sending her to Compshire would not be beneficial in the long run. Heinle was already suspected of King Warden's early death and would add up another suspicion if they force Krista to go to Compshire. She need to go there on her own volition. Despite the uncertainty, Navier reassured Heinle that everything would be fine, despite feeling a weight on her heart. During a meal, Rose shared that she discovered a rumor that there is a secret relationship between the Emperor and Krista. Rose claims the Emperor allowed Krista to wipe his forehead at a wedding reception. Laura becomes enraged and demands that she send to Compshire. Navier reassures Laura and Countess Jubal about an incident they've heard about, claiming it's a misunderstanding and that it could be a blessing in disguise, despite their distressed reactions to the memory of Rashta. Alan, feeling tired, enters the mansion. Roteshu asked him about Rashta. He answered that Rashta seems to like the baby. Viscount Roteshu reveals a second concubine will make the insolent girl obedient, surprising Alan and Rivetti. Rivetti feels empty after Empress Navier left for the Western Empire. Alan is less informed about the situation. He learns that Emperor Soviesha brought a mage girl to the Southern Palace, who is speculated to be his second concubine. Alan questions why the Emperor is fixating on another woman while having Rashta by his side. Rivetti resorted to a good idea when her eyes glowing, and Viscount Roteshu asked about her intentions, revealing she would be His Majesty Soviesha's third concubine. Rivetti promises to seduce the Emperor and make Rashta's eyes tear, but her father disapproved her plan because he want a man for her that is loyal. Heinle and Navier attend the conference room together while the officials are used to the Queen's absence. They initially stare at her, but eventually become absorbed in their own business. Marky Ketrin, Krista's cousin, raised a question about to Navier about the Eternal Thousand Bandits. He mentioned that there are five nearby territories that need support, but if they were all supported, their troops would be dispersed. The Empress, having experience in fighting these bandits, asked for her wise opinion on where to provide support. The Eastern Empire had a powerful mage army, allowing lords to possess lands and private soldiers. The Western Empire limited these possessions, with the Emperor controlling military power and responsibility. Heinle criticizes the Marquis Ketrin under his command for entrusting the Empress of the Western Empire with his duties, causing Marquis Ketrin to become angry. He argues that Empress Navier, known for her intelligence in the Eastern Empire, Heinle attempt to speak again, but Navier answered that they need to attack first. Marquis Ketrin was surprised and argued that the Eternal Thousand Bandits would invade the Western Empire.
He added that since Navier was from the Eastern Empire, she don't care about the situation. Heinle told him to watch his mouth. Navier smiled and told Marquis Ketrin that he really is unaware of the Eternal Thousand Bandits. She told him that those bandits moved for profits and didn't harbor anger. Marquis Ketrin was taken aback and argued that her words were ridiculous and that a severe blow to the Eternal Thousand Bandits would limit their movement, despite their formidable opponent. Navier reveals that Sir Kosher already won over 50 battles against Eternal Thousand Bandits, and he is confident in handling the situation, as he is the Navier's brother. Marky Ketrin hesitates and no one addresses her again. After the meeting, Navier discussed the situation with her brother. He was used to handle the bandits and he expressed his willingness to handle the situation. Rashto examined the common women who had been gathered in the Western Palace, whose parents were prisoners. All women with children were excluded. She was going to use their parents as bait to control them. So even if she blackmailed these women with their parents, they might abandon them for the sake of their children. Rashta orders Viscountess Verdi to bring all the women back in. Rashta told her that she will test them. Rashta shouted that her pearl earrings are missing. They were puzzled by the situation and couldn't object to it. Viscountess Verdi followed her into her bedroom, advising the women to bring them one by one and secretly advising them to tell the truth. In the end, Rashta decided to hire those who lied. Later, she sent to Evely, a maid chosen for being a good liar. Evely, the court mage, was hesitant to trust the maid sent by the Empress, but she didn't dare not to accept. The maid noticed Evely's necklace and was suspicious. The maid had received orders to find out if Evely had any gifts from the Emperor. She was convinced, but Evely stated it was a gift from the Magic Academy. In fact, the necklace was an item that came from McKenna on Heinle's order, made especially to return her mana, and sent to the Dean to be given to her. However, Evely was unaware of this. On the day her brother left the capital, Rose researched Miss Mullany's family and William was adopted by Marquis Amaras and was originally her wife's nephew and son of Duke Liberty, who is on Krista's side. Duke Liberty gave his son to Marquis Ketrin, and Marchioness Amaras agreed to adopt her nephew as the successor. Although they know Miss Mullany has interest in being an heir, they didn't trust her. William, who is rumored to be brilliant, is considered for the position. The title will be passed to William, but the estate will be turned over to Miss Mullany. Navier told Rose they need to prove that Miss Mullany is far superior to William and instructed to call the two of them. Navier shares dinner with Heinle and share her plan to test William and Mullany. Heinle questions their inexperience in handling a task, but Navier told him that it is only a test. Heinle asks if both are William is more capable than Mullany. She jokingly agrees to support the useful one, but becomes worried about Heinle's reaction about her cold answer. Heinle, despite not understanding her joke, didn't seem to find her heartless nor cold, but rather he become excited and amazed. The nobleman attended Rashta's invitation to a glamorous tea party at the Crystal House. Rashta, dressed in a dark purple dress, captivated the noblemen with her purity and dignity, welcoming them with a smile. Rashta's experience revealed that non-nobility men were attracted to noble women, fantasizing about their elegance and intelligence, while noblemen admired women not belonging to the nobility, viewing them as pure and innocent. Marquis Ferrang, angered by Kosher's banishment, told that Viscount and Viscountess Isqua are like rolling stones that instigated authoritarian nobility. He believed that the blood of a fallen foreign noble family would run through the crown prince's veins. However, this behavior of Rashtas soon led to bad rumors in high society. It was not common for noble women to invite only noblemen to hang out. So Vyeshu visited Rashta and warned her to observe her behavior and listen to Baron Lance's advice. He also added to cut T.I.'s with Duke Elgi, as he was colluding with the pirates. Rashta, feeling anguished, met Evely at the Southern Palace to visit Duke Elgi. Evely was rude and contemptuous, and Rashta was shocked. Rashta mocked Evely's rudeness and asked her if she wanted to be imprisoned. Evely replied that His Majesty would not stand idly if she will be imprisoned. Rashta is angry, and asks Evely whose side will the emperor choose, the empress or a commoner, while Evely answered calmly not to become so hard on her, because she will soon become her sister. Rashta cried out in horror as soon as Evely called her sister. Goosebumps rose on her skin. This arrogant girl who settled in someone else's house to take her husband away from her at any opportunity. Irritated, 
Rashta orders Viscountess Verdi to take Evely away. However, Rashta's fake parents, Viscount Isqua slaps Evely while Viscountess Isqua insults her. Evely is angry, but Rashta smiles and dismisses her fake parents, Viscount and Viscountess Isqua, urging them to leave with her. Looking at their backs, Evely couldn't help but shed the tears she was holding back. After a busy day, Heinle asks if Navier on going hunting to relieve stress. Navier agrees. Though she doesn't like hunting, she enjoys horseback riding. A few days later, Heinle and I went together to a hunting ground near the Imperial Palace. At first they all rode together. Rather than hunting, it was more like they were chatting on horseback. Heinle commands guard Captain Unum about going alone with his wife. Heinle insists it's not dangerous and asks Navier. She agrees. The ride on horseback was pleasant, with sunlight reflecting on Heinle's hair and a nature-like scent. The ride was filled with a tingle in her heart. Heinle suddenly asked Navier he will rode alone and mention something he want to hunt. Heinle then asked her to follow him from a distance, and she followed him, holding the bow unstrained. Navier heard a scream, which is Heinle's voice, and quickly turns her horse to investigate. Heinle is in a duel with a fluffy fox, and the fox wags its tail. Heinle, lying on a bed with a fake bandage, is confronted by McKenna about his fight with a fox. Heinle explains that the only animals he encountered were foxes and squirrels. Heinle is upset because the dramatic scene he created didn't work. He acted desperate, but was immediately caught by the person who wanted him to love him. Inevitably he felt embarrassed. Unable to bear the embarrassment, Heinle crawled under the covers. Just then, the door opened softly, and McKenna turned his head. The one who opened the door and poked her head in slightly was Navier. Navier hear a faint and sullen voice, and Heinle who thought it was McKenna, told her she was heavy repeatedly. Navier questions Heinle's belief in her weight, despite him initially claiming she is light. Heinle initially denies she's heavy, but now he is saying she's heavy and demanded her to get off. Krista, once a respected queen, faced a difficult situation due to a rumor in high society. The rumor was that Krista and Heinle were having an affair. A lady-in-waiting suggests going to Compshire, but Krista hesitates, fearing she would be treated differently in Compshire. If she decides to go to Compshire, it will mean accepting her end and waiting for her death. She fears the rumor will continue to grow, so she decides to take advantage of it. Despite the risk, she remains determined to fight. McKenna was happy because his main workload had decreased since Navier joined the workforce. Navier was now taking over many of the tasks. Heinle asked him if he recalls a time when he was embarrassed and cried under the covers in shame. McKenna reveals that Navier had seen him after he left the room. Heinle screams at McKenna, revealing that he thought it was him. McKenna doesn't know what's wrong, but Heinle believes her queen hates the word heavy and is mad at him. Heinle explains that her queen hates the word heavy and is angry at high. For it, McKenna questions why she would get angry if she thought she was heavy. Navier's anger is fueled by McKenna's belief that a woman can't get angry due to being labeled as heavy. Navier enters the room, delivering papers to McKenna and Heinle. Heinle smiles, trying to cover up his mistakes, while Navier smiles indifferently and points at the papers. Unum announced that Krista was there. Heinle frowned while Navier tried to assure Heinle that it was okay. Heinle eventually allowed Krista to enter. After a while, Krista came in with Marky Ketrin, but there was definitely something strange going on. She seemed to have overlooked her outfit. Krista greeted Heinle and asked to speak with him privately, but he refused. Navier approached Heinle and saw Marky Ketrin, who was angry. Krista speak that she has a proposal, causing tension in the office. She slowly speaks. Take me as your concubine, causing a total silence. The unexpected proposal shocks Navier. High society was shocked to learn that Krista openly asked Heinle to make her his concubine, causing a stir among the nobles. Despite the nobles' misunderstanding, Krista believes she couldn't escape the scandal even if she go to Compshire. Navier access her secret drawer containing a list of women in Krista's service, including their families, dissatisfactions, and loyalty. She asked Grand Duke Capman to investigate these women and select those with little loyalty and dissatisfaction. She requests her ladies-in-waiting to bring them in secretly. Heinle agreed to take Krista's case to the state council, as an official contract was required for her to become the emperor's concubine. A meeting was attended by nobles, officials, and Krista, dressed in black. Heinle appeared sullen, but calmed down. Officials disagreed 
stating Krista's concubine status was ridiculous. However, seeing Krista and Heinle together at a wedding reception convinced most ladies. Although it was strange that old Duke Zementia, Krista's father, remained silent when it was about his daughter, everything went as expected. Heinle appeared he didn't care, as per Navier's previous request. But seeing he healed his hair and stare at Navier's ire, he genuinely cared. Marquis Ketrin stated that the former king requested Emperor Heinle to protect Krista in his last will. However, Emperor Heinle disrespected his sister-in-law after marriage. Navier is about to give a signal when a foreign language from Rift is heard. Officials are silent, and Grand Duke Capman arrives. Navier is bewildered because doesn't ask for help. The Grand Duke admits to intervening in their business, despite avoiding interference in other countries' affairs. Navier becomes nervous about Grand Duke Capman's intentions to reveal the truth about the love potion. He claims Emperor Heinle was with him that night. He leaves the ballroom with his majesty and many witness this, including those on Krista's side. Navier signaled the maids of Krista, but is surprised by the number of ladies-in-waiting who have come forward to testify against Krista. They testified that Krista returns early that day. Marquis Ketrin viewed Heinle with a twisted expression, but he remained undefended. During silence, attention shifted to Krista, who remained pale but proud. The next day in the office, one of my aides approached me and gave me the news that Krista had left for Compshire. Navier heart sank upon meeting Heinle, hugging him tightly and expressing that, you're mine. He bird asked if she is not angry anymore, but she kissed him instead, feeling comforted and reassured. Heinle asked if Navier is ready to accept his heart, but Navier answered that she's not sure. However, she expressed her opinion that staying in a relationship with someone they don't want isn't good. Heinle take it as a positive answer. Navier notices Heinle's love for her, but struggles to believe in long-lasting, unconditional love. One step and she will fall in love with Heinle, but the end is bitter and more painful than her relationship with Sovieshu. It wasn't right to hold on to the wish that he would love only her for the rest of his life, so it was better to keep some distance now. Keeping a distance will make it not too painful if you fall in love with someone else. Heinle command Mastas to block the doors and windows. When Krista and her aides enter the Comshire mansion, Heinle told her to he will offer water, drinks, alcohol, and food to keep the mansion filled daily. He promises to take good care of her sister-in-law. Rashta visits Duke Elgi to discuss what Sovieshu and Baron Lance did to her and ask him if he know about the rumor about him. Duke Elgi smiles, allowing Rashta to decide on believing the rumors, emphasizing truth over rumors. Duke Elgi becomes serious when Rashta informs him about a request for a mercenary from Viscount Rostechu. The Duke advised that the mercenary should not Rotashu's subordinate, causing Rashta to hesitate. Rashta asks Duke Elgi if he can get her a mercenary. Duke Elgi agrees but he insists that he may do the same as Viscount Roteshu by getting his own subordinate. And he can't do something Rashta can't even tell him. Rashta discovers that there were rumors about her finding something. Angrily, she orders Viscountess Verdi to find out who started the rumor. The maid, who didn't intend to start trouble, pleaded for forgiveness. Rashta, furious, questioned her actions and reprimanded her for causing the problem. She felt it necessary to punish the maid as a warning to prevent future incidents. Rashta, determined, ordered Viscountess Verdi to execute the maid's father, who was sentenced to death but not executed due to his good behavior. The maid was furious that her father, who had been sentenced to death just because he avenged her brother that was taken and killed, was just easily executed because of the Empress word. The maid angrily lifted the chair next to her and pounced on Rashta. So Vieshu arrived, addressing Rashta, who was being treated by a palace doctor. Rashta, on the verge of tears, expressed her immense pain. So Viesha asked what happened. The palace doctor revealed that she had an injury and warned her about a scar and assured that the injury was not serious. Rashta is upset about her scar. While So Viesha asked another questions about the condition of the baby, the doctor told him that the baby is in good condition but advised to be cautious. So Viesha asked what Rashta did to make the maid very angry, causing to hurt the empress. Viscountess Verdi told the emperor the whole story. So Vieshu advised Rashta that she cannot execute someone hastily unless it's related to the murder of a royal family member, even if it's the empress. So Vieshu told her he is not surprised by Rashta's lack of knowledge, reprimanded her and summoned Viscountess Verdi and the guards. He instructed them to inform him if Rashta violated her empress status, 
causing Rashta to feel insulted. Rashta, depressed, cried alone in her bedroom, questioning if Sovieshu's love had faded. She believed it her own to save herself. The pain in her forehead allowed her to realize the reality of the situation. She told Vicaunus that she will use her immunity power to release the father of the she choose to spy on Evely to get her trust. Verdi was shocked as she will release someone with a heavy crime. Navier became accustomed to the heavy workload, leading to increased efficiency and speed. She and Grand Duke Capman was sending letters and discussing trade matters. William and Mullany presented their own investigation reports to Navier. She was puzzled by the similarity in their reports, even in errors. She ordered them to leave, expressing disappointment and dissatisfaction with the report. Heinley laughed at the unexpected report and joked about it being bad. Navier admitted it wasn't bad, but was trying to trick them. Heinley suggested finding out who copied the report would be the first one to visit. She wishes it wasn't Mullany. Heinley asked Navier if she's scared with ghosts since there are rumors circulating that a ghost with crown is wandering. Navier answered she's not. Heinley asks his queen if he can stay by her side from sunset to sunrise since he's scared. Heinley stays with her even when she's working or reading. The queen decides to reveal the ghost's true identity for his sake. Navier was about to investigate the ghost. However, she encounters other visitors at the location where a ghost supposedly appeared, including his husband, who seems not afraid of ghosts, but trembles in fear of ghosts when they talk about it last time. Rashta, shocked by the recent chair incident, visits Sovieshu to seek relaxation and clear her mind. She decides to go to Rimwell, a small rural territory. Sovieshu agrees, providing her with sturdy carriages and a nobility villa in Moyer. He thinks that she is depressed after a bandage removal and discovers a thicker, longer scar on her forehead. Rashta leaves her villa and seeks a man who once helped her escape, Viscount Roteshu. She entrusts him with a task, knowing he remained loyal even after losing an eye. Rashta told him that Viscount Roteshu is bothering her. Pix asks what can he do for his beloved. He was shocked when Rashta's request is to hire an assassin. Rashta visits an assassin's guild as instructed by Pix. A tall man with a hood appears. The man, with cold and sharp eyes, stares at Rashta in silence. Rashta asks the assassin if he would kill Pix for money, hesitantly asking if he knew him. If he agreed, she plans to test his heartlessness and skill. The assassin agrees, calling it a test and asking to kill Pix. During dinner, Navier watched Heinley, who claimed he had been afraid of ghosts, but he calmly lead his men to investigate ghosts with a crown. She decided to test Heinley, who hadn't stayed at the palace. Heinley expressed his fear of ghosts but felt safe with his queen. Heinley, a charming and lovely man, appeared cute and charming to Navier, showing his trembling hand which resembled a pitiful hound dog. Navier thinks his attitude was strange, as he showed a different attitude to others. Navier was with Grand Duke Capman to discuss items for trade. Capman expresses interest in market research, but acknowledges the need for help from the Emperor due to his lack of detailed information about trade groups in the Western Empire. After the meeting, Capman hesitated before revealing that the ghost's commotion is led by Marquis Ketrin, and Duke Liberty turns a blind eye. Capman left quickly, but Navier understood his meaning. Navier informs Heinley about Marky Ketrin as the one behind the mysterious ghost. Heinley reveals that it was possible since Marky Ketrin can use illusionary magic. Navier is surprised to learn that the Minister of Foreign Affairs is a mage. Navier asks Heinley to take care of the investigation using an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, while Heinley agrees, expressing his enjoyment. Viscount Langdol capture Marky Ketrin and announce the plan's success to Navier, promising Marky Ketrin will sleep for seven to ten days. Since Marky Ketrin was put to sleep, the ghost never reappeared. Neither Heinley nor Navier had to spread any rumors. People began to murmur on their own. They were outraged, convinced that Marky Ketrin had done it as revenge for Krista's expulsion. After commissioning the assassin to turn Rivetti into a slave, Rashtu immediately returned to Moyer's villa. The first few days were painful, as the image of the dead man's head constantly came to her mind. But as time passed, the shock faded. The mercenary that Rashta was asking was introduced by Roteshu. Rashta questions the mercenary's identity as he cover his faces, asks how to recognize the mercenary. If she can't, she his face. The mercenary shows Rashta his index, middle, and ring finger. Rashta told him that she can't hire him immediately as she want to see his skills first. The man nodded in response. 
She told him to go tonight to Duke LG's and bring her the bracelet he wears on his wrist. Rashta hurriedly went to visit Duke LG. Duke LG, dissatisfied with Rashta's actions, answered coldly that she was taking advantage of him, but she reassures him that she trusts him the most. However, Duke LG told her that she's putting his life at risk. Duke LG's cold demeanor left Rashta sad, as she had a mercenary's test for tonight. Dejected, she returned to the West Palace. At dawn, Rashta was furious when a mercenary appeared with Duke LG's bracelet, revealing blood on it. The mercenary explained that Duke LG was too strong and had guards, but Rashta recognized his skill in defeating the Duke and guards. Rashta visits Duke LG at the Southern Palace after she heard the news that he was leaving. Rashta hurriedly went to the Duke while he expresses no reason to stay at the Eastern Empire. Rashta warns him that if he leaves, she will be left alone in a cruel and merciless place where only he treats her good. As Duke LG began to pack his luggage, she noticed that the area where he used to place his bracelet was bandaged. Rashta stood behind him and cried out desperately with tears in her eyes. She told him that she like him and she love him. Rashta, who stood behind Duke LG, couldn't tell he was smiling. Duke LG told her that her relationship with Sovieshu is not good, causing her to say she love him, but she reassures him that the thought of him leaving is painful, and she pleads for him to be her lover. Duke LG, a member of the royal family of another country, expresses that he also like Rashta, but was informed that she had no power as an empress and could lose his reputation in his home country if he became her lover. But Duke LG told her that she can gift him so he can be his lover. He asked for a territory near the coast. Rashta promises to find a way. Marky Caro reported a scandal between Duke LG and Rashta, many saw Rashta clinging to Duke LG and ask him to stay. Marky Carl asks Sovieshu to do something about it as it will tarnish the imperial family. Sovieshu lamented Rashta's innocence despite her clever side and common sense behavior, but he can't believe her change was fast. Marky Carl added that there is a scandal between former Queen Krista and Emperor Heinle, but Grand Duke had testified against the rumor. Sovieshu thinks that Kapman was covering Heinle. Sovieshu is shocked by Grand Duke Kapman's lies because he saw him being with Rashta that night. He thinks that the playboy Heinle was just pretending to be in love. Johnson, a journalist, is frustrated with the lack of news about his sister's disappearance. He has requested an audience with the emperors and received assurances of investigation. He decides to question the maid working with his sister Arian. He asks Arian to help him find her, but she hurries away, causing further suspicion. Johnson pleads for her help, but Arian refuses to provide any information. She told him she can't say anything because of her fear for her life. Arian whispers, People are not all they appear to be. She advises Johnson to doubt the person he believe in the most, leaving him stunned and confused before she left. Sovieshu was leaning on the wall when Arian told him she complied with his orders. What Arian told to Johnson was everything in line with Sovieshu's instructions. A rumor circulated in the Eastern Empire's capital about a maid sentenced to death for hitting an empress with a chair. People questioned her sanity and common sense. However, a famous newspaper published an article stating that Empress Rashta's maids have not resigned from their jobs due to their free will. The article raises questions about the reasons behind these, as all maids are commoners and Empress Rashta's personality may be causing these issues. Rashta enjoyed reading the commoner's newspaper. Because of this, she was able to read this article immediately. Once Rashta read it, she was terrified and went to visit Sovieshu. Sovieshu reads Rashta's newspaper and explained to Rashta that her journalist is angry. She thinks he is angry because of what happened to Delis. She pleads with Sovieshu to stop such articles, as Rashta's image may be affected. Sovieshu advises to leave the journalist alone because they don't know how he will react, while the rumor will disappear in no time. Rashta heard a nobleman express concern about a soon-born baby, expressing hope it will grow strong. Another nobleman suggested the Troby family, loyal to the imperial family, may not be loyal to the next emperor. After hearing this, she felt chills just imagining her child will have many enemy. Rashta decides to protect her child by eliminating anyone who might block her path. Rashta confronts a mercenary who claims to have killed for money, revealing that he can kill nobles and commoners. Rashta commanded him to kill Duke and Duchess Troby. The amount to kill the Trobies are big. That's why Rashta seeks help from Duke LG to borrow money. She promises to repay him and ensures all loans are documented in writing. 
Laura opened the door, and Grand Duke Capman arrives to see Navier to discuss about a urgent matter and told her that there were problems about the first three test teams for trade. During a dark night, Rivetti felt uneasy and unsure if anyone was following her. Despite walking, she felt a strange sensation. She panicked and ran away, but the same passersby appeared. That was the last day Rivetti was last seen. Grand Duke Capman, Heinle, McKenna, Navier and other officials met to discuss the situation in Whitemond. They discussed the arrest of the three trade teams. McKenna suggested that Whitemond's actions might be due to their dislike for the Western Empire's self-proclamation. Heinle instructed Marky Ketrin to ask Whitemond officials about the cause and ask Grand Duke Capman to monitor the situation. Navier doubts Marky Ketrin but Heinle reassure her that the Marquis is not stupid to act against him. Navier nod because she trusts Heinle, not the Marquis. Navier contemplates being a mother, recalling Heinle's happiness holding a child, questioning if he genuinely wanted a child like Sovieshu. Heinle arrived to talk to Navier. He tells her about Rashta, who hired a mercenary for an assassination. The queen is confused and speechless, but Heinle explains that Rashta is targeting her father and mother. She finds it absurd for Rashta to want to murder her parents, as it is more plausible for her to want to kill her instead. Heinle reassures Navier that his informant exchanged mercenary hired by Rashta by his subordinate. Rashta now has power and has to take responsibility for her actions, and Navier must not stand idly by. Heinle was surprised with Navier, as she didn't want to get involved with Rashta in the past. However, Things have changed since Rashta is now an empress, able to harm the Navier's parents without hindrance. The trade team leader, unsure of the purpose of Navier's summons, confirmed his regular interaction with the Bear Corporation of the Eastern Empire. Navier offered him an assignment. The team leader becomes nervous when Navier told him to relax. The plan is to induce Bear Corporation to check the proper use of promissory notes in trades. She told the merchant to make an excuse, such as the increasing popularity of counterfeit promissory note scams and the significant losses caused by such transactions, and is relieved to face the challenge. Heinle expresses his distrust towards an ally who has betrayed them. He wants to make the White Mon their port. Heinle is thinking to invade White Mon, fearing that they may betray it again at a more crucial time. He is currently focusing on the math to determine the consequences. Viscount Rotashu inquires about Rashta's recent absence and asks if she has seen Rivetti. Rashta denies knowing anything about Rivetti and is not interested in anything to do with her. Meanwhile, Rivetti wakes up inside a prison and sees an evil man giving money to another man, who asks if there's someone who have a grudge against her. Rivetti was forced to follow this last customer, with both hands tied tightly behind her back. Aurelio, a member of the Knights of the Imperial Guard, apologizes to Rivetti for scaring her. Surprisingly, she learns that Emperor Sovieshu knew about her kidnapping. The knight then reveals that Rashta is the culprit. Rivetti stays in the capital, grateful for the Emperor's help and was advised to stay on the mansion, as it will be useful in the future. A nobleman, hesitant to speak, was allowed to speak by McKenna. He trembled and remarked that the Emperor of the Eastern Empire divorced Her Majesty Navier due to her infertility, causing Navier to ponder the situation. He was asking if the rumor was true. The Empress's gaze turned to Marquis Ketrin, Krista's cousin, and she smiled and replied, of course not. After meeting, Navier approached Marquis Ketrin, who had asked about her infertility. She told him that even if she is infertile, his family can't take her position as empress, argued, Marky Ketrin frowned, indicating he didn't expect such a blunt response. Marky Ketrin stopped a spear from passing by, preventing it from striking him in the forehead. A knight of the Imperial Guard, standing behind Heinle, threw the spear. Apologizing for the mistake, Marky Ketrin expressed disgust and questioned Heinle's childish tendency to take revenge. A subordinate investigating Kosher heard an incredible rumor about a hidden mistress of Emperor Heinle. It was said that a knight of the Imperial Guard would visit her house, and a plain clothed guard would be in front. Marky Ketrin waits nine hours for a knight to appear and give a woman a basket. Marky Ketrin is concerned, as the knight and the man in front are also Heinle Imperial Guard members. Marky Ketrin approached the woman and asked if it is her child. The woman confirms that the child is her son and he asks why she is staying at the house. A woman reveals she is his majesty's mistress and presents a beautiful pendant, symbolizing love from Heinle, 
which is actually the Imperial family emblem. Marky Ketrin rejoices, knowing he can use her. Marky Ketrin asks to give him her pendant in exchange with his family pendant emblem to offer to trust him. The woman only gives the pendant after receiving the emblem. A woman named Alia presented herself in front of Heinle, while the emperor asked what bring her to the palace. She claimed that Marky Ketrin was the one who encouraged her to do what she did in exchange to a promise. The Marquis promised to bring her, claiming to be the mistress of His Majesty the Emperor. She also showed the Marquis emblem to show what she said was true. Marquis Ketrin's ears turned red as those present began to murmur. The Marquis clenched his teeth. He could show everyone the necklace with Prince Heinle's emblem, but then it would be clear that he had encouraged her to go against Heinle. Marquis Ketrin realized he had fallen into a trap. Evely was thrilled to discover that her mana is back. The mage asked about the process, but Evely remained unsure, as she had lost the necklace and was unsure if it was stolen or dropped. The court mage quickly show a necklace to ask if it is Evely's lost necklace. She agreed Tay it was her. The mage assures her that if the necklace restores her mana, she can return the rest. After these words from Evely, another court mage's assistant, who had reached over to grab the necklace, suddenly cried out in pain. The mage called for Evely to get the doctor, as the senior assistant was still unconscious. So Viesha comforted the mage assistant who lost mana and promised to find the cause and return his mana. So Viesha asked Evely who gave her the necklace. She explained that it was given by the dean, who explained it can help to get her mana back. President of the Bear Corporation of the Eastern Empire handed him a promissory note in exchange for the purchase of special jewels from the Western Empire. Pirate Stanju accepted the promissory note and examined it carefully. It was to verify its authenticity. A heavy sigh came out of the president's mouth. As he expected, the Bear Corporation had not issued any promissory notes to the Imperial family in the last year. So, there were two options. The huge donation that made people praise Empress Rashta was actually money given by the Emperor, or she had used promissory notes from the former Empress. If it was the first, it was laughable that she had acted as a kind person taking advantage of the Emperor. And if it was the second, it was a truly wicked act for her to use the former Empress money. The president, who had hoped that Rashta was truly the light of the commoners, was very disappointed. Heinle fell asleep, and Navier gently touched his skin. Navier rested her head and played with his face. Heinle opened his eyes and fell out of bed, leaving Navier shocked, asking Heinle what's happening. Just then, Navier could see why Heinle suddenly turned away. Blue ice almost white appeared where Heinle had been sleeping. Heinle answered that her body was slowly changing. He explained that Mana could circulate through her body with the help of the bed and him. Heinle lifted his hand, indicating that the ice was likely made by her. Heinle jokingly said that the Ice Empress as her nickname was suited to her. Navier was wondering and asked Heinle if her ability suits her because she is a cold person. Heinle chuckled and explained that the Navier's ability to identify ice is not due to being cold, and it's too early to determine if it's ice, snow, or water. Navier told Heinle that she wants to go to Magic Academy of the Eastern Empire to help control her power, but Heinle's expression turned dark due to its location in the Eastern Empire. A member of the Bear Corporation arrived about a counterfeit of old promissory notes used by Imperial family. The president remembered the cheers of the commoners toward Empress Rashta at the wedding parade and the near-deathly silence as Empress Navier passed them in the carriage. The president originally thought that Navier was shameless for remarrying after divorce, but regretted it after finding the truth. He ordered to call for journalist Johnson. Rashta reads a strange newspaper from another maid, trembling her hands and body. The maid, surprised by her white face. So Viesha was told about Rashta's premature labor and rushed to the West Palace. After two deliveries, Rashta experienced constant pain, causing internal shudder and sweating. Rashta questions Viscountess Verdi if the baby is a boy, but she confirms it's a girl, causing her vision to blur and her tears to form. So Viesha properly held the baby in his arms and carefully caressed her red, wrinkled skin with his large hands. They were celebrating Kosher's return after solving a problem with bandits. The news of Rashta's birth was not good news, as the secretary initially thought it was sensitive. Heinle ordered it to be announced in public, causing the celebration to fall apart. Navier thought that it was a premature baby, 
revealing it's a princess. The secretary responds that the emperor sent an invitation to a banquet celebrating the first descendant of the imperial family, but it doesn't require their attendance. Nayan informed Navier about Rashta's wedding donation, which raised suspicions about her. Rashta gave birth prematurely due to the promissory notes, which Navier did to protect her parents. Unintentionally, she Rashta, and wonder about Sovieshu's reaction if he found out. The Empress, feeling tired and unwell, calls out to her friends, who all left. She sees a golden feather through the door, asking why Heinle stays there. Queen approaches the throne in the hall, groaning anxiously. Navier lifts her up and notices a huge eagle clinging to the throne with its wings, displaying a fierce look. Navier swatted and beat monstrous eagle, it eventually shrinking to the size of queen. Its golden feathers turned into soft white fur. The eagle chirped and acted docile when hugged, displaying its beauty. She woke up, hearing Nyan's voice, and asked where the baby monster was, but they were puzzled. Heinle told Navier he had a strange nightmare where he found an egg in his collection of rare jewels. The egg was gold mixed with green, and he fed it to a baby bird, which grew into a monstrous eagle. The bird then wrapped itself around Heinle's throne. He couldn't reprimand the bird, so he turned to his queen for help. Heinle inquires about a premonitory dream, which Navier shares about having a similar dream. Heinle's expression stiffens. Heinle is relieved that the premonitory dream isn't bad, as it's believed that a couple having the same dream signifies a baby's arrival. Navier is unsure if she is pregnant. Heinle remains positive and asks her to let the palace doctor check her out, as she doesn't want to go through the same disappointment in the past. Marky Carl asks Sovieshu if he would have a second child with Rashta. Sovieshu shook his head, but Marky Carl suggested divorce and a new empress. He married Rashta for the baby but the baby was born a girl. Sovieshu said he would divorce Rashta and employ a harsher method if a quick divorce was not possible. Sovieshu announces that he will raise the princess to be his successor baby. This shocks Marky Karl, who believes only a prince from the empress can become his successor. Sovieshu argues that an emperor shall be man is only a custom, and history will be set when the princess becomes the first reigning empress. The princess will be named Glorum, and Sovieshu wishes her all the world's splendor. Once Rashta had recovered somewhat, a banquet was held for three days and three nights to celebrate the birth of Sovieshu's first baby. Those present came forward at the same time to congratulate Sovieshu. Since Sovieshu would not even allow Rashta to be near her daughter, People thought that Sovieshu, angered by the incident of the promissory notes, had deliberately separated the baby from Rashta. During the princess's birth celebration, Rashta, who had cared for her daughter, became a laughing stock. The baby received compliments and praise, but Rashta was not the center of attention. The next empress was speculated to be Evely, but it was denied that His Majesty would accept a commoner as empress twice. Rashta left the banquet due to fear of losing affection from Sovieshu. She remained calm until she found a way to avoid being thrown out. There was one person who observed the scene from a distance. It was Baron Lant. Baron Lant advised the emperor to allow Rashta to be with the princess, as he believes a baby should be with her mother after being born. Sovieshu sent the baby to Rashta at night, and Viscountess Verdi, who had been by Rashta's side during pregnancy and delivery, was overjoyed to hold the princess. Rashta hesitates when Viscountess Verdi offers to hold the princess, but quickly holds the baby, expressing her apology and gently patting and rocking her. Rashta stared in horror at the princess with her head bowed, suddenly feeling the same sensation of the past when she held the dead baby in her arms. At the grisly horror that swept over her from head to foot, Rashta gasped and threw the baby away. After throwing the baby, Rashta trembled as she clutched her head with both hands. She felt as if there was a sickening corpse smell on her arms, so she hastily swiped them across her knees and the sheets to get it off. The baby, who had been thrown to the floor, was crying inconsolably. Only then did Rashta calm down a little and asked with a blank stare, Is she alive? Viscountess Verdi recalls Delis, a maid whose tongue was cut and imprisoned because she saw something she shouldn't see. She holds the baby tightly, knowing she will kill her once she regains her senses. Viscountess Verdi barely answered Rashta that her baby is shocked and is being examined. She quickly leaves the bedroom, fearing a potential attack from Rashta's knights and maids, and rushes to the East Palace.
Viscountess Verdi cried out in tears after seeing Sovieshu, demanding protection from the Empress, who threw the princess to the floor. The palace doctor, astonished by Navier's pregnancy, congratulated her, causing Navier to squirm in confusion. The doctor then smiled awkwardly, expressing her surprise and confusion. Heinle kissed Navier and complimented her on a lovely baby eagle. He then held her, making her feel dizzy. Heinle then turned into a bird and started dancing. Navier feels a mix of emotions, including excitement and sadness, as she realized she will become a mother, a realization that goes beyond obligation and happiness. Queen approached Navier and rest his face on her belly, expressing their happiness and the fruit of their love. So Vieshu, concerned about Viscountess Verdi's statement that Rashta threw the princess, cared for the baby first. The baby cried inconsolably, indicating something had happened. So Vieshu leaves with a baby in his arms, but Rashtu accuses Viscountess Verdi of throwing the princess. Verdi denies the accusation and accuses the woman of trying to kill the princess. A loud bird chirps at Rashta, so Vieshu convinced that it was Rashta who was lying, and orders her to leave. Rashta gritted her teeth, looking at the countess as she feels betrayed and assures Sovieshu that Rashta will never hurt the princess. Sovieshu asked Viscountess Verdi if she had a child and had raised one herself. She admitted she had, but Sovieshu unexpectedly offered to prepare a room for the baby next to hers, allowing her to stay with the princess. Verdi expressed gratitude. Sovieshu, angered by Rashta's actions towards the baby, tried to control his anger and told himself that it will not just a simple divorce. Rashta, returning to the West Palace, screamed and broke her room, expressing her grief. She knelt on the rug where the baby fell, wailing, and unsure if she would repeat the act. The eerie sensation of holding the baby remained vivid in her memory. Rashta yelled at the door, but Viscount Roteshu entered without addressing her. She ordered him to leave, but Roteshu refused, stating that her father had arrived in the capital. Rashta staggered limply, and her expression became blank. Then she grabbed Viscount Roteshu by the collar and shook him with all her might, as tears spilled down her cheeks. Rashta slapped Viscount Roteshu, blaming him for not holding her baby properly. Rashta slaps him again, but he evades her, revealing his father's news. Rashta's anger subside, asking about his father, Viscount Isqua, but Roteshu told her it was her true father. Rashta is bewildered by the news of her father's arrival, but Roteshu explains that he showed Rashta's portrait and claims she has made it. Rashta denies having the blood of a common slave and asks Roteshu to take care of her father. Viscount Roteshu suggests asking his majesty instead, since he turned a blind eye on her background. Roteshu was busy looking for Rivetti and has no time getting command from Rashta. The Empress sent invitations to nobles for a tea party, including those with bad relationships. Her ladies-in-waiting helped with the letters, but were puzzled by the names, as they were close to the former queen's family. Her ladies-in-waiting labeled Danger Level 2 to nobles that are hostile towards her. She invited these Danger Level 2 groups without countermeasures, believing they were a trap to strengthen rumors of her infertility. At the tea party, she plans to know if of the group of nobles she invited will be hostile towards, but eventually they showed their true colors. They talked about Miss Amaru, Krista's lady-in-waiting, who will have a child soon. They mock Navier for not being pregnant yet compared to a person who had married later would give birth first. They inquires about the expected release of good news about having a baby from Navier, who clarifies that it is a matter for the emperor and empress and not their concern. Masta's cold words caused a shift in the atmosphere, but the nobles told her that the empress's pregnancy could end the circulating rumors. The situation soon turned into a heated argument between those on her side and the nobles in the danger level to group. The Empress is preparing to stop the fight by accidentally drops her tea, causing it to shatter. Navier then emphasized the importance of stabilizing the country first and avoiding a delicate disagreement with foreign countries, causing malicious gaze among danger level to nobles. Heinle asks by Navier about his childhood, expressing interest in learning more about him. She believes children are reflections of their parents and wants to be prepared to raise a child. Heinle disagrees with the idea that one is a reflection of their parents, stating that he was independent and not obedient as a child. Navier asked Heinle if he would prefer a child with his personality, but he argues that she is cruel. 
Duke LG learns Rashta's real father visited Viscount Roteshu and plans to blackmail her. Rashta is unsure of what to do, as Viscount Roteshu is too busy to help. She originally want to kill her father, but she already hired a mercenary to assassinate Duke and Duchess Troby, and hesitant to hire another, she prefers to send her father to a distant place. Duke LG stood out on the filthy streets, attracting drunks, gangs, and tavern keepers. The people knew it was a loss to fight against nobles, but one bravely called him impolitely. A small thin man approached Duke LG, expressing gratitude for helping him find his daughter. He admits to having made it possible for him to meet Viscount Roteshu. He admits that he helped him for an ulterior motive, since he told him to not greet when they meet again. A man wryly questions LG about his relationship with his daughter and demands money to keep his mouth shut about his activities. He threatens to reveal LG's secret to his daughter. LG slaps a man's head and grab his neck. The man struggles, demanding to be let G. The man begs for his life, but LG releases him before his eyes turn white and walks away without threatening him. Rashta clenched her fist and chose to take a deep breath. This man was both strange and familiar to her. He called her daughter. Her father was a carefree man and always have excuses for his lack of care for his daughter. Rashta questions why he didn't find her when she was suffering, questioning why he didn't think to do so. Rashta is upset and wants the man to leave her, urging him to leave and not cling to her. He was surprised that Rashta is very angry to him because he was used to her getting affection from him. The man asks Rashta about a tall, handsome man with brown and blonde hair, green eyes, and a coat over his shoulder. Rashta questions why he suddenly mentions Duke LG, a man she had always admired. He told her that Duke LG is the one that helped him meet her, but Rashta doubt him. She believes Duke LG cared better for her than her real father, who never showed love. Rashta doesn't refute him. Rashta's father is struggling financially and is seeking help to set up a trade team. Rashta remember that her father was a slave due to money scam. Slavery was a punishment for crimes punishable by life imprisonment. Rashta's father, however, claims that he worked hard to raise the money to be freed from slavery. Rashta, now an empress, feels uncomfortable due to her slave certificate, which she believes was because of her father. She questions how the man could say such a thing so calmly. He told her that obviously he wanted to free her from slavery, but when he does, she was dating Viscount Roteshu's son. He left when he heard she was well, but Rashta denied this, stating it was a selfish decision. Rashta refuses to give her father any money, but her father believes Rashta is ungrateful, claiming she owes him for her beauty. Rashta's father questions her understanding of reciprocity. Rashta was shocked to the point that she found it hard to breathe. How could such a person exist? But he still threatens her to publicly criticize her for being an ungrateful and bad daughter. Rashta contacted the journalist that write about her father's true identity, Johnson, who had previously described her as the hope of the commoners, showed varying expressions each time he met her. Rashta asked Johnson if he held a grudge against her. Johnson responds that he is not. Rashta questions Johnson about his absurd articles and his actions, expressing her said story and experience about her parents getting sympathy from him. Johnson feels betrayed by Empress Rashta and believes she hurt his sister. He responds calmly, stating his duty to publicize of someone claiming to be her father. He crossed his legs to observe Rashta's reaction, assuming she would react differently if she had noble blood. Johnson explains that he wrote only that there's someone claiming to be her father, stating that it was clearly stated in the article. Rashta become angry and pointed out that the man is a swindler who claims to be the Empress's real father. Johnson, examining Rashta, asks for his sister's return. He insists Rashta that his writings are based on research. Johnson stands up, stating he will not leave her alone until his sister returns. So Viesha asked about the truth, causing Rashta to hesitate, indicating he had read the article already. So Vyeshu is urging her to be honest about the situation. He doesn't intend to blame Rashta, but encourages her to be honest. Rashta lies, saying he is really not her real father. She tries to hide her lies, but so Vyeshu remains silent. So Vyeshu shared Marky that Rashta lied again, but they feel sorry for her in acknowledging that the man who caused her to become a slave likely played a role in her resurgence. So Vyeshu offers to help her if she answered honestly. Marky Carl asks what to do with her father, 
so Viesha command him to handle it discreetly and suggests dealing with him once attention shifts to another matter or after Soviesha leaves the capital. Viscount Langdell announced that they had arrived at Willwell Academy. Her ladies-in-waiting were all excited to know about her having magic. Viscount Langdell face changes while Navier look at the direction he was looking at. It was Soviesha. They had to show mutual respect. Both stopped and greeted each other politely, expressing Navier's congratulations on his baby's birth. So Viesha responded awkwardly, expressing gratitude. She asked about her gift, the beautiful sword she gave to Rashta, but So Viesha answered that he didn't know because it was Rashta who received it. So Viesha ordered his knights to stand back, while Navier directed a similar look to the knights behind him. So Viesha questions about her weight loss. She had lost weight due to pregnancy but didn't want to say it. He asked if it is because of her husband. Navier responded no, but Soviesha asked her to come back to him, but she firmly denied his request. Soviesha, however, reiterated his stance, urging Navier not to be proud. He told her that he heard about Heinle's cheating, but Navier replied that he received the fake information and must fire his informant. She also expresses happiness and gratitude with her current relationship. So Viesha asked if she is happier than with their relationship. Navier replied that she was happy on their childhood but without him and argued that if she could cut out the moments from their childhood, she would have been happier. His expression darkened again as soon as he heard these words. She asked if she can go, but so Viesha asked what bring her on that place. But she answered it was none of his business to know. Navier stops to answer that she will talk with the Dean of Werwerl without providing much details. So Vieshu's expression changes dramatically, and ask if was involved also in the decline of Mage. Navier didn't know what he was saying, but So Vieshu advises her to be cautious with Emperor Heinle. She met the Dean and seeks help about Mana, but the Dean refuses to assist. She was disappointed, despite their perceived mutual respect, makes her feel sad about the Dean's cold attitude. She asks if it's because she came from Western Empire, but the Dean disagree and explain that, until suspicions are proven false about the Western Empire, he need to distance himself. The Dean and Sovieshu express suspicions about the Western Empire's role in mage decline. Navier recalls the monobed side effects and feels tightness in her chest. Heinle's cunning, but she believe he could not be as cruel as taking mana from others, but the vivid image of Evely's suffering made her anxious. She returns to the Western Empire and confronts Heinle about the misunderstanding with Sovieshu and the Dean. Navier admits to not receiving help with Mana and believed that Heinle wouldn't cause harm to Evely. She plans to ask Grand Duke Capman about Mana, as he took classes at the Academy. She realized now that Heinle became special to her and lies on Heinle's chest, absorbed in his fragrance, and falls asleep. Navier is puzzled by Heinle's absence, feeling hungry. She go to find him in his office. Unknowingly touching the doorknob, she accidentally frees it, and the door opens almost noiselessly, revealing Heinle. A voice was heard who instructed to send a crow to investigate if he believes they could be discovered due to the necklace, and to do whatever it takes to retrieve it. Heinle completed his work, but remained standing, staring at the doorknob and become silent. Navier is asleep, but a low, affectionate voice whispers sweet dreams from Heinle, causing to close her eyes and wrap herself in sheets. Heinle kissed and embraced her. His chest touched her back, and he leaned on her neck, causing her to relax. Navier thinks that even if Heinle was stealing the mage's mana, she couldn't blame him. He seemed to have a competitive spirit against the Eastern Empire. In fact, it was a rival country. But she would resent Heinle for his involvement in mage decline, despite rational understanding. Though she loves the Western Empire, she won't trample on the Eastern Empire to love the Western Empire. After several days of searching, Viscount Roteshu finally discovered a lead on the real daughter of the Isqua family. The director let out a sigh and smiled. Then he turned the document he was examining toward Viscount Roteshu. The orphanage was filled at the time but due to unfortunate circumstances, they had to accept to more girls. The director pointed his finger at the girl without a note underneath and smiled broadly, and said that she is the pride of their orphanage, whose name is Evely. Viscount Rotesha jumped up in excitement. If this were true, it would be a great event. People would think that the two daughters of the Isqua family would become the emperor's wives, while Rashta would feel that everything had been taken from her by Evely. 
After leaving the orphanage, he asked a mercenary to bring Evely's blood. Meanwhile, the old Duke Zementia of the Western Empire had left the capital for Compshire. He went to see his daughter, Krista. The subordinate was surprised that old Duke Zementia did nothing, despite the strong rumor circulating about Empress Navier's possible infertility. Marky Ketrin faces challenges in resolving the family's situation following the scandal focusing on their children's future over loyalty. The subordinate questions whether to define their position quickly. Old Duke Zementia argues that the Empress's infertility rumor is a trap, suggesting she may be pregnant. Finally, the carriage stopped in front of Compshire's mansion. The old Duke realizes the carriage hasn't entered the mansion and asks the coachman to go further. The coachman, who is guarded by knights, tells him they insist the carriage cannot enter. A mercenary discovered a small aperture at the bottom of the front door, allowing food and drink in. The old duke understood the situation and angrily shout that Heinle had imprisoned his daughter. In the Western Kingdom there was an event called Great Prayer in which offerings were presented to the king and queen. Nair practiced and learned about the event, which involved offering six foods to the emperor and empress. They shouldn't spill the food. If so, it will consider unlucky. However, she was worried if there were food that pregnant women shouldn't eat, this will push her to reveal that she is pregnant and her infertility trap will end. The situation was worse when the examined food was presented to her, as it was deemed nutritious but not suitable for pregnant women. Heinle also frowned at the food, though Navier wanted to delay the baby announcement until Heinle's birthday to defeat hostile nobles, the situation pushed them to reveal the truth. Heinle seemed to understand her and quickly grabbed her hand. Then he raised it, kissed the back of it, and smiled splendidly. Heinle announced to the nobles that he would eat alone, causing them to be confused, but understand after her told them that it is two months old. So Vieshu, who had Glorum on his lap, dropped the baby's toy he was holding in one hand at Marky Carl's report. As a result, the princess burst into tears. Marky Carl repeats that Navier is pregnant. So Viesha can't believe it and asked the Marquis who he heard it, but the Marquis told him that it was revealed by Navier herself in front of Western Empire nobles at an event. So Vieshu's eyes withered with a distorted expression. Marquis Carl raised his hands to prevent the Emperor from dropping the baby. So Vieshu, confused by the news of Navier's pregnancy, questioned if she was infertile during their marriage. He couldn't accept it, but he couldn't help but notice a painting on the wall. So Vieshu, holding a baby, tensed and fearful, saw the baby's soft silver hair. He wondered if the infertile person was himself, not Navier. Duke Zementia expresses congratulations to Navier. She recognized that it was old Duke Zementia, Krista's father. Despite appearing friendly, he revealed his true colors by saying it was unfairly revealed after a two-month secret about the Empress's pregnancy, since it was a national and succession concerns. He hinted the other nobles with his words that, the Empress must have kept her pregnancy a secret to test them. Heinle calmly argued that the fault lies with those who didn't believe them, that there's no need to worry about the heir and those with malicious thoughts. As Heinle and old Duke Zementia exchanged sly smiles, the faces of several nobles darkened at Heinle's words. McKenna reports that people close to Navier seem elated, while McKenna hands a yellow letter. McKenna suggested Heinle to join them and do the work tomorrow or the following day. Heinle asked about his queen's expression when Duke Zementia sneered at her. Heinle reveals that his queen had an angry expression that can affect her pregnancy. A ruthless smile appeared on his face as he muttered and glanced at the letter. The old duke enters the office. While McKenna showed him the letter, he takes the letter and looks up, expressing nothing to fear. The old duke returns the letter to McKenna, who denies it is forged. He reveals that the letter which instructs the empress to prepare harmful food for her pregnant baby was forged. Heinle questions why the old duke would deny it despite seeing it in his handwriting. He asked Heinle why would he leave such evidence if he did it, and found Heinle's words absurd. Heinle denies taking revenge for mentioning the recent infertility rumor, stating it's only an investigation. Heinle requests the library's borrowed books record. But as soon as the door was completely open, his eyes widened. The old duke was stunned. It was his daughter, Krista. The old duke was surprised by the thick rope around her neck, which was used for hanging executions, and the knot's shape. Heinle ignored the old duke's reaction and reached out his hand. 
The woman gently placed the book in Heinle's hand and left. Old Duke Zementia receives a record of books borrowed by his son from the library, including titles of harmful foods and medications for pregnant women. Duke Zementia become pale, fearing that it was a threat. So now Emperor Heinle was threatening him. He wanted the old duke to acknowledge the fake evidence. Otherwise, his daughter would be hanged. A murmur came from the bushes. Viscount Rotesha was about to enter the Western Palace when he suddenly heard the voice. Viscount Rotesha was puzzled by Rashta's murmur while stroking a doll, thinking if she'd become crazy, but she later revealed she was practicing baby holding. Viscount Rotesha approached her while listening to her talk offering information about the daughter of the Isqua family, but she declined to search for her. Rashta mocks Viscount Roteshu for looking for someone else's daughter, while he lose his own. She slaps him twice, claiming he's being punished. Despite his dislike for Rashta, viewed her as sly and naive, but did not care about her suffering in the current Rashta. Roteshu didn't hesitate to reveal that Evely is the real daughter of the Isqua family. Anger seeps into her eyes, and she drops a doll and grabs Viscount Rostechu by the throat. Rashta can't believe what she heard, but Roteshu told her that he would not give fake information to her, since she is her source of money. He is angered by Rashta's lack of focus, as she needs to win the Emperor's heart to gain money. Rashta doubts Viscount Roteshu and asked if he did a test. Despite having her blood, he couldn't perform the test due to temple restrictions and irregularities. Despite her nervousness, she believes it is false. Rashta, sarcastically accusing him of lying, tries to hurt her by pointing out that she has found the daughter they've been searching for years. Rotesha questions why they couldn't find Evely for years, unsure if it's due to superficial or lack of intelligence, but believe Evely might be their daughter. Viscount Rotesha urgently requested money for a skilled informant and for Alan's well-being, as he was raising her son at the mansion. When Rashta removed the jeweled bracelet from her arm and handed it to him, Viscount Roteshu accepted it without hesitation. Then he turned away as if his business was over. A man enters the audience chamber while holding a child, so Vieshu asks if he called for him and remembers the man who held Rashta's first child. Alan Rimwell answered that he went to represent Roteshu, who has not returned, finding his sister. So Vieshu softens his reprimand and orders Alan to bring his child closer. Alan is startled by the sudden order and questions what it is for. He finds it strange that Emperor Sovieshu suddenly asked him to bring his child. Sovieshu repeat his orders, which Alan gives to him, despite his initial disgust. As he sees the baby, his thoughts of Alan fade, and he becomes suspicious about the child's father's connection to Glorium. Sovieshu denies the child's resemblance to Rashta and his daughter arguing that it's impossible for the first child to be from the same father due to dates. He tries to think positively, but faces embarrassment taking a paternity test. The emperor was horrified to see his daughter reflected in a strange child, so he returned him to Alan. Alan's eyes widened as he saw the princess's face and her high-quality baby dress and soft socks, adorned with pearls. So Vieshu inquired about the father of the child, but Alan's stare surprised him, as his father had informed the emperor that Anne's real father was unknown. Alan answered that he didn't know the child's father and explained that he only grew affection to the child as time goes by. Despite the pressure from the emperor, Alan lowered his head and held his son tightly. So Vieshu allowed him to leave, and Alan expressed gratitude, hurried out of the room. Heinle and Duke Capman joined hands while Navier was suppressing her laughter. Heinle volunteered to learn from Capman how to know the nature of Navier's magic. McKenna entered Heinle's office, claiming permission to move freely, and saw the scene which makes him confused. McKenna reveals that Krista has committed suicide, ignoring what they were doing. After Capman and Navier left, Heinle confirms that Krista committed suicide, but puzzled why did she do it. McKenna suggests it might because of the letter Heinle sent her that her father, Duke Zementia, had abandoned her. She was angry with her father during the state council. Old Duke Zementia is shocked to learn that Krista committed suicide, despite her strong will to take her own life. He denies the news and becomes furious, accusing the emperor of causing her death. A will has been found, revealing that Krista was abandoned by the old duke, which broke her heart. He didn't believe it and believes it was a fake will. Heinle believes Marky Ketrin as despicable and careless, but he's smart. He spread infertility rumors, and now, after his sister-in-law's death, he's stepping forward in another direction, sending the Empress a cradle.
He suggests Krista's suicide may have caused a break with the old Duke. McKenna questions his next actions, as the Duke may not believe Krista's suicide. Heinle plans to exploit his fierce temperament to make him hostile towards him, causing his close aides to question his loyalty, and he will also isolate him from nobles, aiming to make him appear mad. Navier was shocked by Krista's suicide, despite not liking Krista, she was unhappy to hear about her death and preferred her to remain healthy in Compshire. She shook her head to avoid thoughts of her and entered the drawing room, confronted by a magnificent cradle sent by the Ketron family. The room was also filled with gifts for the baby, causing divided opinions on its use. Her fake parents visited he and worried about her future with her husband and is concerned about the princess's nanny, Viscountess Verdi. After crying, she reveals that it's due to the future concubine, Evely. She believes that without Evely, his majesty wouldn't have turned away from her. She feared a situation where it would be discovered that Evely was their real daughter, so she wants them to eliminate their own daughter. They reassured Rashta that she was beautiful and that his majesty would lose interest in that mage. After her fake parents left, Arian is asked to borrow a baby the size of Rashta's daughter for six hours a day and make a reason that the princess needs a friend her age. Rashta explains that she needs to practice holding a baby. Just then, the maid brought in Ellen Rimwell and told her their visits, bringing a child. Rashta led Alan into practice with her first child, who looked like the princess. Alan arrived with a small child, hiding his face. She asked the reason of his visit and reprimand Alan to call her your majesty. Alan surprised Rashta by revealing that he is the first child of the Empress and the first child of the Eastern Empire and questioned why Anne should be treated like a bastard child and questioned that he deserves to be treated like a quasi-prince. Rashta, once a slave, now has the opportunity to help her child, and Ellen's hopeful outlook makes Rashta fear for her child's future. After a visit to the capital, Heinle suggested organizing a banquet to celebrate Navier's pregnancy. She was surprised and objected, stating that it would be burdensome to organize a banquet now, as it would be soon his birthday party. Heinle suggests organizing a simple banquet to celebrate the trade with Rift and Navier reluctantly agrees because of his strong desire to do so. So Viesha crushed an invitation sent by the Western Empire's emperor, causing his vision to blur. He questioned how he could congratulate his ex-wife on her pregnancy and ask him to give him an advice. He compares Heinle to a bloody lunatic who wrote an invitation as if they were a lifelong friend. Marky Carl informs Sovieshu that Rashta is crying in Duke Elgi's arms, a rumor that spread yesterday. Sovieshu jokes that if the rumor spread, Everyone in the Imperial Palace is talking about it, making Marky Carl uncomfortable. As unpleasant as it was to hear that Rashta had gone for comfort in Duke Elgi's arms, what actually worried him was that the princess was not his child. So Viesha reflects on an image of a child born between him and Navier. He feels suffocated and unsure if the child will be a prince or princess. He hopes that Heinle's child looks like him and not Navier. Heinle learned the mana control method from Grand Duke Capman. Navier eagerly awaited learning and wanted to show her parents. However, Heinle refused, stating it was dangerous and needed to be tested first. Navier asked of how Heinle plans to test it, but he assures her that he will help her control mana after getting a test subject. Marky Ketron enters a room with a pale, dark complexion and arrogant appearance. Heinle's expression remains unchanged and asks Marky Ketron about Duke Zemencia's weakness, which surprises him. Marky Ketron is asked to change sides by selling his uncle, old Duke Zemencia, to cover up his own crimes. Heinle cornered him, threatening to forget his actions if he revealed his uncle's weaknesses. Marky Ketron discusses the old Duke's weakness which is his love for his grandchildren. His heartbeat quickens, questioning if the Duke truly abandoned Krista for his son and grandchildren, or if the Emperor is trying to separate them. Heinle confronts Marquis Ketron that what he reveals is not enough to cover his crimes, the Marquis what he need more. Heinle answered that he needs his body. McKenna shares a secret about a request made by His Majesty Heinle to Marquis Ketron, who initially struggled to understand the meaning. McKenna questions Navier about Heinle's actions. Heinle sought Marquis Ketron's body to test his mana control and concentrate, as a mage, learning from Grand Duke Capman. McKenna is surprised by Heinle's experiment on someone else, Marquis Ketron. She acknowledges that Heinle did it for her, but is unsure about the situation. She wants to learn something new.
Laura told the Empress about Lady Nyan fighting with Viscount Langdell, who is concerned about Marquis Liberty's courtship. Heinle apologizes about yesterday. They discuss their feelings and how he can now help Navier control her mana. She was thinking that Heinle didn't told her about getting Marquis Ketrin as his test subject. The Empress hesitates before he begins a procedure, revealing that kissing is part of it. He explains it's helpful and he chuckles, saying it feels good. She doesn't stop him if it was needed. Rashta was feeling overwhelmed by her current situation and recalls a conversation with Marky Carl, who advised her to be more cautious. He mentions meeting with Duke Elgie, and a rumor in the newspapers suggests they have frequent meetings alone. Rashta questioned Sovieshu's actions, claiming he brought another concubine, took her away from her daughter, and treated her coldly. She believed she had done nothing wrong and blamed Sovieshu for false rumors. She argued that her friendship with Duke Elgie remained unchanged, suggesting it was Sovieshu's fault. Rashta overheard nobles conversing while taking a stroll, hurriedly hiding due to potential criticism from others. She also heard about attending a banquet to celebrate Navier's pregnancy. She is puzzled and believes that Navier is infertile and wonders how she could be pregnant and have a good relationship with Emperor Heinle. She is shocked by the false rumors and the absurdity of the situation. Duke Elgin notices Rashta's anger and asks about her. Rashta shares that she hates a woman who is living happily. She asks where is he going, while Duke Elgin answered that he will visit the Western Empire to attend a banquet. She asks if he will abandon her, but he explained that he want to express his desire to see Heinle and congratulate him on his first child. Duke LG asks if she will attend the banquet. Rashta is depressed about her recent lack of treatment as an empress. LG believes that every country should treat its distinguished guests with utmost courtesy, but she doesn't want to see Navier's happiness. She desires to see Emperor Heinle, who she believed had interest in her, but she was obsessed with Sovieshu at that time. Rashta unexpectedly wanted to visit the Western Empire, but Sovieshu granted permission, allowing her to watch Navier and learn about Empress behavior. Sovieshu took the opportunity to send his close knights to Rashta's maids. The next day, Marquis Farang left to meet his friend Kosher, and Sovieshu sent Evely, whom he had intended to send for Heinle's birthday. Many other nobles also went to visit the Western Empire on their own, so the bustling imperial palace suddenly seemed to fall silent. Old Duke Zementia informs his grandchildren about his Aunt Krista's suicide for the family's future. He urges them to study hard and be great people to strengthen the family and avenge Krista's sacrifice. However, the two children are annoyed due to their aunt's attempt to disgrace the Empress, and they weren't empathetic to what happened to her. Angry with his grandchildren, Old Duke Zementia slapped his grandson, Cousin Tears. His granddaughter, by his side, questioned why he hit him claiming his brother didn't say anything wrong. Neria told him that what his son told him was true, and it's Krista's fault why they were treated poorly and not invited to a banquet celebrating the first child of the imperial family. Old Duke Zementia was angry and bloodshot, while the butler tried to help him. He is questioning the sacrifice of his daughter Krista for his grandchildren. The Duke questioned how he chose to save his grandchildren instead of his own daughter. The Old Duke grieving for Krista, he cries, causing his heart to burst. 